Yes, I think so. <clears throat> I think we can start with yeah, this uh, by yeah, eight oh five. Should I start? I think we'll we'll start. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> okay, let's get started. Uh, welcome everyone. This is the first real processing, real world processing in memory architectures tutorial, I believe, ever in the world. So welcome. Uh, it's good that this is happening, as we will discuss, uh, and uh, we're going to have a full day of talks and. Also, hands-on labs at the end using the AppMap architecture. And Juan will go over the agenda soon. I'm on Mutlu. This is Juan Gomez Luna. Uh, and we're going to cover a bunch of both real memory architectures and old memory architectures, let's say, uh, processing in memory architectures. But before we get started, if you don't know the internet password, it's, I think, Conference Bono Yeah, that's the, the network. That's the network, and the password is Hotel 900. It's written in the door over there. Uh, and you can also uh, follow this live online. There are people following live, I believe. Uh, feel free to ask questions on YouTube as well if you're following live. Okay, Juan can go over the agenda and then I'll give an opening talk just to set the stage and then we'll take it from there. Okay, yeah, thank you, Honor. And thank you, everyone, for attending here in this room. And also, uh, uh, thank you to those who are attending online. Um, as you can see here on the screen right now, uh, what we uh, have is a, a tutorial website. Uh, here uh, <clears throat> you can find the agenda um, that uh, that we will and, and the different talks that we will have today. And here at the bottom, uh, you can find this uh, small table that will start uh, growing over the course of the day. And here we will upload the uh, uh, slides after each of the lectures. At the bottom of the page, you can also find some interesting and useful uh, learning materials to some uh, of our papers and, and also access to the documentation of uh, you know, the AppMem SDK. Um, let me, let me, change to the agenda because I have a PowerPoint for that. I hope everyone can see it. What's wrong here? I can see your screen. So you okay. can see. Okay. I don't know why, why I cannot close this window. Maybe it's a desktop. Maybe. Yeah. It's a little bit annoying. Okay. I will share again. Or oh, I must be sharing, actually. No, you're sharing this one. Okay, yeah, I think it should be good now. So yeah, this is the agenda that we will cover today. As uh, Professor Mundu said, we are going to start with uh, this um, introductory lecture for him to uh, set up the stage and talk about memory-centric computing systems and give an introduction to processing in memory. After that, I will cover 
processing near memory, which is one of the two main branches, let's say, or types of processing in memory. And we are going to explicitly talk about real processing in memory systems. Most of them uh, are processing near memory systems. We will briefly talk about some prototypes that have been announced in the last couple of years. And with a little bit more detail, we will cover the admin PIM architecture, but we'll put most of the focus on programming because we need it to later in the afternoon work on the labs. Um, after the coffee break, we will have a really uh, interesting talk by Dr. Dimin Niu from Alibaba. He is going to talk about the um, uh, PNM architecture that they have designed and prototyped for recommendation systems. After that, we will have uh, Dr. Uh, Christina Gianola from the University of Toronto speaking about her work on sparse matrix vector multiplication of the admin PIM architecture. And after that, I will uh, continue talking about uh, processing using memory, which is like the other big type of processing in memory systems, uh, including one prototype that we have developed in our group called PyDigram. After the break, we will have uh, Dr. Uh, Legalo. He will uh, give us, a, uh, he's a, a researcher at IBM Zurich, and he's going to deliver a, for sure, very interesting lecture on or, or talk on deep learning inference using computational phase change memory. We will continue with uh, the some final discussion about adoption issues, what is needed to enable processing in memory in real systems. And finally, we will start with the labs. Uh, probably we'll, I will show you a few slides uh, in order to introduce the labs and give you some hints. And after that, uh, you'll be able to access uh, one of the uh, servers that uh, Admem has with the real uh, DIMMs, with the real processing in memory system. And, and hopefully it will be a, a, a good experience for those of, those of you who access the system and, and program it. As I said, we have three invited lectures, three invited talks. The first one is uh, will be this uh, this uh, one uh, by uh, Dr. Diming New from Alibaba uh, speaking about the PNM architecture for recommendation systems. Then we will have uh, Dr. Christina Yanola uh, speaking about the Sparse P, which is a library sparse matrix vector multiplication uh, for real world processing in memory architectures. And finally, Dr. Uh, Legalo uh, talking about uh, his work on computational phase phase change memory memory for deep learning inference. So this is uh, all from, from me right now, for, for now. And now it's my pleasure to um, um, to uh, give the stage to Professor Mudlu for the introductory lecture. You can see the slide on Zoom, right? It's coming. It's coming. Okay. Maybe it's a bit slow. Just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Let's hope that this works also. Okay. Let's... Okay, great. Yeah, so I hope everybody's excited about this tutorial as we are. <laughs> and uh, we've been working on processing in memory for some time now. It's more than actually probably if I trace the steps uh, more than 13 years or so. And it's fun. It's good to see these things finally happening, even though in, in a, I would say maybe relatively early forms uh, than uh, what we imagine. I think in the future, there'll be a lot more. I'll just give an <clears throat> overview of the field of memory centric computing. Uh, this is going to be a relatively high level, the motivations for it and what is happening in the area. I'll try to keep it also short because we'll go into 
more topics that are covered uh, in this particular presentation later on today. Uh, so computing is today bottlenecked by data. I think everybody uh, sees this because data is really increasing in our systems. Sorry, I should make this work also. Important workloads are all data intensive. Uh, important workloads are listed. Some of these over there, but there are a lot more than machine learning, genomics. Uh, I'll show you some pictures later on. These require rapid and efficient processing of large amounts of data. And we want to do increasingly sophisticated things on data. And we can generate much more data than we can process today. I'll show you some examples from genomics. Maybe in a future incarnation of this uh, workshop or tutorial, uh, we may have some genomics acceleration on real processing in memory systems. These are some things we're working on right now, but they're not fully mature yet. So we're not going to talk about that in detail uh, today. This is an example uh, that shows the growth of neural networks. And if you look at the growth in terms of models, GPT-3 is here, for example, but there are bigger models that are coming for deep learning and language models. Uh, the memory requirement is growing exponentially and the compute requirement is also growing exponentially. As a result, we want both compute and memory, uh, large amounts of compute and large amounts of memory put together. Uh, and there are other applications. It's not just neural networks that are straining our systems because they deal with a lot of data and this causes a huge performance energy bottleneck. And that's true for the mobile end also, the mobile applications that we're actually exercising right now. We're using Zoom, we're live streaming on YouTube, where people are watching on browsers, and I'm sure there's a lot of inference going on right now. So we're exercising all of these right now, and uh, they actually also are bottlenecked by uh, data in the end. And as I said, uh, genomics is a domain that we are working on also, and this is a place where data that we can generate is increasing even more than maybe many other domains, I would say, because we can sequence genomes much more easily today compared to in the past. You can see in this picture that with new with the introduction of new genome sequencing technologies, the cost of sequencing a genome has been reducing exponentially, much faster than the cost of a transistor has been reducing since around 2007. And with the introduction of even, uh, even more aggressive device technologies, the cost of genome sequencing has been reducing even more. And this is one of the reasons why data is exploding, basically. We can, uh, we can uh, generate genomic data much more than before. And clearly, there are important applications of it. We're not going to go into detail in this particular uh, tutorial, but in the end, you're bottlenecked by data movements from the sequencing device to other devices, and then also computation that you need to do. Computation is usually bottlenecked by data movements also. So our scientific discoveries and medical advancements, public health enhancements are all uh, 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 bottlenecked by data in the end. And there are a bunch of applications. If you're working in this field, I, I find this fascinating. And these are some of the technologies. So data, if you look at this, it's a very good data generator, but it's a terrible data analyzer. This is a state-of-the-art genome sequencing uh, uh, device. Well, state-of-the-art, this is about 10 years ago. Today, they're actually much better. Uh, and it can generate data really well, but it cannot analyze data really well. You have to move the data to data centers. Uh, and uh, even inside the data center, between different parts of the data center so that you can analyze the data. So I think this is a true in general of uh, in general uh, about how we generate data and how we analyze data today. We have very special purpose machines to generate data. You can think of a genome sequencer, you can think of a camera, you can think of clicks on the web, but we have general purpose machines that we analyze them with. And there's a huge amount of data movement between the data generator and data analyzer. And as a result, we're bottlenecked by uh, that data movement as well as the processing capability. I think this picture is very, very similar wherever we generate data. People are trying to, of course, specialize things uh, and make the machines more special purpose also, but the data moment still remains across the devices and within the device as well. So if you're interested in genomics, we uh, are fascinated by it and we write articles on it. And this is actually a beginner reading that we were invited to write for, the, for a special edition of this journal. If you're interested, this, this is really beginner material, I would say. This is a hard area to get into, in my opinion. That's why it's good to have beginner materials. Okay, there are also some things that are happening. Uh, we're not going to talk about this today, but FPGA-based near-memory acceleration also happening, uh, and we're writing papers about it. This is work that we did with IBM a few years ago, where we uh, took this HPM-based FPGA board, uh, high bandwidth memory-based FPGA board, and where we offloaded applications to accelerate them. And in this particular case, it was weather modeling and genome analysis again. So the good thing here is you can process data right next to the high bandwidth memory. It's not exactly, of course, in memory, it's, it's, a, it's a version of near memory computation in the end. You don't process the data, move the data all the way to the CPU, but you do it here uh, inside that uh, FPGA board. 
if you will. And we find significant performance improvements by both reducing the data movement and also specializing the logic. Uh, the paper has more details on how to break this down, but you can see that you can improve both performance and edge efficiency signif by significant numbers, orders of magnitude over here. And this is what you can do today. I think future is a lot brighter as well. So if you're more interested in genome analysis, there's other work but that I'm not going to talk about. Maybe I'll mention this one later on. This is a work that we uh, did uh, on in storage. It's good to also consider when we talk about processing near memory, in memory, it's just, it's, uh, the memory is general in this particular case. It's, it's, it's not, uh, we're not thinking of a particular place in my opinion. It's not just main memory, it should be storage. It should be also the caches. So everywhere in the memory hierarchy, we should be doing processing. And genomics is in, in, in some genomic analyses, you actually, main memory is not actually used that much because you're, you have so much data that you cannot fit all your data in main memory. So you have to actually process in storage, assuming you don't want to move data, of course. Okay, I'll skip some of these things over here, but you can find uh, uh, a lot of these works. And futures, I think, are going to be even more aggressive in terms of the amount of data that we generate in a genome analysis. Maybe in a future incarnation of the tutorial, we'll talk more about genome analysis. But this was an example. So I think in many applications today, data overwhelms our model machines. Uh, it overwhelms the storage and memory capability, as we discussed. I'm going to give you more numbers. It overwhelms the communication capability. And in the end, the computation capability, because computation is provisioned, assuming that you can actually get the data relatively fast. But if you cannot actually sustain the large amounts of memory bandwidth, the, over, the computation becomes over-provisioned. You have a great machine learning accelerator, for example, or great CPU or GPU, but it's bottlenecked by the bandwidth uh, from memory, then your computation also becomes idle. Uh, okay, it's also great the impacts, uh, robustness, energy, and performance and cost. And if you look at the fundamentals of a computing system, you need to have these three uh, components, computation, communication, and storage. And today we've heavily optimized the computing units, but maybe forgotten. The other two units. So we have a huge dichotomy between the computing communi versus communication versus memory and storage. So can we put those things together is really the uh, topic of this tutorial. But if you look at the today's uh, computing centric system, uh, this is my cartoonish picture. It's actually pretty old, but it's kind of uh, representative of what we have today on a computing chip. Basically, you have a bunch of cores, but most of the chip is really memory, right? Caches, interconnects, other caches, other interconnects, memory controls, other interconnects main memory, other interconnects, uh, storage, other interconnects. So if you do the calculation, more than 95% of the real estate of the system is dedicated to memory. And inside the core, it's mostly memory also. There are one cache and registers, right? Uh, yet the system is still bottlenecked by memory. We're putting so much resource on memory, yet we're still bottlenecked by it. It's probably because we're not doing something right. We have to, this memory is not doing anything useful, let's say, other than just storing data. Maybe it should be acting on the data also. And if you don't believe my picture, this is AMD's uh, picture, if you will. That green part is just L3 cache and L2 caches. This is the global memory interconnect. So a lot of it's memory, basically, in the end. Uh, and they're adding more memory, as you can see. This is IBM's picture. Manuel can talk about it, maybe. <laughs> this is Power 10. So it's basically all across industry. Uh, and this is Apple's picture. I think of the computing chip as a lot of SRAM, and then the memory, a lot of DRAM. And then there's something that's forgotten, of course, in all of the pictures, the storage this darkness, and then there's even more darkness, which is sensors we're gonna see over there <laughs> later. Okay, so even though we're putting a lot of memory, data is still overwhelming us. We did this study with Google a few years ago, again, uh, to understand the impact of data movement uh, on mobile workloads that I showed you earlier. And we found out that more than 60% of the entire system energy is spent on data movement on a mobile system on these workloads. So this is real data sets, real data. Uh, this number is actually much larger. We did another study with Google. I'm going to, if, I, if we have time, we'll talk about it. Uh, on large machine learning models uh, that's executed uh, for inference in edge accelerators, more than 90% of the total system energy is spent on memory. Of course, it depends on the machine learning model, but on large ones that really strain the system, this number goes to 90 to 95 to 99%, depending on uh, the input data. So my axiom will be uh, going forward that we need intelligent architectures that can handle data well, because these architectures are supposed to be intelligent, making decisions for us. Uh, and we've been working on it. So what does it mean to handle data? Well, I'm not going to talk about uh, some of these things because we don't have time and we have a lot to cover, uh, but we should really ensure that data doesn't overwhelm the components we design. And this requires intelligent algorithms, architectures, and system designs across the stack designs in general. Uh, if you have time, we would also talk about these over here, which are synergistic, but 
I'll just skip these uh, for the sake of uh, brevity in this talk. So basically, I think we need to make uh, computing architectures much more data centric as opposed to processor centric as they are today. Uh, and I think we need to make them more data driven, learning from their decisions as opposed to more human driven, let's say, and also more data aware, aware of the characteristics of data as opposed to making component based myopic decisions without knowing the characteristics of the data. I'm happy to talk about this, but I want to also make sure that we cover the tutorial material so uh, we can cover these later on. Okay, I think this requires, uh, as you will see today, uh, design across the stack. Uh, we need to really think across the stack, think about devices, algorithms, algorithms that fit the devices, and devices that fit the algorithms that are going to be interesting as well. For example, I think Manuel will talk about some phase change memory devices that they're designing at uh, IBM Research and how you can fit the algorithms to those devices. And I think it's in general true in any domains. Okay, I'm going to skip some of these references, but you can read a lot more about these clearly. And some of these, I think, material is provided uh, on the website, not direct links to these papers, but links to the slides or something else that, uh, to, for these papers. So let's jump into these data-centric, memory-centric architectures that we're going to analyze in this tutorial. There's a lot that goes into a data-centric architecture, in my opinion. Processing data where it resides is an important part of it. Uh, but I think we also need to, if, if data is the most important thing that you're dealing with, we should really be thinking more on enabling low latency and low energy access to data. And I don't think we've done very good at this, at least to large amounts of data. We can access caches relatively fast, but we cannot access huge amounts of data fast today. You have to go through many, many levels of interconnects today. Storage, for example. And low energy is another thing. We'll talk about energy a lot. Energy is even worse, in my opinion. And we need to enable low-cost data processing and intelligent data management, which we will touch uh, into. Okay, let's jump into processing data where it makes sense, which is really the core topic uh, of this tutorial. And I say where it makes sense because, as I said earlier, data is present in many, many parts uh, of a system today. We should really enable processing capability wherever data is present. And also data gets generated. That includes the sensors, in my opinion. Ideally, you would like to minimize the data movement uh, between the data generation and data processing or data storage and data processing. Sometimes you, you process the data while it's being generated. Sometimes you, process, you have to store it. So you need to do both in my opinion. And this is a picture of the, uh, let's say Apple M1 system, including sensors. So we want processing capability everywhere. If you look at a processor chip today, you just have the cores and accelerators, but even the memories inside the chip don't have the processing capability. The memory controller cannot process data, for example. So we have very limited amount of processing capability in modern systems. But we have a huge potential for processing capability in the entire system also. What this doesn't include, of course, the interconnects, for example, you should perhaps be thinking about doing processing while the data is also moving. Uh, and in the past, people have looked at this, right? Adding, for example, uh, reduction operations and uh, routers uh, was old times. I think they'll, they're, they're coming back with uh, more intelligent routing, routers today. But this is an old idea. Uh, this processing mem in memory uh, certainly wasn't invented uh, in uh, like <laughs> 10 years ago. This is, I believe, the oldest paper. If you find an older paper, please let me know. Uh, this is uh, from 1969. As you can see, they called it logic in memory at the time. And you can call it processing in memory as well. Uh, and Harold Stone has a paper also. These are beautiful papers. Uh, and people have tried uh, to make this idea work for decades. Uh, so why is it interesting today? And why is it maybe happening more today than later uh, th th than in the past? So I think uh, there are two major reasons. We're having huge problems with the memory technology, and we never had those problems before, in my opinion. And we also have a huge bottleneck in terms of applications and systems. And we're kind of squeezed in the middle. Technology is pushing us to do something different, and applications and systems are pushing us to do something different. So I'll cover these technology problems very, very quickly. But memory technology scaling is not going well, basically. We're having a lot of issues in terms of reliability, safety, security. Rohammer is one example that I love talking about, but I will refrain myself not to talk about it today. <laughs> but I'll give you an example. So basically, we're getting bit flips as we push the memory to become more denser everywhere, in any all parts of memory, but uh, especially with large structures like DRAM and uh, Flash. And we also have a huge demand from application and systems. Uh, data access is a bigger bottleneck than ever before. Energy and power are bigger bottlenecks than ever before. And data movement energy dominates computation energy more so than before. Because of the technology scaling of logic went very well, but technology scaling of interconnect and memory did not go well over decades, right? As a result, logic energy is very little, 
whereas data moment energy is much higher, as we will see soon. And we also, our goals have changed, I think. Our goals are not just performance, but energy and increasing the sustainability. And sustainability, a big component of sustainability is energy in the end. So we need to be thinking about uh, these things, I think, more. And I think uh, uh, another uh, interesting thing, in my opinion, is we would like to improve all metrics at the same time. We don't want trade-offs between performance and energy, for example. I don't want like 10% more performance for maybe 20% more energy, right? We want actually improving both at the same time. Okay, so let me give you the landscape today. We're gonna to cover some of these today, uh, but 3D stacked memory technologies are happening and you can actually put uh, processing inside the logic layer. Micron had early prototypes on automata processing. These exist, they have discontinued it, but people are still doing research in it. Uh, and we're gonna talk a lot about the UpMem architecture and Samsung HPM PIM architecture and SK Hynix as well. And there will be a talk about from Alibaba. So these things are happening today. And you can see that all of these are DRAM chips actually. There, there was a, some time where people were saying, oh, you cannot modify DRAM, I'm not gonna touch it. But now everybody's modifying DRAM, including those companies who claim that you should not touch it. So that's good, I think. That's, I think that's, that's progress in my opinion, but we need to do more, of course, uh, for this progress. Okay, so uh, I'll go through this relatively quickly, as I said. So memory technology scaling uh, is, pro is uh, problematic because you get a lot of reliable patients. It's a study that we did with Facebook, where we studied all the memory that they had in their data centers all over the world. And we found out that the, there's a strong correlation between the density of the chip that's used in the, uh, in the server and the failure rate of the server. And this is because you get more memory errors with denser memory chips. I'm not gonna go into more detail. You can read papers. It's not just our papers, but Google has papers on it. Uh, Microsoft has papers on it. So they've all written papers showing that with denser memory chips, you get more failures uh, and errors. Uh, and there's a lot of analysis out there. And this is because of technology scaling because with denser memory chips, you have a lot more noise that's affecting the cells uh, and you get reliability issues. Uh, and also cells are much smaller. So you get reliability issues in uh, two ways. Okay, we also did a lot of work to understand these issues. Uh, actually building on these FPGA based infrastructures to test memory, we built a prototype to actually do in memory uh, processing using memory, which one we'll talk about later on. It's called PyDRAM. I will also briefly mention if we have time. But we actually built this to study memory uh, reliability issues. And Rohammer is an example of the reliability issues. I think it's a stark example because it, it, you can predictably induce errors in most DRAM memory chips today uh, by essentially hammering rows. And again, I'll go over this relatively quickly, but if you actually keep activating a row uh, repeatedly, this is just activating. It's just, you're just reading a row basically of cells, these are rows of, row of cells. It turns out cells in adjacent rows get disturbed, meaning you lose data, get corrupt. Clearly, this should not be happening because you should not be changing anything in memory. And uh, we showed that this is a scalability problem. Uh, we wrote this paper in 2014. It took two years to write the paper, of course, but. <laughs> uh, and this is a reliability issue. It's also a safety issue. It's also a security issue. I could talk about this for days, but not. I'm, I'm going to refrain myself, as I said. You can read more about this. But this is so serious that DM factors are actually. Uh, finally, writing papers about it. There is a paper at ISSCC that was presented uh, about from S by SK Hynix uh, a couple of days ago that talks about Rohammer. And it's, it's pro probably the first paper that so publicly talks about Rohammer and their solutions. Uh, I recommend people to read it. It's only two pages. So it actually talks about some probabilistic solutions uh, with counters. Okay. Uh, so memory scaling issues are real, basically. And uh, uh, People are taking action to solve them. So how, do you, how are you taking action to solve them? Basically, you're putting some more intelligence inside the memory. That's the reason I'm talking about these, basically. How do you, how do you fix the problem of memory scaling? Uh, you can read more papers, of course, but uh, basically, you, by, by adding more intelligence inside the memory, uh, uh, for example, to figure out uh, uh, how often are you activating the rows, you can actually uh, find, find solutions to the problem by adding more uh, logic inside the memory. So people are adding logic inside memory chips today, as well as the memory controllers today to solve this problem. Okay, so there are other uh, technology scaling issues uh, I, I should mention. Basically we have hybrid memories today. And if you have hybrid memories, I think you need to have some intelligence in the memory controller so that you can decide which memory to use for which data. And in this case, we want to avoid the reds of each technology while uh, the exercising the greens of each technology. And uh, for this, again, you need intelligent controllers, in my opinion, as well as some intelligent uh, software structure on top of it. So that's the reason I think technology scaling is pushing us. 
Now, this an, uh, there are a bunch of in example intelligent controllers. Uh, SK Hynix, as I mentioned, ISSCC presented their own intelligent controller inside the DUM chip, which is actually quite high overhead compared to many of the uh, things that were published. And again, industry is writing papers about it. This was 2014, where Samsung and Intel, two companies that don't normally talk to each other without lawyers, they actually wrote a paper <laughs> together. This is actually the only paper that I know of where these two, uh, where two major, let's say, memory plus processor companies collaborated to write a paper. And they basically said, we should really have intelligent controllers to fix these uh, reliability issues and scaling issues that we see in the UN. Okay, and we've been working on this, but I'll not bore you. So uh, some of these intelligent controls exist. NAND flash memory actually uh, has quite intelligent controls to fix these reliability issues. And it keeps adding a lot more over here. I will not talk about it, but there's a lot that goes on in a NAND flash memory controller to fix the scaling issues. Over time, DEM will may look like this, in my opinion, if it keeps scaling uh, at the same difficulties, let's say. Of course, with DRAM, you need to be very, very careful because it's, it's on a latency critical path. So how do you make the controller more intelligent? It becomes interesting. You may say there are other technologies that are quite interesting, and I agree. Uh, we're going to talk about phase change memory later on, and I think Intel has this certainly obtained memory. Now, uh, you can say that maybe we're not going to have issues with some of these memories, but unfortunately, that's not the case. Uh, we will always have issues when memories are scaled. This, this requires an intelligent controller, and the impl Intel's implementation actually had an intelligent controller to manage phase change memory. Okay, so I think my takeaway from the technology scaling part is we need intelligent memory controllers to enable better scaling, avoid failures. Uh, and this increasingly requires more and more computation capability uh, inside the memory. So if you look at a flash controller, it actually does a lot of computation to make sure that uh, different voltages uh, are, uh, 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 redifference voltages are adjusted correctly so that you get minimal number of errors in flash, for example. Okay, so let's talk about the applications and systems. Uh, I've already given you the lay of the land. Basically, these three things are uh, dominant, in my opinion. I think we have an even bigger responsibility going into the future. Do we want a world that's terrible? Uh, well, this, this is not terrible, I hope, but uh, that looks like this. Or do you want a world that looks like this? Interestingly, when I ask this question in my class, there are always some people who like this one better. <laughs> I don't know. We should, we should ship them back to 1920s <laughs> Pittsburgh or something. <laughs> Okay, so I think uh, I would argue that we want it all, meaning we don't want the bad aspects of any of these, but we want the good aspects of all of those, meaning we want high performance energy efficiency and sustainability all at the same time. We don't want to trade off. And I think uh, this goes to the core of uh, the way we design systems today. Data access is our major bottleneck and it's affecting performance, energy efficiency and sustainability badly because we're very compute centric. Basically, our, our, our core design principle today, compute-centric design of systems, uh, cause great energy waste because we're moving data a lot. And it also causes great performance loss because we actually move data a lot and that's clearly late. There's one latency issue over there, but we try to avoid this as much as possible, while, but we don't try to avoid this as much as possible, let's say. So uh, what do we do with performance loss? Uh, basically, we try to uh, add heavy levels of auto word execution, multi-threading, uh, 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 prefetching, a huge uh, amount of cache hierarchy. And that's sometimes overcomes the performance loss, but most of the time it doesn't actually. As a result, it compounds the energy waste. So we're in a vicious cycle that we're compounding the energy waste. Data movements is fundamentally energy wasteful. And whatever we add on top of our system to avoid the data movements or try to avoid the data movements from a compute centric perspective, again, increases our energy waste. And also it increases our system complexity. And the, the, whenever you have a vicious cycle like this, I think it's always good to analyze the fundamental problem. And the fundamental problems, I think, obvious that people have figured out in the 1960s also, right? Processing of data is far away from the uh, data is performed far away from the data. So that, these are the pictures that I showed you. We're very processor centric today. All data gets has to be processed, processed in the processor. And I use processor general. It's any computational uh, device, basically. It could be a CPU, GPU, FPGA, reconfigurable logic. Your, your favorite accelerator, they're all the same basically in the end. They don't have computation capability anywhere other than the compute units. And this comes at a great system cost, as we will see today. Now, I like uh, telling stories about this also. This is Dick Seitz, uh, who was the chief architect of Alpha processors, which were the fastest of their time in the 1990s. And he basically wrote this article at the time saying, it's the memory stupid after they designed a flagship processor. He was playing on the US elections, of course, as you can see over here. One candidate ran, ran with, it's the economy stupid. 
everything is about the economy and he's saying everything is about memory in this case. And this is a processor designer, basically. He ends the article saying that, basically, uh, he says that we designed this fastest processor. It's capable of finishing four instructions every clock cycle. But on this important database workload, which we believe we designed this processor for, it's finishing, finishing one instruction every 4.7 cycles. So it's operating at worse than 1 18th of its peak bandwidth. Why? Because it's waiting for data to come back from memory. And he ends the article saying that I expect that over the coming decade, memory subsystem design will be the only, with emphasis, important design issue for microprocessors. It's a beautiful one pager if you want to read it. Okay, but we know about this uh, before also. Uh, actually, Norm Juppie in his uh, paper uh, that introduces stream buffers, he also talked about the same problem. Uh, that's why he introduces stream buffers uh, to make sure. So people have known about this, but it's getting worse basically. This is data from my own PhD thesis, my first paper actually run at execution. He basically worked together with Intel to show essentially the same thing. Most of the time on a memory intensive workload that Intel used to design its processors for, you get uh, the processor waits for cache misses. It's not doing useful work uh, uh, most of the time. And you can read papers. And if you don't believe us, everybody was Google. So Google actually has a beautiful paper in 2015 that shows essentially the same thing. According to them, uh, in all of their data center workloads, you may see some of these, you may use some of these. A state of the art server processor uh, waits for data most of the time. It's stalled for more than 50% of the time, basically. Again, I'm going through these relatively quickly because this is 2015 and you can read the paper. It's a beautiful paper. Okay, so I can keep going through this, but I don't want to spend more time on this. But basically, we have grossly imbalanced systems because processing is done only in one place. Everything else just stores and moves data. As a result, data moves a lot. This is fundamentally energy inefficient, low performance, and adds complexity to the system to overcome, try to overcome these things. Uh, and to, uh, as we add complexity, uh, the processors become more bloat bloated as well as the accelerators. And this, this makes things even more energy efficient, inefficient, uh, low performance and complex. Okay, then, so we're back to this picture because we're processor centric. Most of the system is dedicated to storing and moving data. That's what I mean by compl complex is bloated, right? If you look at this, to tolerate the uh, data access, everything is about data stored inside this. Uh, no, every, most, most, uh, more than 90% of the system is about data storage, but then we're still bonded by memory. <laughs> Okay, let's take a look at the energy perspective. This is actually even worse, basically. If performance is bad, energy is much worse. So this is a slide from Bill Daly. It's about, again, eight years ago. Uh, numbers change, of course, but relatives don't change. In fact, they become sometimes worse. In this particular case, actually, uh, a 64-bit double precision floating point operation, according to them, consumes 20 picojoules. A DRAM read or write to 16 nanojoules. That's 800x difference. So it's good to ask the question, does it really make sense to do two memory accesses to get two operands and for a simple, well, it's actually a complex double precision floating point operation in this particular case, and then write the result back one more time with another DRAM access. So three DRAM access is about 2400X worse uh, than the computation that you're trying to do. To overcome that energy cost, you have to have a lot of locality actually in your caches. You need to have a lot of reuse. And actually, Wen Mei Hu did a lot of calculations. He has a beautiful uh, talk where he goes through these calculations. You need to have reuse levels of like thousands of times, which we don't get. That's very luxurious, let's say. Our caches, unfortunately, most of our caches house data that are not used at all, not even once after they're touched. So we have a problem, basically. So our cache hierarchies assume reuse, but we need to really reuse the data a lot more so that we can overcome this huge energy disparity, which is growing as we will see, especially if you look at simple operations. There's also data from another paper by Bill Daly and Song Han, where they show that a simple uh, integer add is 6,400x less energy costly than a VM read or write. So this is even worse, of course, right? So I could give you more data. There's a lot more other papers you can uh, find here. And this is the reason why most of the system energy is spent on data mode, basically, because computation is very cheap today. And I think uh, maybe I'll make a comment over here at the risk of running late. <laughs> but this is actually the success of technology scale. Right? This is so cheap in terms of energy because we, because we were able to miniaturize the transistors and make them extremely efficient. But unfortunately, we were not as successful with interconnect and memory structures. Interconnect did not scale well. As a result, most of the memory energy is spent on interconnect and also memory. Okay. So I would argue that we do not want to move data. We want to minimize the data moment. Uh, and for this, we need a uh, paradigm shift because our current paradigm 
tries to actually, uh, I don't want to call it maximize data movement, but it's not good for data movement. Uh, but if we compute where it makes sense, where data resides, and enable uh, mechanisms to minimize data movement, perhaps we can get to a much better place. And this requires us to make computing architectures more data centric uh, and memory centric in the end. So in the rest of this, I'm going to talk about memory, but I think a lot of the general things are applicable to other uh, like storage devices as well. I'm going to focus a little bit more on VM, but first I want to uh, give you a lay of the land of processing inside memory. And we still have time, that's good. Okay, so memory is interesting, uh, but you can think of this as storage also actually. Uh, so basically you have some uh, uh, important data that's stored in memory. And today, actually, we have a lot of applications that do in-memory database, in-memory graph processing, in-memory machine learning, in-memory media processing. We would like to be able to uh, ask the memory, memory, can you execute this function for me? You can call this a query or a function. And the memory says yes or no. If it says yes, it returns a result. So this is a simple accelerator model. This is not even actually, in my opinion, uh, fundamentally data-centric because it still assumes that uh, there's a more, uh, uh, let's say, there, there's a trust report that orchestrates it. A more data-centric model would be a lot more distributed, basically. All of these all of these elements that are processing capability would be equals, and they would work uh, with each other. So this is the, let's say, heaven of people who have been talking about distributed computing for decades, right? They've been assuming compute-centric processes, but even distributed computing at a more device-level scale would be very interesting. But we're not talking about that. We're still thinking about these as accelerators because it's easier to adopt. But even with accelerators, there's many questions over here. How do you design the compute capable memory and controllers? We're gonna talk a lot about that today, uh, especially in terms of how, what's happening uh, in industry. Uh, processors and communication units, software and hardware interfaces to take advantage of them, especially when you do programming of the upman system, you will see some things in the software and hardware interfaces that uh, the design decisions that were made uh, for that. Uh, I'll let Juan talk about those more. And then system software compiles on languages so that we can take advantage of it. And then also algorithms. How do you actually fit the algorithms to the computation capability present? Uh, how do you fix the, fit the memory layout, for example? How do you take advantage of the memory layout with different algorithms? And in the end, theoretical foundations. We really need to revisit the theoretical foundations of computing also because uh, today's computing theory assumes that, uh, the theory of computation assumes that algorithmic complexity is a function of number of operations that you do. But Everything that we just said that algorithmic complexity maybe uh, sh should consider data moment as well. So I think today's, uh, uh, because uh, processors were very processor centric to begin with, the theory developed to be very processor centric also. But if you want to have more data centric system, the theory needs to be developed in a different way, in my opinion. But if you look at this as an across the stack problem, it uh, has, it touches devices, algorithms, and everything in between. Uh, and I think it's good to look at it uh, from that perspective. This doesn't mean that we cannot do things uh, more in, in one layer to take advantage of things. And uh, especially with industry today, because of adoption issues, it's good to, it's good to uh, try to do things, uh, change things as little as possible so that we can actually evolve to uh, a, a processing in memory system. Okay, so we've written uh, this paper, uh, which we keep updating on archive. If you're interested, this covers a lot of the things that we're gonna cover in this uh, tutorial, but this also covers a lot of things that are in research, not necessarily in real architectures. And we also have a PIM course that Juan has been uh, leading. Uh, uh, this is an older edition, actually, spring, but there's, there was a full one, and we're, we're starting a spring 2003. And if you're interested, you can actually join these courses also. These are all live stream on YouTube. And people have been participating and asking questions on YouTube, so that's good. I should also say that we need to think differently from past approaches. Uh, here, I will define two ways of doing processing in memory. Uh, in my opinion, it's actually, there are only two ways that are different, uh, uh, fundamentally different, I should say. Today, we have processors here and memory here. Uh, the second approach, processing near memory, and they're far away from each other. The second approach says, add, uh, get computation or processors closer and closer and closer and closer and closer to memory. At some point, they can be combined inside the memory, but they're still distinct. Distinct in the sense that Memory has memory functionality and processor or computation has logic functionality. Processing using memory is completely different, basically. It doesn't have this memory processor dichotomy. It says, so the processor is here, memory is here. Forget about the processor. Forget about computation logic. You have memory. This device fundamentally has computation properties as well because of its analog operational properties. Let's take advantage of and enhance those analog operational properties. So that's why I think this is longer term. And I think Manuel will talk about the things that they're doing from the processing using memory perspective at IBM Research. 
but most of the real systems today are processing near memory because if you think about it, this doesn't fundamentally change uh, the uh, the structure of how we build systems today. It just processor gets closer. Of course, at some point, the interfaces need to change because you cross some lines, if you will. Uh, uh, so th this is that's why this is easier. But processing using memory, I, I believe, should be examined going forward, and that's really important as well. Because fundamentally, in the end, I think both of these need to be combined uh, to take advantage of uh, uh, different types of computation. Because uh, some types of computation may be a little bit more difficult when using memory at least with our understanding today of processing using memory. But of course, if you add logic, you can do any type of computation uh, near memory. Okay, so I'll go through these relatively quickly because we're going to cover these uh, in later uh, uh, lectures today. But basically, processing using memory, uh, you exploit internal connectivity to move data, you exploit analog computation capability to, do, to perform computation. Let me give you a very simple example, data copy and initialization. This is not even computation, right? But it's something that we assigned to processors today. Basically, uh, if you want to copy data from one location to another location in memory, if you want to initialize data, why not just do it inside memory? Today, you have to go through the processor. And if you actually ask this question to a child and give the system, and the child doesn't know anything, you know, they would probably ask you, why are you going through the processor for this? Why not just do this thing in memory? So basically, in future systems, I think if you want to copy one page to another page, we should just be able to do this. And this is actually very cheap in memory, as I will show you in a little bit. So uh, this is low latency. This is low bandwidth. You don't actually utilize the data bus, which is uh, an expensive resource. No cache pollution, but you could eliminate that during the EMA today. No unwanted data movements. And an expensive operation that's a four kilobyte page copy that's about 1,000 nanoseconds can become 90 nanoseconds. Uh, and energy actually reduces a lot more, as you can see over here. And the idea is very simple. Uh, at least this is one of the ideas. I believe this is the fastest way of doing it today. Uh, this is called row clone. In DRAM, you activate the source row, uh, which brings the data into the row buffer. And inside the same subway, if you want to copy this data into the same subway, you activate the destination row. This implicitly deactivates the source row and connects the data that was in the row buffer to the destination row. So by using the row buffer, as a temporary storage, which already exists in the app, and doing two consecutive activations, you can do this with negligible hardware cost. And you can see that you, the performance energy benefits are significant. So that was row clone. Six years later, these good folks from Princeton actually demonstrated that you can actually do this in most DRAM chips that they've tested quite reliably by violating the timing parameters to imitate those two consecutive activations. So DRAM actually has the capability to do that today. It's not specified, but it's amazing to see that it's actually, you can do this without changing DRAM at all. Of course, if you want to do it reliably, you probably want to change DRAM slightly to make sure that it's reliable, but this shows that this analog computation, well, analog data moment capability already exists. And we built on this work to introduce PyDRAM, which we will talk about, uh, which basically is an open source FPGA based infrastructure where you can modify the timing parameters to do different things, including row form, uh, and also a, a true random number generation that uh, we're not going to talk about. You can also do computation as we will discuss, but it's a bit uh, less reliable. Okay, we'll talk about that. Uh, this And this is fully open source. If people are interested in working on it, uh, I believe this is the only open source prototype for processing using memory uh, today, using DRAM. Okay, and we have some lectures on it you can take a look at. So this is the mindset basically. Memory is an accelerator. So you can say that, okay, this is data moment. What about computation? We can actually do uh, in DRAM computation as well uh, by using analog computation capability of DRAM. Uh, you can do a bitwise uh, majority, bitwise and or not, and by activating multiple roles. And I think this is fascinating. We, we're going to talk more about this also. That's why I'm re re going through this relatively quickly. And I believe new memory technologies enable even more opportunities. Uh, memristors, resistor RAM, phase change memory. And some of these actually have the capability to do matrix vector multiplication and analog. There are, of course, reliability issues in all of these because they're actually fundamentally doing analog computation. Uh, you need to, at some point, convert it to digital. Now, DRAM actually is beautiful because it already has com uh, conversion circuitry between analog to digital. That's the sense amplifiers. Uh, but in these some other technologies, you need to add more uh, to make sure it works reliably. Uh, so maybe I'll give you the key idea very quickly, but you're going to cover this more, I assume, right? like later on. So basically, the key idea in DRAM, if you activate three rows concurrently, it gives you a bitwise majority function because if at least two cells are discharged, you get the discharge state at the end. If at least two cells are charged, you get the charge state at the end. And this is based on fundamental circuit principles. And 
Bitwise majority is essentially computation. You basically can compute the majority of three rows. Now, it also is good because you take out C, set C to one, you get the OR of AND, you set C to zero, you get the end of AND. Now you can do bitwise AND and bitwise OR. Now, this is beautiful. Again, this is uh, when we published our paper in 2017, it was like theoretical. We did all of this in simulation and showed that this makes sense and you get significant benefits. Again, the compute DRAM paper two years later showed that in some limited amount of chips, you can actually get this functionality. And then not, they were able to replicate this in real chips by uh, violating the timing parameters. So real chips are capable of this, basically. We had a lot of pushback in our paper, basically. It was rejected four times. <laughs> because <laughs> So it's good to have these works that uh, come afterwards to show that, oh, you can actually do it in real chips. <laughs> of course, not reliably, right? Uh, reliability is a difficult problem in this particular case, especially. Okay, so what is this good for? Basically, there are a lot of applications that take advantage of box bitwise operations today. In database and bitmap indices, we actually show that with the bit reading database, which was designed to maximize bitwise operations, you get significant benefits. There are web search engines that are trying to maximize bitwise operations, and there are a bunch of other things that are built on bitwise operations. And also, you can build your algorithm to take advantage of it. I forgot one thing. You can also do not, but not requires a change, complement. So uh, you actually uh, can take the complement of a value uh, because it exists over here, right? Whenever you read a row over here, the complement exists. So you need to feed it back in our design into the same subarray. But this requires changes to DRAM, so you cannot do it in existing DRAM, regardless of how much you violate timing parameters, at least with, uh, the way we know it today. Uh, uh, so basically, you can have a functionally complete system because and or not, uh, and and not are functionally complete. Majority and not are functionally complete. Uh, so you can actually uh, imagine designing any algorithm to take advantage of this block device operation capability. And that, that's, I think, that's uh, what I mentioned by algorithm to devices. You have a device that can do analog computation. How do you match the algorithm to the bot bitwise execution capability of uh, the device? Okay, so we did that uh, for databases, which was easier, and we see significant performance improvements, as you can see over here. And we're going to talk more about this, and there are papers on it. And more recently, we've shown that you can actually generalize this. One is going to talk about this. Basically, you can have a pass that minimizes the logic that generates a microprogram for a, any given user input. This is your, this could be your desired operation. It could be convolution, for example, it could be matrix multiplication. Well, I'm going to talk more about those. But you can actually store a microprogram that does that operation, and you can associate that as an instruction. And in your program, you can call that instruction. When you call that instruction, uh, it gets shipped to the memory controller, and the memory controller executes the sequence of activates pre charts that essentially do multiple row activations and back-to-back -back row activations to make sure that everything works. Of course, this requires uh, manual allocation of some of these rows and DRAM, et cetera, but people have built compilers. Actually, in HPCA, I think there's a compiler work that's being presented that takes advantage of this bit serial uh, computation capability. Okay, so basically, the stack is also growing for processing using memory. That's a good thing. And, okay, I'm going to uh, skip these results. What else can you do? So some things are difficult to do, of course. If you want to do division, for example, if you want to do a large multiplication, it becomes difficult to do in a bit serial manner because the latencies increase and complexity increases. So you can actually add lookup tables in DM. This requires more modifications to DM. So you can actually compute some of these things using lookup tables, as people knew using lookup tables, but doing it in DM is a little bit more sophisticated. And you can see more about that. Uh, what else can you do by violating the timing parameters? These are works that uh, we have shown earlier that you can actually do physical and clonable functions. You can generate random numbers in the UM. I believe these are actually good because these enable security support in the UM. I think we will have time when we, uh, when we talk about processing using memory, we'll talk more about these. Okay. So it's not the UM, just to show that it's not the UM. There's also you can, things you can do with Flash. Uh, Flash actually is very interesting in my opinion. It has some upsides and downsides. Upsides in the sense that you can do a bitwise end of, let's say, 48 rows at the same time. So a very large uh, fan in uh, bitwise end is possible. So large amounts of data can be processed this way. And uh, as I said, other works have shown that you can do these things in phase change memory as well. Uh, this is from Yuan Shei's group. I will not go through these in detail. We don't have time. And as I also said, uh, with emerging memory technologies, because of the crossbar array structure, uh, you can perform dot product operations using analog computation capable. Again, this is beautiful, I think, and there, there are prototypes that are being developed uh, to show uh, these things. ISSTC always has a few papers that talk about uh, uh, new prototypes for uh, analog matrix vector computation in uh, emerging technologies. I guess the key idea basically is 
uh, Kirchhoff's laws. You can apply voltages uh, to these cells. You can store um, uh, the weights of a matrix, for example, uh, inside the cells, and you can input uh, the vector that you're going to multiply the matrix with as voltages over here. Each element of the vector is a voltage level over here. And this voltage gets multiplied with the conductance over here. And that's uh, that's the current. And that current gets summed up with the voltage multiplied by the conductance in this weight, essentially. And the bit line current in the end is uh, essentially uh, the dot product of the vector and the weights that are stored uh, in that particular column. OK, there's some demonstration over here, but we don't have a lot of time for that, right? <laughs> OK. So, uh, and there are papers that are written on this topic. Uh, so this is actually interesting because when people uh, envision logic in memory in 1960s, I don't think they thought, think, thought about it as much. There are not that many, not, 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 no papers actually that talk about this sort of analog computation capability in memory. So this is something relatively new, in my opinion, compared to the past. Uh, so and showing that you can do it in even existing technologies like DRAM is actually quite uh, fascinating. Okay, let me talk about processing near memory relatively quickly, and then uh, we will jump into uh, one's presentation. So we keep we still keep the mindset as accelerator over here. Uh, so I think processing near memory is interesting because uh, basically, you, how do you, uh, what is near? You can get near by putting logic inside uh, next to the caches, putting logic inside the memory controllers, putting logic inside 3D stack logic, uh, 3D stack memories, as we did in this work. But here, I think the interesting thing is what kind of applications would benefit and what should be offloaded uh, near memory? And what kind of computation capability should you support which, at which part? So it's a huge design space, in my opinion. But we need to cut the design space somehow by understanding the applications and how we can accelerate it. When we first started looking at this in 2011 or so, uh, basically we looked at graph analytics. And graphs are actually quite memory-bound applications because in many cases, you get a lot of frequent random memory access and you have little amount of computation. And we basically uh, wanted to take advantage of uh, the logic layer to do the computation and not move the data uh, uh, between processors that you put in the logic layer, but move the functions uh, to processors that house the data. So that's the basic idea over here. We want to exploit the logic layer so that we can actually do graph processing. So logic layer enables us to have a lot of processors, which we added, and there's some connection between them. But of course, this is not enough. So you actually, to scale up the system, you need a distributed system where you connect these 3D cube chips, if you will. And then you can offload your graph computation from a host processor over here, and the graph computation continues. And this requires changes to the programming model. Also, basically, we, require, uh, we added remote function call based programming. So the basic idea is, uh, you offload your graph, you partition your graph across these processors, across these cubes first and the processors inside the cube. Ideally, you partition your graph so that you maximize the locality within each cube so you don't exercise all the connections. That's an open problem. Later work actually improved that a lot. Uh, and then your programming model is such that whenever you want to do, uh, you want to update a graph node, uh, you send a message to the processor that causes that graph node, including the update that you want to do and the temporary value. And basically, you just move the function to the data with the temporary values, of course, and you don't move the data to the function in the end. So it's very similar to distributed system programming models that we have today in that sense. Uh, so it doesn't change a whole lot, but of course, this is not done uh, at a node level uh, today. Okay, I'm not going to bore you with the prefetching mechanisms, but you can see that the, this, uh, 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 this uh, system, which we call Tesseract, uh, breaks the dichotomy. If you look at this dichotomy, these are the systems that were available at that time, compute-centric systems. Compute uh, units are here, and memory units are attached to them. Whereas here, we're actually uh, combining computation and memory units and then building a distributed system out of that. And you can see that the amount of memory bandwidth that's available to the computation units, which are the same number as over here, is 8 terabytes per second at the time. This old value. Today, it's actually much, much higher, actually. So you can see that the memory bandwidth is increased by more than an order of magnitude because of this. And as a result, performance also increases uh, by about 14x according to our results. But later work actually improved on this. There's actually a lot of re uh, literature building on this work that uh, optimizes different parts of the graph processing system. Uh, and they actually go up to 100x uh, in total uh, with those uh, additive optimizations. Uh, and then energy reduction, uh, I believe, is also significantly showed. But later work actually did a lot more on top of this, and they showed even more uh, benefits. Again, we don't have time to cover all of these. Uh, maybe I'll cover in storage uh, filtering also, and then uh, very quickly go over the rest. 
So this is something, as I mentioned, memory is interesting, but storage is actually even more interesting in some applications. And if you think the energy to access data from main memory is large, the energy to access the data from storage is much larger. So if you actually have huge data sets and uh, storage is your bottleneck, it makes a whole lot more sense to actually do the computation inside the storage system. Now, the beauty of the storage system, the storage system is actually almost like a full computing system today. It has processors inside there. You can put accelerators inside there. And it has DRAM inside there. You can actually increase it. So it can actually do a lot more. Now, we did not do that exactly over here, but basically uh, for genome sequencing, which uh, uh, some of the tasks in genome sequencing are very much storage bound, you move a lot of data through the main memory, through the caches, to the computation units. So there's a lot of computation overhead and data movement overhead from storage. Today, we actually do a lot of acceleration uh, to reduce the computation overhead. So accelerators actually make the data movement overhead even worse because the fraction of time that's spent on data movement increases once you reduce the computation overhead in the system. This is basic Moore's law, of, uh, basic Amdahl's law, of course, right? So accelerators are actually even more bound by the data movement in the end. Uh, okay, so what we do in this work is actually filter reads uh, with some simple mechanisms so that a small amount of reads that really require processing over here are moved to the computation. And again, I don't have time to go into details, but you need to be careful, of course, what you filter over here so that you uh, minimize the data moment and uh, maximize the utilization of the system. And we show that actually you can significantly improve speed up or performance as well as energy at the same time again. Depends on the data set, depends on what gets filtered over here. So it depends on your application and genomics in the end. But in some cases, you can get 30x uh, improvement in performance and about 30x improvement in energy as well at the same time again. Okay. Okay, maybe I'll talk about a couple more things and then I'll conclude. <laughs> so I'm going to skip this one. This is what I mentioned earlier. With Google, we did this study uh, to understand data moments and we found out basically functions that actually cause a lot of data moments, for example, in tensor flow inference, you get a lot of data movements because of packing, unpacking, and quantization. And if you offload that to memory, you get significant benefits. Uh, I'm going to mention uh, one, uh, one other work that we did with Google, uh, where we actually uh, looked at uh, machine learning. Uh, but, but you can find a lot of other works in processing near memory over here, and also in the literature. It's very hard to put everything in one paper, but we have a lot of references in our uh, uh, paper. Uh, it's hard to put them in presentations. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about this, uh, and then I will uh, conclude over here. So uh, re more recently, we analyzed the neural network models that uh, Google uses for their edge devices. So these are proprietary uh, edge models that we used at the time. And it has a wide range of models. LSTMs and transducers are quite interesting because they tend to be a lot more memory intensive. And we basically analyzed the state-of-the-art accelerator at the time. And we find out that actually it's not working very well because it's bottlenecked by memory, basically. And, uh, and the main reason is it's very compute centric. Uh, it doesn't have any data centric components. So we, we basically uh, design a heterogeneous accelerator uh, that, can, that has some data centric components. That's the idea to overcome the compute centric nature of the accelerator in the end. So I'm gonna show you uh, pictures over here. But in the end, if you do that, and if you decide which layers uh, of neural networks and which neural networks go to which of these accelerators, you can improve both performance and energy by about 3x. Again, these are, both of them are improved at the same time. And also it, it turns out, which was to our surprise, you can reduce the area. The three accelerators combined together in terms of area cost is smaller than the monolithic accelerator that's designed today because it's very much over-provisioned today. Okay, so uh, this is, these are the things that we study. And we basically do a lot of characterization in terms of models. There's significant variation in terms of the characteristics of these models, like parameter footprint, flops per byte. Though. There's a huge variation, as you can see over here. So a single accelerator doesn't fit all of them well. And there's also significant variation across the layers of a given neural network, for example. And you can see that multiplied accumulates and flops per byte, they vary a lot across different layers. You can find the numbers online. This paper is also uh, online. So. so today we design monolithic accelerators, but uh, we really argue for uh, a heterogeneous set of accelerators. In this particular case, we designed three because we analyze the layers and we find out that three of them can be clustered uh, nicely. Uh, or, or different layers can be clustered to, so that they can be executed efficiently with three of these uh, accelerators. And then you need to have a runtime system that decides what layer goes to which uh, accelerator. So how do you identify those? It's an empirical process, basically. It's, you can think of this clustering, essentially. And that's what we do. Okay, I will not bore you with these. But basically, in the end, if you have a heterogeneous accelerator, which is what we call Mensa, uh, design detailer in the paper, you can actually reduce 
uh, the energy significantly. You can actually see this, this is LSPM model and transducer model. They're mainly bonded by off-chip interconnect and DM. So you can see that this is yellow and this is blue. Most of the uh, energy is spent on off-chip interconnect and DM, and some of it is static, a lot of it is DM in the end. So that's what I meant by more than 90% of the energy is spent uh, on memory. And we can reduce that significantly by uh, designing these heterogeneous accelerators and scheduling them appropriately. Throughput improvements is also significant, uh, but it's really the energy that gets improved a whole lot more than throughput uh, in, in some of these models, as you can see. And we covered latency also in the paper. Okay, uh, I can add more here, but I will say that we need to revisit the entire stack. I think a lot of these works actually revisit the entire stack in some way, and there's a lot more in our paper. There are adoption. So later today, we'll talk about adoption challenges. I think that's really important, uh, but I will save this for later. And there are a lot of them, as you can see. So accelerating key applications, I, I think of this as an adoption challenge, actually. How do you show different applications? Uh, but there's also how do you keep it simple? How do you maintain coherence? This is actually a hair issue. And probably the worst, uh, there's synchronization. Uh, Christina, who will give a talk on SPME, has worked on synchronization. I think she will touch on synchronization issues in the OpMap uh, system. Uh, virtual memory is unfortunately probably the worst hairy thing, in my opinion. When you need to deal with virtual memory and translation, how does it happen across different accelerators, especially data centric accelerators? This becomes hairy. I think virtual memory in existing systems, when memory sizes are increasing to be huge, is already problematic in compute centric systems, but it's going to be even worse in data centric systems. Okay, so uh, probably I should stop here. Any questions? I can talk more, but the rest I'm going to talk about, this is definitely going to be covered uh, right now because things are happening. Okay, I'll stop. Uh, yes, please, Vijay. I'm looking at this, like, so the technology scaling for the transition side, like, you know, the term, like the computer is going to make. So what were the fundamental reasons that the interconnect and the different like, you know, you couldn't have been that blind to the thing. Yeah. What are, like, the big hurdles we had that we were fighting? Yeah. Well, we can't do it. Yeah, I mean, uh, in the end, that's a very good question. Basically. Certainly we were not blind and we knew that uh, because it's, I think it's the fundamental thing is it's really interconnects. Interconnects don't scale with Moore's law, right? Whereas logic, uh, we, can, we can scale gates, we can scale transistors, but interconnects are not transistors, right? So logic, uh, technology scaling is all about transistor scaling, whereas interconnects are, what do you do about it? So I think people need to come up with some different ways of scaling it. And that's a fundamentally harder problem. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, yes, yeah, certainly designing like better technology for interconnects is also important, but uh, all of the technologies over there uh, are usually power hungry. And when you get uh, uh, low power interconnects, it's usually higher latency. So it exacerbates the data movement problem, either in terms of energy or performance. So people are working on it, but it's a much more difficult problem. It has been a much more difficult problem than. Uh, scaling the uh, properties of the transistor. And it's probably not going to change anytime soon. <laughs> yeah. How do these changes if we start to distribute the compute, like mm -hmm. to the software side of things, do you think that when you look at your example on the architecture side of things, mm -hmm. like all of this is sort of happening? Mm -hmm. And then do you have a set meaning of the software? Like, are there any implications for how the stack? Like, is there mm -hmm. anything that we have to change in the programming models or how can we do with this and bring in the way the software rises and touch? Yeah, that's a great question, I think. And I think the jury is still out in that one. For example, with the test rack system that I mentioned, you can use, uh, if your software is already designed to be uh, uh, remote procedure call based, function call based, then actually you can take advantage of an underlying. Uh, processing in memory system that actually uses those primitives uh, that exist in your software. But in some cases, it's not possible, in my opinion. Uh, then you will need to change, right? <laughs> yeah, example is that one. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, exactly. So that requires a completely different stack, maybe a completely different software paradigm also. Yeah, 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 exactly. We'll talk about that <laughs> with the SIMDM, but yes, uh, as I mentioned earlier, people are building compilers and one of them is going to be presented at HPC8. So it's good that things are happening, <laughs> but yes, I think that's a different paradigm.
Any other questions? Okay, I'll leave it to Juan now then. Okay. Yeah, I think it's written uh, good. I'm seeing the. Oh, you are seeing. Okay. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, I think I should share the probably no, I should be fine. I hope so screen sharing is false. How does it look in Zoom? It says it's not coming up. It's not coming up. Good now. It's good now. Okay, great. Okay, yeah. So let's continue now talking about uh, processing near memory architectures, and we are going to focus on near memory uh, pro uh, processing near memory architectures that. Let me see if I can close this. Okay, processing near memory architectures that are real, are already in the in the real world. Uh, Onur has um, introduced processing near memory and he has talked about some academic proposals such as uh, PEI and, or Tesseract or the work that we did with uh, different Google workloads. And that's, I think, uh, really interesting work that has somehow uh, opened the later developments in the real world uh, from uh, different companies in industry, both uh, startups and major vendors. Uh, remember that uh, we are talking here about two main approaches to processing in memory. This um, uh, text here and the table comes from the uh, book chapter that Honor mentioned earlier. These two main approaches are processing using memory that uh, we will talk later about and processing near memory. There are different ways of doing processing near memory depending on where you place the compute units and also depending on what are those compute units. Uh, but today we are going to focus on those that already exist either in the market or have become uh, prototypes and have been announced and tested by the corresponding vendors. So the first ones to announce a real world processing in memory system was uh, AppMem, which is a French startup uh, settled in Grenoble. And um, and they did that in some time, some sometime uh, between uh, 2016 and 2019. They developed their system and they release it. And uh, a couple of years later, in early 2021, Samsung announced the HP and PIM architecture, also called uh, FinDRAM. Later, the same year, at Hot Chips, they also announced. Uh, uh, PIM systems for LP DDR5 and for uh, DIM, uh, I mean, uh, DDR4 DIMs. We are going to talk about them briefly in, in a few minutes. And last year, about one year ago, 
Um, SK Hynix also announced their own architecture called Accelerator in Memory. And also in the same conference, ISSCC Alibaba announced uh, HBM PNM, the HBPNM, that is one of the, uh, we are going to have uh, Dimi New talking about one of these, uh, I mean, about uh, talking about this architecture. I'm going to start with uh, Admin PIM. I will give you an introduction to the architecture. Then we will briefly go over the different proposals or the different um, prototypes that different vendors have announced. And at the end, or in the second part of the talk, we will focus on how to program admin team because that's what we need or you need to know in order to do the hands-on lab this afternoon. So this is a slide from Honor. You have probably seen it before. Basically, the admin pin system is a processing endurance system. It's uh, built on DDR4 modules, and inside each of the chips, there are called pin chips. There are uh, memory arrays, as usual, DRAM memory arrays, as usual, but there are also small processors that are called DRAM processing units or DPUs. And this is how these DIMMs look. This uh, is uh, one of the earlier prototypes that they developed, con uh, consisting only of eight chips in total, one rank in total, 64 DPUs, 64 uh, in order pin cores. Uh, more recently, they already started to fabricate a dual, uh, I mean, a dual rank DIMMs with uh, up to 16 chips. And this is a picture of the system that you will have access to this uh, afternoon. Um, it's, uh, as you can see, it contains two, uh, it's a dual socket CPU, as you can see on the, on the picture, uh, CPU 0 and CPU 1, and then both CPUs have access to DDR4 DIMMs, conventional DRAM that is still used as main memory, and then the PIM-enabled DIMMs, that is the, the admin DIMMs that are the PIM-enabled memory. We have worked ex extensively on understanding and characterizing this system, and this is one paper that we published uh, last year. You can access uh, it in archive, and also at the very bottom, you can see the link to the repository where all the codes that we develop are publicly available. So let's start talking about the admin PIM architecture. And I usually like to start uh, some of these talks uh, taking a look at the patent because I think that the abstract of the patent very clearly defines what the admin PIM architecture is. It's a memory circuit with a memory array and near the memory array, there is a first processor. This first processor is the PIM core or the DPU. And there is a control interface for a central processor, the host CPU to send commands to the uh, PIM uh, processor, to the first processor or the PIM, the PIM core. The banks become available to the host processor when the PIM core is not working anymore with the data that resides in the memory bank and the other way around. So at this point, uh, at least in the current generation, it's not possible to have concurrent accesses from both the PIM core and the CPU. And this is a picture also from the pattern uh, of the overall system organization. Here you can see a system on a chip, and these are the different chips inside the different chips. We have the memory arrays, and also we have the processors. And this is another uh, picture, maybe even more simplified, where you can see the host CPU, main memory DIMMs, and PIM enabled DIMMs. And if we take a closer look at these PIM enabled DIMMs, and we take a closer look at the memory chips, PIM chips, we can see that inside each of the pin chips, we have eight DRAM banks that admin calls main RAM or MRAM. We are going to call them MRAM banks or the, over the course of uh, these talks. This talk, each of them is uh, 64 megabytes and near each of the MRAM banks, there is a PIM processor or PIM core that is called DRAM processing unit or DPU. And as you can see, we have eight DPUs per chip. So in total, 64 DPUs per rank. Feel free to uh, ask any question at any time, please. So uh, we can take a closer look at the DRAM processing unit. This is also uh, from the patent. Remember that that's uh, one of the chips. And inside the chips, we have all these different slices that represent the memory banks. This is one of the memory banks. And, and here you can see the core itself with the instruction memory, with the pipeline and with the local memory. But I think that this figure uh, here can be uh, more clear inside the pin chip. There is a control or status interface for the host processor to communicate with the uh, DRAM processing units. There is a DDR4 interface for the host processor to access 
the DRAM banks. Then we have the 64 uh, megabyte DRAM banks called NRAM, remember, and the way of accessing from the uh, PIM core side, the way of accessing the NRAM bank is through a DMA engine. Using this DMA engine, we can move instructions to the 24 kilobyte instruction RAM. It's an instruction memory, it's not an instruction cache. So keep that into account. The, 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 the largest size of the program that you run on the DPU is 24 kilobytes. And then we also have a um, uh, so-called WRAM or working RAM, which is a scratch pad, it's SRAM based and is used to store operands for that will be accessed by the pipeline. The size of this WRAM is 64 kilobytes. And this is the pipeline. We can take a closer look at the pipeline here. In total, there are 14 pipeline stages. The normal thing that you can expect in an in, in, in order processor, dispatch for se thread selection, instruction fetch, uh, access to the register file, operand formatting, um, the ALU stage to either use the ALUs or to access the WRAM and the uh, finally the uh, stages for result formatting. This pipeline is fine grained multi threaded and can have and has up to 24 hardware threads. And it's an in order pipeline that runs at a frequency, well, it ran at a frequency of 350 megahertz when we were working. For the first time with the system, now there are uh, DIMMs with uh, chips running at 400 or, or uh, DPUs running at 425 megahertz. I'm pretty sure that all of you are familiar with fine grain multi-threading, but if you want to uh, have a very quick brush up, fine grain multi-threading is a, an execution uh, technique that basically interleaves the execution of instructions from different threads. And that's a way of avoiding data dependencies in the pipeline. And that's what, um, AppMem does in order to um, uh, yeah, uh, in order to make sure that the pipeline is completely full and you don't need a, any complex unit inside the pipeline to do forwarding or to install threads, etc. So if you want to uh, recap more on fine grain multi-threading, this is uh, here you can find a link to one of uh, owner's lectures. So uh, yeah, exactly. Going back to the DPU pipeline, remember that in total we have. 14 pipeline stages, and this number gives us already an orientation of what's the number of threads that we should, add, I mean, a minimum number of threads that we should use in order to maximize the performance of the DPU. So um, the instruction set architecture is a specific 32-bit ISA. It's not, it's RISC, but it's not RISC-5. RISC and it, it's, uh, it's aimed at a scalar in order and multi-thread implementation. It allows comp compilation of 64-bit C code, but registers are 32 bits. And, um, and um, yeah, an admin provides an uh, LLVM clan compiler. <clears throat> if you want to, Take a look at some code here. You can see it at the very bottom. Uh, this is, is the code that corresponds to one of the micro benchmarks that we created when we were analyzing the architecture for in order to measure the throughput of 32-bit uh, integer addition. Uh, so at the top, you see the C base code that we wrote. Um, this is the uh, for loop. So basically, in this code, what we are doing is we are moving a chunk of data, a chunk of data of, uh, of this size. We are moving it from the MRAM, which is the DRAM bank, to the WRAM, which is the scratch pad. And then the threads will go over all the elements that you have loaded into the scratch pad and performing some operation. In this case, adding one scalar. This buffer A is the space that we allocate in WRAM. In principle, each thread can have its own buffer A, but these pointers can also be shared across the different threads that run on the DPU and so that the WRAM can be used as a shared memory in some way, in, in, a, in a similar way to the shared memory in uh, NVIDIA GPUs, for example. And here at the bottom, uh, you can see the compiled code with the DPU ISA. Uh, it's, as you can see, uh, pretty simple to understand. Reminds me MIPS or other, um, um, uh, I mean, other in order ISAs. Uh, this is the address calculation and, and load from WRAM. This is the add operation, and this is the store to WRAM. So I'm not going to go into many details about the architecture because we don't have uh, so much time, but uh, there are some links here 
for you to, I mean, if you are interested, you can access them and learn more details about the uh, DPU, the pipeline, and the architecture itself. And or, or otherwise, you can go to the paper. So um, before I continue, I want to give you the some key takeaways of our work because I think that they are going to clarify a lot about how the architecture performs. Uh, these are, this is some analysis that we did, operational intensity or arithmetic throughput versus operational intensity. As you can see on the plot, the y-axis is the arithmetic throughput in mega operations per second. The uh, x-axis is the operational intensity. Intensity. As we increase the operational intensity, the arithmetic throughput also increases until at some point it saturates. This part with the compute where the compute throughput is flat is what we call the compute bound region. And one other thing that you can observe is that uh, all these uh, different dots here correspond to the number of threads or the number of uh, the number of pin threads that we needed to achieve certain performance. One thing that you can observe is that in the memory bound region, the number of threads to reach the maximum arithmetic throughput is uh, relatively small, maybe one, two in the very beginning, but at some point until we, after, uh, after we reach this throughput saturation point and we enter into the compute bound region, we need to use as many threads as those that are needed to keep the entire pipeline full. And this number in particular is 11. One thing that you also can observe is that the operational intensity where these throughput saturation point happens is extremely low. It's one integer addition per every 32-bit element. If you are doing that, then you're already um, reaching the compute bound region. So the key takeaway number one is that the admin PIM architecture is fundamentally a compute bound architecture. So we expect that it's going to be suitable for um, uh, work loops that are memory bound in conventional processor centric systems. Um, we also perform a comparison to CPU and GPU. You can see on this uh, plot the speed up over CPU for some workloads that we consider more pin suitable because they perform better, they outperform uh, a GPU. In this case, we compare to an NVIDIA Titan 5. They outperform the NVIDIA uh, Titan, I mean, the, 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 at least the larger pin system because you can see that there are two different pin systems, the larger one with uh, 2,565 DPUs outperforms the GPU. Uh, for some other case, I mean, for some other workloads, it didn't perform the GPU, and that's uh, those are the ones that we call the less pin suitable workloads. But the key observation here is that the workloads that are more suitable for the admin PIM architecture and those that cannot perform the the state of the art GPU have three key characteristics. The first one is that they have streaming memory accesses because that's a way of maximizing the memory bandwidth of each of the individual DPUs or PIM cores. There is no or little inter DPU synchronization and we will see soon why this is important. Um, basically because there is no direct communication channel across DPUs. And the third one is that there is no or little use of integer multiplication, integer division, or floating point operations. Because even though this is a general purpose architecture and supports many different operations, there are some operations, more complex ones as the ones you can see on the, read on the slide, that are not supported natively. So they are emulated. So if you are using them, then performance won't be that great. So if uh, these three characteristics are fulfilled by a workload, it's good for the admin PIM architecture. Another key takeaway is that, um, well, is what I just read actually, key takeaway number two is that the uh, best or most suitable P uh, workloads for the admin PIM system uh, use no arithmetic operations or only uh, simple operations, and they also have little or no communication. And here, as a summary, you can see some numbers for the comparison to CPUs and GPUs. Um, if you go back to the previous slides, you will see that for most of the print benchmarks, uh, the, the larger uh, admin, the, for most of the benchmarks that we evaluated that are called print benchmarks, the larger the PIM system outperform uh, the CPU. And for a majority of them, in total 10 out of 16, it outperformed the a state of the art GPU. We believe that the future is even more positive for these kind of systems. In terms of energy efficiency, we can see that for those workloads where the admin systems provide performance improvements, they can also provide significant energy savings. Uh, and, and this is the link to the uh, repository that I also mentioned earlier. 
AppMem is not the only one that has fabricated and is starting to commercialize a PIM system. As I mentioned, Samsung already started to do it, to announce their prototypes and show them um, at conferences. The first one was called FIMDRAM, later called uh, HBM PIM. FIMDRAM is a more specialized system, is not so general purpose as the AppMem PIM architecture, is more focused on AI and machine learning, as you may know. It's based on HBM2 memory, and what they basically did is that for uh, a stack of HBM memory with eight different layers, they play some processing elements in four of the layers. These processing, in ele processing elements that you can see uh, here, these are called PCU blocks. Each of them has access to two banks and each of these PCUs is sort of a SIMD unit. It's a, 16-bit floating point, 60 uh, uh, SIMD unit with uh, 16 bit memory. So it's uh, good for uh, SIMD execution. And um, one interesting uh, characteristic of this FinDRAM architecture as well is that it's compliant with a modified JEDEC controller, which uh, probably will be good for its adoption. Uh, if you want to uh, learn more about FinDRAM or HVMP, of course, you can go to the original papers, but this is a lecture that we provided in our Processing in Memory course. It's not the only proposal from uh, Samsung, but it's uh, the proposal from Samsung uh, for HVM memories. But Samsung also presented in 2021 this AXDIM system that is a DIM-based solution. As you can see, it's... Um, it's a uh, DDR sort of uh, DIM uh, that uh, contains some reconfigurable uh, unit here inside this uh, AXDIM buffer. They prototyped it with uh, this um, uh, card with a standard DIM interface and some FPEA in the middle that can access uh, data from two DRAM ranks. And inside the uh, FPEA, in the first paper that they published, what they did was um, uh, implementing some, um, uh, com some uh, compute unit for recommendation systems, and in particular, uh, to calculate, uh, to, to access embedding tables and, um, and calculate the SLS operator. The, uh, this uh, specific hardware can work in two different modes. There is a normal mode where the host CPU is allowed to access data in the ranks. And there is also the P mode. In that case, the CPU cannot access anymore the ranks and the accelerators here, as you can see, uh, there are uh, actually two accelerators for, for the two ranks. Uh, the accelerators there can uh, access data from the ranks and compute as is needed. And, and this is more or less the uh, execution flow. In the, very in the very beginning, the host needs to write the embedding tables into the memory ranks. After that, it changes the mode from the normal mode to the P mode, and then writes instructions to the corresponding instruction buffer here, and then starts the execution of the SLS operator. So inside the, well, inside the um, NMP, inside the processing unit that uh, you have in the FPGA, we first uh, access, well, read one instruction, decode it, uh, then fetch data, uh, from the from the this PSAM buffer that uh, keeps the it's, it's like the accumulator for the calculations that they did here accessing the uh, embedding tables from the memory uh, adding and updating the PSAM buffer and this is a link to another lecture about uh, AX team in this case. The next real world PIM architecture that was presented uh, exactly one year ago and, and has uh, also been presented at Hot Chips at the end of uh, 2022 is from SK Hynix. It's called Accelerator in Memory and it has similar purpose to the HBM PIM architecture from Samsung. And actually, uh, if you look at this um, uh, die photograph here, it resembles a lot the admin PIM architecture. One key difference is that this one is for GDDR6 uh, DRAM and not for HVM DRAM, but as you can see, it also places some processing units near the memory banks. Not one processing unit every two banks, but there is one processing unit per bank. Uh, each of these 
because in the end, the type of workloads that they are targeting is the same. Each of these uh, also has an array of multipliers and then another tree, as you can see here on the right hand side. There are a, a couple of innovations in this uh, architecture as well that I consider very interesting. The first one is that um, they, um, uh, they, they have a specialized logic for activation functions, and these activation functions use access to memory to read from a lookup table, but they can also do interpolation in order to be more accurate. And uh, they also include these uh, SRAM-based supplementary buffers that are used to move, I mean, are used to keep some operands, for example, um, um, uh, for example, uh, the weights of a neural network layer or, or um, input feature maps. And uh, they can also be used to move data between different uh, memory banks in a similar way as the um, row clone um, um, techniques that uh, Professor Mudlu already introduced and we will discuss later again. And this is a lecture about AIM. And uh, the next one is Alibaba, uh, HB, PNM. In this case, it's a 3D stack logic and the DRAM-DAI, as you can see uh, here at the bottom of the, uh, of the slide, there is a DRAM-DAI at the top and there is a logic die at the, at the bottom. The logic die is more specialized for the specific, uh, uh, the specific applications that this uh, architecture is targeted at recommendation systems and as you can see it contains some specialized the coffee and in talk about this architecture Define ranking their neural engine if you call correctly is sort of a, um, a small systolic array. But we also delivered a lecture on HBMP. And there are more real PIM systems that I'm aware of at least one more from a, um, a startup in Israel that is called Neuroblade. These guys followed apparently a GPU approach. There are not many details, at least last time I checked their website, not many details about the architecture in their website, but they filed at least a couple of patents. And what the patent says is that it's a distributed processor that may include a memory array and a processing array. And the processing array is divided into processor subunits being associated with the corresponding dedicated uh, memory array of a plurality of memory arrays, and they can also uh, communicate. This is one of the pictures that you can find in their pattern, and here you can identify the different memory arrays, the processor subunits, and this uh, sort of uh, all to all network that connects the different processor subunits. And if you look at the um, uh, internals of the processor subunit, they may have different sorts of uh, processing elements such as, well, this one here, accelerators, etc. Cetera, et cetera. This picture is from their website. What we know from them is that um, the, their um, chips are called PIM XRAN chips or IEMPU. And, uh, and apparently, not complete, I'm not completely sure about this, but apparently uh, all the different execution co compute units are connected using PCI Express. Well, um, what, what can we say about all these systems that we have just very quickly covered? We can say that there are some similarities and some differences. Some of the differences is that, I mean, all of them can be considered processing near memory because they are placing processing elements near memory arrays, but it might be near the bank, as is the case of AppMemf in DRAM, AIM, or HVM PNM, or near the chip, as is the case of uh, AXDIM. Some of them are general purpose, such, such as AppMem, while others are more specialized, uh, in DRAM, AIM, or HVPNM. Uh, they use different execution paradigms, uh, fine grain multi-threading, SIMD, systolic arrays, and also the data types and operations they support might differ, differ, right? So some of them are natively integer, some of them support floating point, and even uh, for those that support floating point, 
uh, as you can see, some of them are floating point 16 or BF16 or FP32. It all depends on the uh, specific applications that they are targeted at. And same for the type of memory that they use, DDR4, LPDDR4, HBM2, or GDDR6. But there are as well some common characteristics between all these pin systems. First of all, there is a host processor that might be a CPU or a GPU, and this host processor has access to a standard main memory and also to the pin enabled memory. This pin enabled memory contains multiple processing elements that have high bandwidth and low, low latency memory access to their corresponding local memory or memory array. Uh, third, they, these uh, processing elements run are relatively slow. They run at a few hundred megahertz and have a small number of registers and a small uh, scratch pads or caches, or maybe they don't have these caches at all. And the P's usually cannot communicate directly between each other, or at least not outside of the same chip. They usually need to communicate via the host processor. This is a picture of such kind of system where we can see the host CPU, we can see the standard main memory, and then we can see the PIM enabled memory in different forms. This might be a DIM this, or, or a HBM stack, uh, but uh, yeah, basically composed by a memory array. It can be a bank, it can be a rank, and also some PIM processing elements. And for your reference, the same list of common characteristics is copied here as well. Okay, now we are going to quickly go into the, let me know if you have any questions, by the way, about the first part. Um, if not, we can also uh, uh, talk about, uh, during the coffee break. Yes. Well, um, I, I, we, we, we have only uh, worked directly with the admin pin system, and that's a system that we uh, we can uh, talk about in terms of evaluation, comparison, etc. Uh, whether it's uh, apples to apples, I think uh, we can consider it apples to apples uh, relatively. That's true. Uh, first of all, because um, it's, it's not the same, the PIM system by itself, I mean, the PIM architecture by itself cannot work. It needs a CPU, but you can compare to that host CPU by uh, alone, right, by itself. Um, so um, I, I think in that sense, it's like you compare the, uh, the uh, a host processor by, just by itself or a host processor enhanced with some PIM enabled DIMMs, and that's what we did in our work. That's with respect to the comparison to CPU. Um, with respect to the comparison to GPU, um, I also don't think that it's 100% apples to apples. Why is that? Because um, the, I mean, on the one hand, you can consider both as accelerators that are somehow connected to a host processor, both the GPU and the, and the PIM system. But at the same time, it's true that um, GPUs have much more, um, um, I mean, they, 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 have, they have had much more development effort over many years in terms of hardware, software, and they are also using these days more expensive memories that provide very large bandwidth already. So HBM memories have already been used for the last six, seven years in, in GPUs. And, and in that sense, I don't think it's a fair comparison. But still, I think it's, it's good to compare them and see performance numbers from the different devices in order to have an idea of what's the potential of the PIM system. That's, I think, the main goal of comparing. OK, thank you for the question. OK, yes. Um, I so um I you can see so much uh, industrial level dynamics um here at but but they are all based on VLAN. How about SLAN? So because in ISDP every year the product is focused on SLAN based um uh, 
get a um, cheap, no matter any of our basic computer memory or digital basic computer memory. But um, in your opinion, what what is the factor that hinders that the big the, the giants, um, the, the industrial uh, companies to to develop those the prototype um, method based giants? Yes. Yeah, that's, that's a, actually a very good question. Um, uh, no, we are we are not we are not covering these uh, sort of uh, SRAM-based systems in this tutorial, even though uh, we keep them in mind and and also read papers from ISSCC. I think um, these uh, accelerators are also uh, very interesting ones. I think we can also consider them processing in memory. In fact, I think we can consider them processing using memory because you are computing directly with the um, SRAM cells. But in some sense, uh, one uh, limitation that I see in these uh, in these sort of devices is that they are still pretty small. And because they are small, they cannot keep data for very long time. They cannot keep, uh, you know, like many. Uh, weights from many layers uh, for, uh, for long time. So it's still, you need to have a larger memory that keeps the uh, images and keeps the weights. And from time to time, you move them from this memory to the, to the um, uh, SRAM-based accelerator. So in some sense, uh, even though I think I agree with you, they can also be considered processing in memory. Um, uh, I, I see them more like an like an execution unit or a, an accelerator that could be tightly connected to a processor, but it still needs to go to a larger memory, a DRAM memory to bring data frequently and, and so on. But that doesn't mean, I mean, I'm saying that, but at the same time, I think they are very promising as execution units that can uh, be very fast and energy efficient. Yeah, but uh, yeah, thank you very much for for mentioning them because I, I think they are also uh, very, very interesting and, and maybe we will incorporate them to our lectures as well in the near future. Okay, so uh, if there are no other questions, let me uh, start with how to program a general purpose processing in memory system. We are going to specifically talk about the admin processing in memory system, but I believe that many of the, I mean, a lot of the um, experience that we are, we can gain and we keep gaining uh, on the, on programming the admin pin system can be applicable to other processing in memory systems as well. The admin pin system follows what we call the accelerator model where admin deans coexist with conventional deans and, um, and, and the admin deans can be seen as a loosely coupled accelerator. What this means is that we need to explicitly move data between the main memory and the PIM enabled memory. And we also need to explicitly launch the kernel, the function that is going to run on the, on the PIM system, on the PIM course. Um, we, we, we have to do this kernel launch explicitly. In some sense, this resembles GPU computing, right? Where you need to first move the data from the CPU memory to GPU memory, then you compute on the GPU, and finally you return the results to the, um, uh, to the um, memory of the CPU. So, uh, and, and, and that's um, in some sense as well uh, expressed by the, or, or, or shown in the patent from AppMem. First of all, the uh, system on a chip or the central processor, the CPU needs to load data to be processed on the DRAM memory banks, on the AppMem uh, MRAM banks. Remember that that was the name. Uh, th then uh, the CPU transmits a, uh, processing command launches the kernel, which is basically launching the kernel that is going to run on the DPUs. And then the computation happens in these DPUs near the uh, memory banks. At the same time, or during that time, the processor, the, C the central processor, the CPU keeps checking um, uh, whether the computation has finished. And at that point, when the computation finishes on the memory side, then the banks become accessible again to the CPU. Remember that this is the, oh, sorry. Okay, so remember that this is the uh, system organization with the system on a chip and then the different uh, chips connected to them. 
For the first programming example, we are going to talk about vector addition. In this uh, presentation and also in our, in, in our papers, you will see some of these boxes with different colors that represent programming recommendations, observations, and takeaways. I just put this here for you to don't uh, not get too distracted if you see that the numbers don't follow a regular order, but that's the uh, order that they follow uh, in, in our paper. So, well, the vector addition or first programming example. In vector addition, the only thing that we are doing is the element-wise addition of the elements in, in two vectors, right? So if we have two input vectors, A and B, what we have to do is partitioning them in equally sized chunks and assign of each of these chunks to the different PIM cores or DPUs. And then inside each of the DPUs, we will do the same and assign different chunks to different PIM threads that are called tasklets in by uh, admin. So this is the uh, work that tasklet zero is going to do. This is tasklet one, and this is the same for the um, rest of the DPUs. Uh, um, this is the, uh, well, at the bottom, you can find a link to the AppMem SDK documentation. This is, of course, uh, a very important uh, document uh, if you want to um, learn about how to program this architecture. And also, if you participate in the lab this afternoon, it will be a very good reference to find what's the correct syn syntax for the um, different instructions that we need to use. Some general programming recommendations for a start. Execute on the DPUs portions of parallel code that are as long as possible. This uh, clearly makes sense because if you want to amortize the cost of moving data from the main memory to the beam enabled memory, you need to compute for a while in the memory side, in the DPUs. That's something that is normal uh, whenever you need to transfer data to an accelerator and it happens in GPUs as well. The second general programming recommendation is to split the workload into independent blocks so that the DPUs can operate independently. If that's not the case, then the DPUs will need to access data allocated in other NRAM banks, and that will require to access the data through the host processor, which is not going to be good for performance if it happens too frequently. Um, the third, as you could expect, use as many working DPUs as possible, as many as you can um, in the system in order to maximize parallelism. And the last recommendation is to launch at least 11 tasklets or the threads that run on the pin core. And the reason for that is related to the number of pipeline stages, as you may remember. So when we are writing a program for the DPU, the first thing that we have to do is allocating the DPUs. That means creating a set of DPUs that our program is going to use. That's the DPU allocation, reserving those DPUs for or uh, program. And that's uh, something that you will have to do for sure, especially because uh, we will have many people accessing today the server at the same time. And even though the server has more than 2000 DPUs, but we want all of us to have um, you know, or, or a small set of DPUs that we can use. So in principle, you will allocate just a single DPU, maybe up to 64 if you want to experiment with an entire run using the DPU app. As you see, uh, first of all, we need to uh, declare this the DPU set that we will use later in the program, and we say how many DPUs we want uh, in the DPU set. Can we allocate different DPU sets over the course of a program? Yes, of course we can, because we can free a DPU set using DPU free. And an example of that is uh, just for, to give you an example, Niedelman Bunch is an algorithm where we create, uh, well, we calculate elements in a dynamic programming table. We go uh, anti diagonal by anti diagonal, and the number of uh, DPUs that we need, assuming that we have a very large programming table, uh, a dynamic programming table, the number of DPUs that we need for the computation changes over time as the size of the diagonal changes, right? So, one thing we can do is in every iteration, we can free the DPUs and then allocate a new set of DPUs depending on what are the specific needs for the next uh, kernel launch. The next thing to do is to load the DPU binary and we do, we do that using um, DPU load. Observe that the uh, DPU binary will be in some uh, binary file in, 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 in a folder in, in our computer and we use that DPU binary uh, and with this DPU load, what we are doing is 
moving the program itself from the CPU processor to the instruction RAM that each of the DPUs has. Is it possible to launch different kernels onto different DPUs? Yes, that's possible. And it's something that we have to do whenever we want to exploit task level parallelism, or we want, uh, for example, different programs using different DPU sets or different users accessing the same server at the same time. Um, you will also have the chance to practice with these uh, CPU, DPU, and DPU, CPU transfers that are copying the data from the main memory to the PIM enabled memory or vice versa. There are three different types of uh, uh, transfers, serial, parallel, and broadcast, depending on how many uh, NRAM banks are we targeting. Serial transfers, yes, a single DPU, parallel, multiple DPUs at the same time. And with the broadcast transfers, we transfer a single buffer to multiple DPUs. Here you can see the uh, specific syntax for the serial transfers. Um, first of all, I mean, we have uh, DPU copy to, DPU copy from. Observe that we need to use this, um, uh, um, uh, uh, this uh, symbolic name that represents the start of the MRAM range that we can uh, use, the start of the uh, MRAM memory that we can use, the offset within, between, uh, be, within the MRAM where we are copying where we are putting the data uh, pointers to the main memory. In this case, we are transferring two buffers, right? One, one is called buffer A, the other one is buffer B. They reside in main memory. And what we are doing is using those pointers to copy the specific uh, region from the main memory to the PIM enabled memory, to the uh, MRAM, the specific MRAM, and then what's the transfer size or the, or the size of the buffer that we are transferring. For the parallel transfers, the syntax is different. First of all, we have to prepare the transfer and then push it, that is executing it. And we also have to say what's the direction. It's different from the serial transfers where we have DPU copy to and copy from. Here we use this uh, direction inside the, sorry, inside the, um, uh, in the, in the, actually when we push, when we execute, you see, in this case it's to the DPU. But again, we need to use pointers to the main memory, offsets, and transfer size, uh, same as in the uh, serial transfers. And for the broadcast transfers, uh, syntax is um, um, slightly simpler. As you can see, there is a pointer to, to main memory, and there is a transfer size. Observe that in parallel and in serial transfers, uh, sorry, in, in parallel and in broadcast transfers, we need to indicate as well what's the DPU set. That is the set of DPUs that we have previously allocated. So we can have different types of uh, transfers in a program and we will have to do it for sure whenever we cannot use parallel transfers. This is just an example, a select operator where we partition the input uh, over the different DPUs and then because uh, in the select operator, same as in a string compaction, we are filtering out some elements and that depends on the values of the uh, input, the size of the transfers for the output might differ. And if the size of the transfers differs, then we cannot use parallel transfers. That's a limitation of the current SDK. We cannot have parallel transfers of buffers of different size. They need to be all the same size. So in those cases, we need to use serial transfers. And the understanding these transfers well is really important because uh, there is that's the way of performing deep uh, in we want to copy from here. We'll have to first copy to the main memory and then move it from the main memory to the other MRAM bank. Um, in our work, we have experimented with uh, different computation patterns like merging of partial results or redistribution of intermediate results. How fast are these data transfers? We did uh, some experiments. I'm going to very, well, I, I will fly over these slides, but basically, as you can imagine, uh, these transfers are exposing the uh, the data movement bottleneck in the end, right? Because we are using the memory bus, we are using the uh, DDR4 interface. So the maximum bandwidth that you can theoretically achieve is given by the maximum theoretical bandwidth of uh, DDR4. Uh, but yeah, in, uh, here in the slides, you can see some of the 
uh, measurements, uh, bandwidth measurements that we did for a single uh, MRAM bank and also for uh, multiple MRAM banks inside the same bank. You can see how for the parallel transfers, as we could expect, as we increase the number of GPUs that we are targeting in the parallel transfer, the overall bandwidth also increases. It's a sublinear increase. That's a, a, a small issue, but um, it's still, uh, it's fine. Broadcast transfers are usually much faster because we are using a single buffer, so it has better temporal locality in the CPU cache hierarchy. And that's why you can see that it almost reaches the uh, maximum bandwidth of uh, DDR4. So it's not that bad. One reason for the parallel transfers uh, and the serial, I mean, for the parallel transfers, is especially uh, not being so fast, is first of all, they don't enjoy so much temporal locality in the CPU cache hierarchy, but also it's because it's necessary to transpose the data uh, before performing the copy. Um, as you know, uh, you be one that work in the if you that that's to be a entire world. And in order to do so, it's first necessary to transpose uh, the, the data. And that's something that the runtime library does. Well, this is a link to a micro benchmark um, that we use to measure the uh, CPU, DPU, and DPU CPU transfers. Now, let me uh, very quickly go on to how to uh, launch a DPU kernel. It's pretty simple. Remember that we first allocated the DPUs. We then loaded the binary onto the instruction RAM in each of the DPUs. And now we have to launch the kernel to basically start the execution. And to do so, we do this um, DPU launch. We are launching the kernel that was previously loaded onto this DPU set that you can see here that you allocated as well. It's possible to do this kernel launch synchronously or asynchronously, depending on, depending on whether you want the CPU to just stop and wait until the uh, DPUs finish, or you want, sorry, or you want the CPU, okay, or you want the CPU to continue running and then, <clears throat> um, what's wrong here? Okay, and or you want this, the, the CPU running and then, um, let me share in the screen right now. No, we should take a break. Should take a break. Yeah, we should take a break, but, uh, okay. Yeah, but uh, I, I'm actually very close to the part that I wanted to cover. So if you give me just uh, five more minutes, I'll be done. So yeah, well, this um, asynchronous execution can uh, enable concurrent execution, task level parallelism as well, but that's not so important right now. This slide uh, that uh, you can check in more detail later is how to load input parameters, how to, uh, how to send the uh, input arguments, uh, those arguments to the function to the DPUs. As you can observe, we can do it same as we do for you know, input uh, arrays, uh, input buffers using DPU copy to or using this DPU prepare and DPU push. So both serial and parallel transfers. The key difference is that here we are moving the data directly onto the WRAM, the, the, the scratchpad memory in each DPU. There is where we are going to place the um, input arguments. Um, yeah, recall the uh, we were talking about vector addition. This is the kernel of the vector addition. First of all, the tasklet ID, which is a, a thread uh, identifier. Basically, we are using here a single program, multiple data uh, programming model. Uh, so uh, we write code for an individual thread, for an individual tasklet. This thread um, can access data from MRAM. Uh, we calculate the exact address. Uh, we are not explicitly using pointers here, but we are calculating the addresses. This is the base address of one of the input arrays, the base address of the other array, and we calculate those addresses uh, starting from the MRAM hip pointer, which is where the MRAM area that is available to the thread, to the threads um, uh, starts. 
And this is how we allocate um, uh, memory, uh, how we allocate a space in WRAM using this memalloc. And this uh, outer loop is basically uh, distributing iterations of, in this case, the vector addition over the multiple tasklets or several tasklets that are running. Each of the tasklets first need to read from NRAM, which is basically reading a chunk of the buffer from the NRAM and putting it into WRAM. Uh, then we perform a vector addition. We are going to see the exact code in the next slide. And after we are done with each chunk of the data, we write to the NRAM, right? From the cache in the WRAM to the whatever uh, address uh, in NRAM that we calculated earlier. And this is the uh, yeah, vector addition code. As you see, it's very simple code, just a vector addition that is uh, executed by each of the individual tasks. In order uh, for me just to finish, uh, also tell you that there are synchronization primitives. Uh, these synchronization primitives can be used to be to synchronize different tasklets running on the uh, same DPU. We have mutexes, handshakes, barriers, and semaphores. Uh, you will have, uh, I mean, in the lab, we are going to cover mutexes, handshakes, and, and barriers, and we can use them, for example, for a parallel reduction. Uh, in a parallel reduction, what we normally do is that we partition the input array uh, over uh, uh, across the multiple threads, in this case, tasklets. Each of them computes its local sum, and in the end, we will have to do the final reduction step. The final reduction can be done by a single thread after we synchronize using this barrier, and then we just need the one single tasklet, in this case, tasklet zero, that performs the final reduction. And um, and we could also implement a, a, a tree-based reduction, right? Because we are using a, a, a parallel processor. So uh, we could do something uh, like this using, uh, for example, um, a barrier-based implementation where after you know each iteration we synchronize and then half of the threads or the tasklets retire and half of them continue the execution and perform the rest of the reduction. As I said, uh, yeah, we can implement these also using handshakes. We can we could do mutexes, and this is indeed one of the uh, parts of the lab if you uh, manage to to reach to it. And about parallel reduction, which is a uh, important primitive, of course, not only for this uh, uh, AppMem architecture, but for any uh, parallel architecture as uh, as GPUs as well. Uh, you can check this uh, lecture if you are interested in. Okay, so I'm going to stop here. Uh, the, I have a bunch more of slides uh, in this presentation, but I will upload them to the website in order that you can um, uh, check them for more details about the architecture or the micro benchmark based analysis that we did, and also all the workload characterization. Uh, that's not the you know, main uh, um, uh, goal of this uh, tutorial. It's more oriented on uh, learning about the real architectures and also about how to program them. But uh, here in this presentation, you can find many links to many other resources. So thank you so much for uh, your attention. I'm sorry that I, I stole half of your coffee break, uh, but, uh, but yeah, I hope you found it interesting. If you have any questions, please uh, ask now or, or during the break or, or, or right after the break. One question, what kind of debugging uh, I think, well, you, you, you can, uh, I, there is a debugger. I haven't used it myself because I'm, I don't like debuggers much, uh, but, but yeah, you can use a debugger. I think it allows you to do a step, uh, step by step execution. Uh, and then you also do printf, um, inside the, inside the kernel and, and that's, um, yeah, I, it's pretty, pretty yeah, it's pretty much the same as in a CPU or a GPU, so, yeah. In, in overall, I think it's uh, pretty easy as, as, as soon as you get a little bit of experience, it's pretty easy to program uh, this architecture. I would say it's, it's easier than programming a GPU with CUDA because here we don't need to worry about uh, warps and, and, you know, like, um, avoiding warp divergence, for example, where each of the threads works uh, independently and 
you may have some issues with synchronization at some point with handshakes, for example, but other than that, I think it's uh, pretty easy. Yeah. Oh, just one last question. I think I, I should probably interrupt because I don't want people to miss coffee. I don't know how strict they are. <laughs> so if you want to get coffee, yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Some conferences are uh, a bit strict in how they handle coffee and food. <laughs> I don't know how it has been, but you can you can have it offline or uh, next time. Uh, sure, we can. We can go together. Thank you very much. <laughs> Is that normal Yeah, let me stop sharing. Okay. Uh, but I'm going to stop the live stream for some time. Yeah, I think that's fine. Yeah. yeah. But we should probably start the next. Okay, great. So in this work, we will say uh, we, we we provide two key contributions. Yes, yes, you on the panel as well. Uh, let me see. You go to the right mode. I don't need to be in This is something we automatically should do, but. This one. No, no. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, so in this work, we provide two key contributions. First, uh, we designed the first open source sparse matrix vector multiplication library, which is a software package for real core processing memory systems, and it's open source available on GitHub. And also, we provide a very comprehensive uh, characterization analysis of the uh, sparse matrix vector multiplication kernel on the first commercially available processing memory architecture. So let's start with uh, the motivation of this work. Sparse matrix vector multiplication or SPMV is a very fundamental linear algebra kernel and lies at the heart of many important applications from the scientific computing, machine learning and graph processing and graph analytics domains. In commodity systems like CPUs and GPUs, it has been repeatedly reported to achieve only a small fraction of the available peak performance of the system and is primarily bottlenecked by the memory bandwidth of the system, the available memory bandwidth of the system. At the same time, several manufacturers have already started to commercialize processing memory architectures, processing memory systems, or PIM systems. A PIM system consists of multiple PIM-enabled memory modules that are connected to a host CPU via common channel-based connections. And typically, it also has a, a, the, the common uh, DRAM, DRAM memory modules. Okay. Yeah, and so each, uh, each PIM enabled memory module supports uh, several processing memory cores, and each PIM core uh, is located close to a DRAM band. Okay, so each PIM core is located very close to a DRAM band, and uh, so it can only access the data that are placed and they are located uh, to the local DRAM band. As a result, these real PIM systems can provide high levels of execution parallelism, low memory access 
uh, access latency cost, a very large aggregate memory bandwidth uh, because its PIM core has a, a local available memory bandwidth for the for the local DRAM band. So uh, in total, we have very large uh, aggregate memory bandwidth in the system. And a few uh, uh, near bank processing memory architectures are Samsung's PM DRAM, SK Zynix AM, and the AppMem PIM system. In this work, we make two, two gigabit contributions. We design Sparse P, which is an open source library uh, to efficiently execute the SPMV problem in a current and future real world PIM architectures. It includes 25 SPMV kernels, a wide variety of compressed matrix uh, storage formats, data types, uh, data partition techniques, and various load balancing and synchronization schemes. And with this approach, we can cover a very wide variety of real world applications. And second, uh, we conduct a comprehensive study of the popular SPMV kernel on the first commercially available real PIM system, the AppMem system. We have experimented with 26 uh, sparse matrices with diverse access patterns, uh, sparsity patterns. And our analysis provides uh, many recommendations for software system and hardware designers. So let's first take a look on the SPMV kernels that we support in the, the sparse P library. The end-to-end -end SPMV execution on a PIM system can be broken down in four steps. First, the time to load the input vector from the main memory to the PIM enabled memory modules. Second, the time to execute the SPMV kernel, the computation of the SPMV kernel using the processing memory cores. Third, the time to retrieve uh, results, partial results from the PIM enabled memory modules back to the host CPU. And finally, the time to merge the partial results in order to assemble the final output vector using the host CPU cores in, in the host part. So in our analysis, uh, we also consider the, the time to load the input vector to the PIM enabled memory modules. However, future system might uh, have the PIM enabled memory modules to be the main memory of the system. So this step can be omitted in the future. And our kernels also apply uh, to, to a new architecture that uh, does not uh, need to have this load, uh, load step uh, in the execution pipeline, the execution path. To parallelize the SPMV kernel, we have uh, we support two, two types of data partition techniques, and one, uh, one partition technique and a two partition technique. Uh, in the first uh, technique, the one partitioning, the matrix is horizontally partitioned across the PIM cores, and the whole input vector is copied at each DRAM bank uh, of all of all the PIM cores at each at each bank of the PIM enabled memory modules. And with this approach, the whole computation is performed only using the processing memory cores because the PIM cores directly produce the final elements for the output vector. vector. So we directly get the, the final output vector. And second, we have uh, also a 2D partition technique where the matrix is partitioned in two details. The number of tiles is equal to the number of processing memory cores used. In the 2D uh, partition technique, uh, the, the, the subset of the elements of the input vector is, uh, is replicated at the, the DRAM banks of the PIM enabled memory modules. However, the PIM cores produce partial results for the output vector. They do not produce the final elements for the, uh, for the output vector. And these partial results need to be, uh, uh, we need to transfer them back to the host CPU and merge them, uh, merge the partial results in order to assemble the final output vector on the host CPU part. So with this technique, we aim to trade off the computation with the data transfer cost because we have a lower data transfer cost for the input and the output vector. Uh, however, we have more computation because uh, the PIM cores produce partial results. So we need also to do some cal calculation and some computations on the host CPU with the host uh, CPU cores. In the one partition technique, we provide various load balancing schemes across multiple PIM cores for the four most widely used compressed matrix storage format for the CSR, CU, BCSR, and BQ formats. For the CSR and the CU formats, 
uh, we, 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 we can also uh, load balance the number of uh, non-zero elements across the PIM pores. Uh, in, in the CSR format, we can load balance the number of non-zero elements at a row granularity because, uh, because the, the matrix is stored at a row granularity. So the load balancing of the partition across uh, PIM pores needs to be performed in the row, row granularity. However, in the Q format, uh, the matrix is compressed, in, it is stored in a non-zero element granularity. So this means that the partitioning and the splitting uh, is performed at a non-zero granularity and one row can be split across two different pin cores. And similarly for the BCSR format, the BCSR format is stored in block row granularity. So uh, we, we, we do the splitting and the partition at the block row granularity. However, the PQ format is partitioned in block granularity, so we can split blocks and uh, block rows across multiple pin cores. In the 2D partition technique, we have two different schemes. Uh, we have experimented and uh, we support two different schemes and for uh, for the uh, sorry for three different schemes and for all these uh, schemes we support all the four compressed matrix format that we saw before uh, including the CSR the Q BCSR and BQ formats in the equally sized uh, scheme the two details that we create in the two partitioning uh, are created in order to have the same height and width in this way, uh, the subset of the elements for the input and the output vector have the same sizes across all PIM cores. So across all PIM cores, we transfer the same data, the same amount of data for the input vector and for the output vector as well. However, because we create static partitions on a sparse matrix, this ma matrix is typically has like very high sparsity, uh, the non-zero elements across the PIM cores have very high variability, so we have very high computation and non-zero element imbalance across the PIM cores. Second, we have the equally wide scheme. Uh, in, in this scheme, the, the two details are created to have the same uh, width and variable height. For each uh, vertical partition of the matrix, uh, we load balance the number of non-zero elements across the PIM cores of the same vertical partition. With this scheme, the subset of the elements for uh, of the uh, for the subset of the elements for the input vectors have the same sizes across all PIM cores. However, the subset for the elements for the output vector have variable size across PIM cores because each PIM core uh, uh, targets a different uh, parts, a different number of uh, for the elements of the output vector. And with this approach, we have a very high non-zero element balance and computation balance across the PIM cores of the same vertical partition. Uh, and we have different balance across uh, the vertical partitions. In the last uh, scheme, we call it va variable size tiles. And we have variable, uh, both variable width and variable height in the 2D tiles. So the, the idea is that uh, we first create uh, vertical partitions of the matrix. Across the vertical partitions, we have the same number of non-zero elements. And then for the same vertical partition, we load balance the number of non-zero elements across the PIM cores of the same vertical partition. In this scheme, uh, we have variable, variable size, sizes for the subset of the elements from, for both the input and the output vectors that we transfer both uh, from, from, from uh, the host to the PIM enabled memory modules and for the output vectors that we need to transfer back to the whole CPU. However, with this approach, we have very high non zero low end element balance, non zero computation balance across all the PIM cores of the system. And uh, we have also, uh, in, in, in our PIM architecture, we support multi thread PIM cores. This means that we have multiple hardware threads for each PIM core. So we have uh, experimented and we support uh, data partitioning approaches uh, across uh, multiple, uh, multiple cores of multiple threads of the same uh, PIM core. So after we do the partition across the PIM cores, we uh, provide load balancing partitioning uh, across the multiple threads of each PIM core. Again, these load balancing schemes uh, depend on the format. If we have a CSR format, the load balancing is limited to be performed at a row granularity. If we have a Q format, the load balancing is limited to is, is performed at a non-zero element granularity. 
And similarly, for the 2D partitioning, again, uh, after we do the splitting for the pin course in 2D tiles, uh, for each 2D tile, we do the, the load balancing across the threads from for, uh, uh, across the multiple threads of the same pin core. And uh, given that uh, these multiple threads uh, have like this, uh, they have a shared memory, all these multiple threads of each PIM core access the local, the same local DRAM bank of the core. Uh, in some formats, we need to use a synchronization approaches to coordinate the accesses uh, for the elements of the output vector. So we support three different synchronization schemes. First, we have a coarse grain approach where we have only one mutex, one global log to protect all the elements of the output vector. This means that uh, even though the multiple threads might work on different elements of the output vector, vector each thread need to, needs to acquire this particular uh, log in order to perform a write to uh, uh, any element of the output vector. Second, we have a fine grain logging scheme. Uh, we have uh, multiple logs for the elements of the output vector. And with this approach, we have a, a round robin uh, scheduling. Uh, its element, uh, its log, its mutex protects a subset of the elements of the output vector with a round robin way. And with this approach, uh, even uh, we have less competition uh, among the threads uh, to the same to the same log to the same mutex. If if the threads are working on very different parts and very different elements uh, for the output vector, they, they might not compete for the same log. And the third uh, synchronization approach is, is a log-free approach. Uh, in this scheme, uh, the multiple threads create partial results for the elements of the output vector. These partial results are temporarily stored in a scratchpad memory, in a data scratchpad mm -hmm. memory. And after we finish the computation, uh, one thread, thread, only one single thread, goes to the scratchpad memory, merges the, the partial results, and writes the final result uh, for the output vector in the local DRAM bank of its core. So overall, uh, considering all of these one d partitioning kernels and the 2D partitioning kernels and all the different uh, formats that we have seen, we support 25 uh, SPMV kernels. All, all of uh, the, the source code is all of, all, all, of, all of the source code is available on GitHub. Uh, we perform load balancing across the PIM course at a row and block row granularity for the CSR and BCSR, uh, while at non-zero element granularity and block uh, granularity for the Q and B formats. And we also have uh, the three synchronization approaches that we use them in the Q and B formats. And uh, of course, all, all of these uh, SPMV kernels uh, are configured to support a wide variety of data types because this SPMV is also used, uh, is, is used also in machine learning where uh, we need like low precision data types. It is also used in HPC. Uh, in, in the HPC context, we need uh, floating point operations. So we also support floats and doubles. And yeah, so next I will briefly uh, describe some main key takeaways of our uh, characterization study. I will take a look at the evaluation. So first, uh, I will briefly describe the, the app mem system that we use in our evaluation. You have already uh, seen the, the, the main architecture of this system. Uh, it has 20 uh, PIM, uh, app mem DIMMs, crossing memory PIM enabled DIMMs that are connected to, to a host CPU via common channel based connections. Uh, in total, uh, we have 2,560 PIM cores. Each PIM core is located close to a DRAM bank, and each PIM core is a multi-threaded core that supports uh, up to 24 threads. We, we call them tasklets. And yeah, inside the, the, the PIM core, uh, there is like a, a four, 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 uh, 14 stage uh, pipeline. There is a small scratch pad memory of 64 kilobytes, the instruction memory of 24 kilobytes. And there is a DMA engine that performs read and write transactions, read and write operations in the local 64 uh, megabyte DRAM bank. In our evaluation, we use 26 uh, sparse matrices with diverse uh, characteristics and access patterns. Uh, 
uh, we we group basically we group the, the matrices in in two main uh, families. Uh, when there is a high uh, deviation, uh, when the standard deviation of the non-zero elements across the row in the columns of the matrix is very low, uh, we 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 use the name uh, regular, so we call the matrix like a regular matrix. When, when there is a very, uh, the standard deviation of the non-zero elements across the rows and the columns of the matrix is very high, the matrix becomes very irregular. It has a power law distribution and we call this matrix as scale free. So first we will examine the, the kernel uh, time. We will only uh, take a look at the second uh, step of the end-to-end -end SPMV execution using one single PIM core. So we'll experiment with multiple threads Using one single pin core, uh, and we will try to see the uh, the characteristics of the SPMV with this uh, uh, with this evaluation with this characterization. So here we uh, use sixteen threads, and we use the Q format, and we compare uh, the uh, two synchronization approaches, the uh, coarse grain and the fine grain synchronization approach, using uh, sixteen threads of one single multi-threaded pin core. We observe that the, the fine grain logging does not improve the performance over the coarse grain logging. They have more or less the same performance, even though in the coarse grain logging, we have one global log for all the elements of the output vector. In the fine grain we have, approach, we have multiple logs to protect the, the fine grain logging, uh, to protect the elements of the output vector. And this is because the, the, the memory accesses to the local DRAM bank are serialized to, to the DMA engine that we have in the uh, hardware. Even though uh, multiple threads might work on different elements of the output vector, they might write uh, different elements of the output vector. These writes are serialized in the DMA engine. They are performed as transactions at the DMA engine. So, so eventually the, the critical sections are serialized so we cannot improve the execution parallels. And this is the, the first uh, key takeaway of uh, this experimentation. We find that the fine grain logging approaches cannot improve the performance of the coarse grain logging approach when the PIM hardware does not support concurrent accesses to the local DRAM bank, because right now this hardware does not support concurrent rights to the, the local to the local same DRAM bank from, from multiple threads. And yeah, that the, the, to this end, we recommend that uh, uh, architects of uh, processing memory systems need to provide uh, low-cost synchronization support and also to support uh, and enable uh, concurrent memory access to the local DRAM bank, or, or also to integrate uh, multiple DRAM banks, like two DRAM banks per PIM core. So in this way, we will increase the execution parallelism whenever two threads work on different uh, DRAM banks, different local DRAM banks. Next, we compare uh, the load balancing uh, schemes, uh, various load balancing schemes, uh, basically load balancing the rows or load balancing the non-zero elements across the multiple threads. Uh, again, we use one uh, PIM core and 16 uh, uh, threads, tasklets. And we experimented with the CSR and the CO formats, which are the, the most popular formats. Mm -hmm. Here we observe that the, the load balancing of the non-zero elements performs better uh, compared to the load balancing of the load balancing the rows across the multiple threads. And this because uh, load balancing the non-zero elements uh, typically provides a higher computation balance, balance which means that the, the threads and the tasklet more or less perform the same number of computations. So we have computation balance in the pipeline of the PIM4 and we achieve better performance. Uh, however, we observe that uh, only in one matrix uh, the the, the uh, load balancing the number of row, rows across the multiple threads achieves a better performance compared to load balancing the number of non-zero elements across the threads of uh, PIM4. And this is because for this particular matrix, only one single thread, in, 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 whenever, we, uh, whenever we load balance uh, the number of non-zero elements, only one single thread performs a much larger number of uh, memory accesses for the rows. Only one single thread needs to process a much larger number of rows compared to all the remaining rows. So we have a very high variability of the memory accesses that uh, are performed across the threads of the same uh, PIM core. And this causes some performance overheads. So this is why the, 
the raw load balancing performs better compared to the non-zero element uh, load balancing. So uh, our main key takeaway is that we need to provide uh, load balance in the uh, across the multiple threads of the same beam core, and this load balance needs to to be uh, performed uh, in computation, in synchronization, and in also also in memory accesses in order to achieve high performance. Otherwise, if we have very high operation balance, uh, we have high performance overheads. So we uh, we recommend uh, and we suggest the programmers to provide intelligent uh, data partitioning uh, algorithms and load balancing schemes in order to provide a uh, high load balance across the PIM cores in terms of computation, synchronization, and also in terms of uh, memory access. And uh, the last part of, uh, uh, of this analysis includes the scalability plot. So here we increase the number of threads uh, for different sparse matrices and different sparse matrix uh, format, formats and various matrices. And we find that uh, uh, you have also seen uh, in previous pre presentations, even though the processing memory core can support up to 24 threads, the scalability uh, improves up to 16 threads. And we cannot provide a better performance up to um, if we, we increase the number of threads more than 16. And this because of the for, for 14 states uh, pipeline that we have in the processing memory core. The pipeline is almost full, uh, is fully occupied. We don't have any bubbles and stalls with uh, 16 threads. So uh, yeah, increasing the, the number of threads more than to, more than this number does not improve the performance. Next, uh, we will examine again the, ex uh, the, the execution uh, time for, for only the kernel time, for only the second step. But this time, we will take a look uh, at the kernel uh, using multiple PIM cores. Until now, we have only seen one PIM core and multiple threads. Right now, we will, uh, we will do a characterization and analysis using multiple PIM cores. In this experiment, we, we compare the four uh, compressed matrix storage formats by normalizing the performance to the CSR format, which is the most popular format. And we find that in the 1D partition kernels, uh, in, in scale-free matrices, in matrices that have very, very high power load distribution, the Q and the PQ formats provide a much better performance and significantly outperform the CSR and the BCSR formats uh, respectively. And this is because uh, the Q uh, and the PQ formats can provide better non-zero element balance across the PIM cores compared to the CSR and the BCSR formats. As we have explained, the CSR and the BCSR formats are limited to do the load balancing at a row and block row granularity because we store the matrix in a row and block row granularity. So this limits the, the partitioning and the load balancing that we can perform uh, across the multiple PIM cores. And similarly, in the 2D uh, equally sized kernels, uh, even though all the compressed matrix uh, storage format have the same non-zero element balance across the PIM cores, because we have static partitions on the sparse matrix, so in all formats we have the same uh, non-zero element balance, we find that uh, within uh, the PIM core, up across the multiple threads of the same PIM core, the load balancing, again, uh, it depends on the format that we, we use. And in the Q and the big formats, we find that uh, we have better performance uh, in scale-free matrices compared to the CSR and BCSR formats. And this is because we have a much higher non-zero element balance across the threads of the same processing memory uh, core. And uh, finally, if we compare the, the 2D equally wide and 2D variable sized uh, tiles, we find that uh, in both the regular and the scale-free matrices across all matrices, the Q and BQ formats provide much better performance compared to the CSR and BCSR formats respectively. And this because they can provide much higher non-zero element balance, both across the PIM cores and also across the threads of the same PIM core. Thus, our main key takeaway from this analysis is that the compressed matrix storage format that we use to store the input matrix determines the data partitioning that we, we do across the, the DRAM banks. And this data partitioning across the DRAM banks 
uh, uh, determines the non-zero element imbalance, the load imbalance that we have across the PIM course, and uh, it affects the computation, the computation imbalance across the PIM course, and has uh, the corresponding performance implications. Therefore, uh, in contrast to the common CPU uh, uh, architectures, uh, here we need to select uh, in typical CPU architecture the CSR. Uh, format is the most popular and provides a better performance. But here we have seen that the GU format provides a be better performance compared to the CSR format, because uh, we have seen that the uh, the format uh, uh, determines the, the non-zero element balance and the partitioning that we do across the DRAM banks. So overall, we uh, recommend and we suggest uh, software designers to propose uh, compressed uh, data structures for sparse uh, kernels that can be effectively partitioned across the DRAM banks with the goal of providing high computation balance across the PIM course. So we basically uh, need to give more importance on the computation balance and less importance on the uh, compression because uh, we don't care so much about the, the memory footprint. We care more that more uh, for the computation balance in this architecture. So next, we will uh, see some uh, studies and some characterization uh, results, taking into consideration the end-to-end -end SPMV execution, meaning that we also uh, consider the time to load the input vector to the PIM-enabled memory modules, and also the time to retrieve the partial results of the host CPU and merge them on the host CPU uh, course. So we we'll look at the end-to-end -end characterization analysis. Uh, here we evaluate the scalability of uh, different partition techniques as the number of PIM cores increases, and we normalize the performance to that achieved with uh, 256 uh, PIM cores. Uh, first, we find that the scalability of the one departition technique is limited by the low data transfers for the input vector. In the one partition technique, the input vector needs to be replicated at each DRAM uh, core. So we replicate the whole input vector at each DRAM bank across all the, the PIM enabled memory modules. And as a result, we tra transfer a very large amount of data from the host CPU to the PIM enabled memory module. So we are limited by the memory bus bandwidth. And as a result, uh, uh, the, this, uh, this has like a low scalability and has very high performance over it. So the key takeaway is that the one departition kernels are bottlenecked by the high data transfers to broadcast the input vector, the input data across all the DRAM banks of all the PIM cores of the system through the narrow um, of chip memory bus. And uh, we propose and we suggest hardware designers to uh, give uh, the, the programmers are very efficient broadcast collective, so we need to enable a, a broadcast operation in order to effectively uh, do data transfers from the host CPU to the PIM enabled memory modules for the input uh, data uh, that we need to, to use in, in the, the real world applications. In the equally side uh, scheme, we find that the, the, the performance and the scalability is limited by the kernel time. Specifically, uh, the kernel time is limited by the PIM core or only a few PIM cores that are assigned to the 2D tile uh, with the largest number of non-zero elements. In this scheme, we have static 2D tiles, static partitions. So uh, the, the partitioning, the starting partition with the largest number of non-zero elements non-zero elements limits the scalability because there is a very high uh, there are there is a very high of uh, high a large number of computations that only one pin core needs to perform or only one or only a few pin cores need, need to perform and this affects the, the scalability and the total execution time mm -hmm. And uh, lastly, for the equally wide and the variable sized uh, schemes, we find that the scalability is uh, uh, limited by the retrieve time. Uh, the, retrieve, the retrieve time is uh, associated uh, with the time to transfer partial results from the PIM enabled memory modules back to the host CPU. And uh, with these uh, two schemes, the 2D equally wide and 2D variable sized scheme, uh, we find that uh, there is a very high amount of padding that we need to perform in order to gather the results for the output vector, because the data transfers from the PIM enabled memory modules to the host CPU have to have the same. They, they need to have the same sizes 
of the, the same amount of data across all the pin ports of the system. So we, we perform some padding in these operations with zero with empty bytes. And this padding is uh, more or less 80% of the data that we transfer from the host view, uh, from the pin enabled memory modules to the host view. So there is a very high amount of zero padding that significantly limits the scalability. And the key takeaway is that the 2D quality white and 2D variable sized uh, partition schemes uh, require fine grained data transfers at DRAM bank granularity. If we have data transfers at DRAM bank granularity, we have zero padding. And if the system supports this fine grained data trans transfers, we might achieve a higher performance. And as a result, uh, we suggest uh, hardware system designers to optimize the gather collective. They need to provide the programmer a gather collective that supports variable sized data transfers. So we can perform data transfers at DRAM bank granularity from PIM enabled memory to the host CPU in order to effectively retrieve the results out to results on the host CPU part. In these experiments, we have uh, experimented with the best end-to-end -end, uh, performance of various sparse matrices. For example, in the one, the partitioning for the Hugetric and LTOR matrices, and the best end-to-end -end performance, we find that it's achieved using 64 PIM cores or 128 PIM cores. In other words, even though the system supports 2,560 PIM cores, the best end-to-end -end performance is achieved using a much uh, smaller number of, uh, of the PIM cores than the available PIM cores of the system. And we also, we also find that uh, the best performance depends on the sparsity pattern of the matrix. In the one matrix, we have seen that we use 64 PIM cores. In the other uh, case, we, we use 128 PIM cores to achieve the best performance. And similarly, we have also seen a similar characteristic in the 2D partitioning. Uh, here, we find that uh, based on the sparsity pattern of the matrix, we uh, configure uh, the 2D partition to have either 16 or 8 vertical partitions in order to achieve and uh, get the best end-to-end -end SPMV performance. So we find that uh, the in the 2D case in the 2D partition the the vertical the number of vertical partitions that provide uh, provides the best end-to-end -end SPMV performance depends on the sparsity uh, matrix uh, the part, sparsity pattern of the matrix. And if we change the system uh, here, we have experimented with a second upmem uh, up based system, and we find that, that depending on the, the 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 architecture, some architectural characteristics, uh, the number of uh, vertical partitions that gives us the best uh, performance varies across uh, different architectures, uh, different beam systems. So we conclude basically that the best end-to-end -end SPMV performance depends also on the hardware characteristics. And this uh, gives us the, the six key takeaway of uh, our analysis. We find and we conclude that there is no one size fits all implementation for and parallelization approach for the SPMV uh, perform for the SPMV kernels. And because the, the performance of uh, each parallelization scheme depends both on the characteristics of the input matrix, both on the patterns, the memory access, and the sparsity patterns, patterns of the matrix, and also it depends on the PIM hardware, the characteristics of the underlying PIM, PIM hardware. So as uh, the next step is that uh, software designers uh, need to employ adaptive approaches, adaptive algorithms that uh, based on, uh, they, they need to tune the configuration and the parallelization scheme based on the particular patterns of each input given and also the characteristics of the, the PIM hardware. And finally, here we compare the, the all the data partition techniques and we run different configurations for each different data partition technique. For the 1D kernels, uh, we vary the number of PIM cores from 64 to 2,528 PIM cores. And for each matrix, we select the best performing end-to-end -end execution th throughput. For the 2D partitioning, we use 2,500 PIM cores. And uh, we vary the number of vertical partitions on the matrix from two up to 32 partitions. And for each matrix, we select the best performing SPMV execution throw. 
So here we find that the equally sized 2D partition technique performs best uh, in regular matrices, uh, while uh, we find that the uh, in, in regular matrices, while we find that the 1D partition technique performs best in scale-free matrices. However, with both the 2D uh, equally wide technique and also the 1D partition technique, we find that uh, uh, the best end-to-end -end SPMV performance is achieved using a much smaller number of pin cores than the available pin cores of the system. There are many idle pin cores on the system because the best performing SPMV is a trade-off between computation and data transfers. So we find uh, that the expensive data transfers to and from a PIM, the PIM enabled memory modules through the narrow memory bus uh, uh, introduce and impose significant performance overheads to the end-to-end -end SPMV execution. And we cannot, it's very hard, we cannot uh, exploit all the available PIM cores of the system. To this end, we recommend uh, software, uh, hardware, and system designers to provide high-speed communication channels to transfer uh, data to and from the PIM-enabled memory modules, to provide uh, support to overlap the computation with the data transfers in order to hide the latency, and also to integrate the PIM-enabled memory as the main memory of the system, because with this approach, we will uh, completely eliminate the time to load input data from the host to the PIM enabled memory modules. Directly, we can just allocate the data to the PIM enabled memory module. Lastly, I will show some, uh, 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 some uh, characterization results that we got when that we have whenever we compare the SPMV execution on the AppMem system with that of a common CPU system and a common GPU system. In the GPU system, for a fair comp comparison, we also account for the time to load the input vector from the main memory to the GPU global memory. And after we execute the SPMV kernel, we also account for the time to transfer the final app to vector from the GPU global memory back to the whole CPU. The common CPU and GPU systems are processor-centric systems. And as you see in the, this table, they, their characteristics, they, they have very high computation capability. They, have, they can provide very high uh, peak performance. While, uh, the common, uh, while the processing memory systems are memory-centric systems, they have low computation capabilities, low peak performance, but they have a very large uh, bandwidth. They can provide a very la large uh, memory bandwidth. So when we compare the same workload in these two different types of uh, systems, uh, without accounting for the data transfers, here we only saw the kernel time, the actual kernel time, and we find that uh, the uh, SPMV execution on the PIM system achieves a much higher, uh, a much higher fraction of the available peak performance compared to that of the CPU and the GPU systems. This means that we have much higher uh, resource utilization, computation utilization. We utilize the PIM cores uh, uh, much better, and we have a higher total cost of ownership. So we uh, mi minimize and decrease the, the financial and the monetary costs if if we use this, this, uh, this hardware because the, the software fits better with this particular hardware. And if we compare the end-to-end -end SPMV execution, we find that the CPU achieves the best performance and this is because the CPU is the system that does not have data transfers. We don't need to transfer data from and back to the memory. Uh, uh, yeah, so this achieves the much higher, much higher performance uh, benefits. And regarding the energy, we are able to measure the energy only using uh, the kernel uh, only in the, in the kernel step, uh, step whenever we execute the, the SPMV kernel on the CPU, the GPU, and the PIM system. We find that the, and, and the highest energy efficiency is achieved uh, using the GPU system. However, we find that the PIM system is much uh, more higher effi energy efficient over the CPU system. So there is like a very high potential to provide high energy efficiency with uh, the SPMV kernel using the, the AppMem system. Uh, please refer to our paper for many more results. We have a very extensive characterization uh, analysis in our archive version. In conclusion, uh, the SPMV kernel, the sparse matrix vector multiplication kernel, is a fundamental linear algebra kernel for many applications and many uh, real-world domains. 
In commodity uh, processor-centric systems like CPUs and GPUs, this particular kernel is bottlenecked by the uh, data transfers and the data movement between the processor and the memory. Real near bank PIM systems can tackle the data movement problem by placing low power cores very close to, uh, to the DRAM banks, very close to where the application data resides. And these PIM systems can provide high levels of parallelism, large aggregate memory bandwidth, thereby they are a very good fit to accelerate the SPMV kernel. To this end, we have designed uh, SparseP, which is the first open source SPMV library for real processing memory architectures, and it's also available on GitHub. And we have also uh, provided a very comprehensive characterization study and analysis of this SPMV kernel on the first real world processing memory system, the AppMem system. Our work provides uh, new insights and recommendations for software designers and hardware architects in order to improve multiple aspects of future PIM systems, uh, future PIM software and PIM hardware. For more details on our work, please uh, refer to our full archive paper. Thank you so much for your attention and I'm very happy to take uh, questions. Yeah, that's a that's a great great question. Uh, in the in the current system that we use in the app mem, there is no support to do uh, internal data transfers from the one DRAM bank to the other DRAM bank. You need to go over the host to do the kind of transfers. But there are like uh, many research uh, papers from the the Safari research group that and they 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 they, they, they like provide the hardware to to support these data transfers internal within within the run. Uh, yeah, we expect that uh, if they commercialize soon, we will enable, uh, we will further reduce uh, this cost, uh, which is like an important cost. Okay. Sure. Um, yeah. So you mentioned, um, it seemed like one of the problems you had was transferring data from the host CPU and host memory to the, the GPUs. Um, and I'm wondering if that could be set up if you had. Uh, closer connection between the host CPU and the host memory and the, the GPUs and the GPU memory. And so I was thinking about um, thinking this talk earlier, and I thought about having the, the host CPU and then a DRAM chip and then some smaller GPUs on top that all communicate through the same memory mm -hmm. to try to reduce the, uh, the, the memory latency and increase the bandwidth. Do you think that would help? With, uh, but still, still, you need to go over the the memory pass, right? Yeah, but it, it would be closer together. So, sandwich, you know, so, so the, the the memory bandwidth is is the same, right? Because the the limitation here is like uh, we are bottlenecked by the memory bus bandwidth. So, if if the memory bus bandwidth is larger, uh, this will mitigate the the data transfer cost with the design that you mentioned. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the, it, the, the floating point operations are emulated. There is no support uh, in this admin system. Uh, however, there are other uh, PIM systems that do support uh, floating point operations, not this admin system. Uh, uh, regarding the open source, uh, I, I don't think that they, they have open source library for the, the, the software emulations they, they are doing. Uh, yeah, uh, basically we use the, the most popular ones. The four most popular runs, CSR, BCSR, uh, BICU, and PU. Uh, yeah, I guess it, it, it worth to, to give a try uh, in other sparse uh, matrix re representations. Uh, as I said, the most important is to represent, not to compress the matrix. The most important key takeaway is not to, to compress enough the matrix. The most important key takeaway is like to do a compression 
in a non-zero element granularity because the compression affects the data partitioning across the different bounds. So we need to compress it in a non-zero element granularity in order to do a data partition in a non-zero element granularity in order to have computation balance across the PIM force. That, that's the most important. So this like them, the main take takeaway that uh, will direct them which format that we, we, we need to choose. Uh, yeah, we basically experimented with these uh, formats because they are uh, generic formats. There are like some formats like DIA, which are like for diagonal matrices. And yeah, these are more specialized formats. But yeah, for sure, it's interesting. So are you doing the host or is the Yeah, that's right. Uh, we are doing that in the host video, yeah. The, the, the partitioning is do, done in the host CPU. We keep some metadata on the partitioning, uh, what, how is the partition across the DRAM, uh, the DRAM banks. And then the API uh, gives us uh, the opportunity to, to do the data transfers for each partition from the host CPU course to the, the local DRAM banks. I think there is also a question on Zoom. Yeah, there is a question. Yeah, Lucas, you, you said, have a question. Yeah, I've got a question. So uh, you said we can, that- We um, cannot hear you, you're muted. Ah. Still? Oh, I think I unmuted myself. You can st still can't hear me? Oh, okay, the, the people on Zoom, I guess, maybe something. Uh, uh. I've got a question. So okay. uh, you said so can you repeat your question now uh can you can you now hear me or okay yeah yeah um so my question was um since you, you said that there are some you experimented already on um communicating between the different memory banks and um, like not always going over the host CPU, which would uh, increase the, the, the speed, which uh, like the, the time, which is not spent in the kernel. And um, I believe the stance of Upmem was that they don't want to do this because they that would kind of ruin their memory hierarchy, how they developed it. Um, so how far is their, the research there? Mm, yeah, I, I agree that this might, uh, this might uh, affect the internal uh, circuitry in DRAM. Uh, but I, I think that it, it should be feasible to, to be done in commercial DIM uh, systems. And there are like a, a few research works that uh, propose a, a, a multiple tire memory hierarchy within the DIM. Okay.
it's right now. But anyway, um, I don't know if um, <clears throat> if it's looking good uh, in Zoom and in um, in YouTube right now. Um, the only thing I wanted to uh, start explaining is uh, what we will briefly cover in about twenty minutes after the after the lunch. Uh, it's uh, it's going to be a brief discussion about uh, processing using memory, uh, mostly in DRAM or basically in DRAM because that's the um, the research that we are mostly doing in, in our group. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's good to go quickly over some of these proposals that were uh, earlier introduced by Professor Mutlu. Uh, remember that uh, we, um, uh, we have uh, already, uh, or we are already distinguishing between two types of PIM approaches. The first one is processing near memory that we Cover in my previous lecture, and the second one is processing using memory. And here in the processing using memory techniques, I think it's um, really interesting to uh, talk a little bit more about what are those uh, proposals re that relate to DRAM. Processing in memory, uh, processing using memory, exploit the analog and operational pr principles of the memory circuitry to perform computation and exploits the uh, internal connectivity to move data and can leverage the large internal bandwidth and parallelism that is available inside memory arrays. Uh, a common approach for processing using memory operations is to perform bulk bitwise operations like AND, OR, XOR, majority, etc. And by using them, it's also possible to um, implement some more complex operations such as multiplication or addition. Um, I have a few slides here introducing how the run works, but I think that this is something that we can skip and very briefly uh, uh, remind you um, the row clone techniques that uh, were uh, proposed back in 2013 in a micro paper uh, that allows us to do data copy and initialization. Um, data copy and initialization are extremely important because they are basically in all applications that we can write. And there has been a lot of uh, past work trying to optimize these different uh, operations. In fact, um, um, a paper from uh, 2015, ISCA 2015 uh, from Google, for example, showed that mem move and mem copy take about 5% of the cycles in Google's data center. So that's in reality a lot. And that's why it really makes sense to optimize this bulk data copy. I think uh, Honor already showed this slide what uh, the problem with bulk data copy these days in computing systems is that you need to do the copy through the host CPU. That means moving cache lines all the way to the L1 and then um, write them back to the memory. And this is uh, high latency, high bandwidth utilization, it causes cache pollution for data that you are not really going to reuse right next, and, uh, and also has a lot of unwanted data movement. So it's costly in terms of the execution time and in terms of um, energy. energy. Uh, in future systems, we, we expect that we will be able to do something as simple as this, moving our row directly from uh, one subarray to another subarray or inside the same memory subarray, and this way save a lot of execution time, a lot of cycles, and, and a lot of energy. And this is the um, uh, basic idea or the key idea in, in row clone, in the row copy. First of all, activate one row, which transfers the row to the row buffer, then open, activate a second row, the destination row, and this way perform the bulk uh, row copy. And this can be done with just two um, consecutive activations at an negligible hardware cost. So, yeah, you can see here with a little bit more detail uh, by focusing us on just the two cells in two different rows, we can see that when we activate one row, one uh, the, the cells in this row start sharing their charge with the bit line, uh, per, pro, producing a perturbation in the bit line that is later amplified when we activate the sense amplifier. And when we finally activate the destination row, uh, the, the value in the sense amplifier gets copied into the new row. And that's a basic idea of this intra subarray row clone or intra subarray row copy. The row clone paper also proposes a way of copying 
uh, entire rows or copying basically cash lines or entire rows, cash line by cash line, uh, copying them from one bank to another bank by using the shared internal bus. And that's uh, what uh, what uh, you can do like uh, more or less like this. And that uh, is still good in terms of latency reduction and energy reduction. And the paper generalizes row clone by also doing not only intra subarray copy, interbank copy, but also you can do inter subarray copy when they are in the same bank. One only, one only problem with this is that the inter subarray copy when it's uh, the, the two subarrays are in the same bank needs to happen through two interbank copies. And that's what makes this operation the slowest one uh, in the generalized row clone. But it's still, and actually that's uh, what uh, you can see here, that there is not really uh, improvement in terms of latency for the inter subarray copy, but uh, still there is some um, improvement in terms of energy. But especially good and especially fast and, and, and energy efficient uh, is the intra subarray copy, as you can see uh, in this plot, with more than 11 times uh, latency savings and more than 74 and, and 74 times energy savings. And row clone can also be used for initialization. You just need to reserve some rows for the values that you want to use to initialize. Like for example, a row of all zeros, that is a sm very small loss in terms of capacity and initialization as well as copy are frequent in, 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 in some frequently used in, in some um, in important applications like the ones on the slide, as you can see, and for those applications, uh, we can see uh, quite interesting end-to-end uh, performance improvements and energy energy reductions. Um, you can check more details in the paper or also in uh, some of uh, owners lectures, like for example, this one. So this is a generalized row copy. And remember what's the biggest issue with it is the inter subarray copy. The inter subarray copy is a problem because you need to do the interbank copy twice. So that's why in uh, HBCA 2016 or group proposed a way of copying data from one subarray to another subarray when they are in the same bank. And the key idea was placing isolation transistors that connect bit lines in two consecutive subarrays. And by activating these isolation transistors, whenever you want to perform the copy, it's possible to move one entire row from subarray one to subarray two or vice versa. And this uh, allows uh, uh, false, uh, fast book uh, data copy from subarray to subarray, as well as uh, other interesting applications as well. So that's the LISA paper, as I said, from HPCA 2000, 2016. And, 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 and a few years later, we published this uh, Figaro work that enables to, uh, allows us to do something similar, but at a much fine uh, grain uh, granularity by making use of the uh, global row buffers and by, by making use of the uh, global bus that connects uh, different subarrays inside the um, same, uh, inside the same bank. Uh, later work on uh, these kind of proposals are the in-memory uh, bulk bitwise operations and the ambit work that also Honor introduced uh, in the morning. Uh, the key idea in the ambit work is to activate three rows at the same time, assuming that we can do that in our real chip. Uh, it would be, uh, if, if it's possible to activate three rows at the same time, three rows in the same subarray at the same time, this is the same as performing a majority function. And that's uh, what you can see in this um, slide. We first uh, do this uh, activation, three rows at the same time. The three of them start uh, sharing their charge with the bit line, producing a perturbation in the bit line. And at some point when we enable the sense amplifier, the bit line is pulled to the majority of the cells A, B, and C. So if you have, for example, here, two of the cells are completely charged and one of them is completely discharged, the result will be BDD, will be one. And uh, that's the basic idea of the ambit work. And by using uh, this basic idea, it's possible to implement bulk bitwise AND and OR, because AND and OR are basically the same as a majority operation where one of the inputs is fixed to zero or to one, as you can see on the right-hand side of the slide. 
The Ambit, server, uh, the Ambit um, uh, paper proposes very mini minimal modifications to the uh, server reorganization. The, basically, the only thing that you need is to have some uh, a small row decoder that is able to activate three rows at the same time. And because doing that for the entire server array would be much more costly in terms of area for uh, with uh, for the for the row decoder, um, uh, the, the 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 proposal is to just enable some of the rows as compute rows. Only some of the rows are connected to this uh, bitwise decoder that has the ability to activate three rows at the same time. So. Um, Basically, and as you see, uh, uh, this uh, can be achieved with very uh, little overhead. So uh, in order to use this ambit substrate, then it's first necessary to copy using row clone data from the other rows that are just storage or data rows from those rows to D1, D2, D3 that are the designated rows, those that are going to be used for computation, those that are connected to the to this special row decoder, and then activate the three rows at the same time, and finally store the result in the destination row. So that's the basic idea that was first presented in this um, CAL paper in 2015, but still there was some one operation that was missing in order to be functionally complete, because with AND and OR you can do things, but you cannot do everything. And what was missing was not the inverter, right? So the, the, the uh, idea later presented in the uh, Ambit paper uh, in 2017 was uh, including one row, at least one row of dual contact cells such that, uh, as you see, um, this cell has uh, two access transistors. One of them, same as uh, any other cell, is connected to the bit line, but the other access transistor uh, that is uh, controlled by this N word line is connected to uh, the other side, to the bit line bar, basically, to the other side of uh, the sense amplifier. So this way, whenever you have some value here in the bit line, it will be inverted by, by, by this uh, inverter in the sense amplifier, and the inverted value, the bit line bar value, can be taken when we activate the N word line and be loaded into the um, uh, uh, capacitor, right? So this is the basic idea in the dual contact cell. Here you can see uh, in a little bit more detail and also I mean, this figure from the paper uh, how this um, indirect node operation can be implemented. This is one potential way. You may come up with other ways of doing not inside the DRAM subarray, but now that we have an or a not, it's possible to implement much more complex operations, arithmetic operations that can be using more, uh, even uh, more work. The Ambit paper already, already showed very um, good uh, throughput for bitwise operations and, 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 and a lot uh, of energy um, savings, and also for some real workloads like bitmap indices, bit weaving, um, et cetera. They also showed some good end-to-end -end performance improvement. Um, uh, but yeah, you can uh, check the details in the papers and, uh, and, and or in some of our uh, other presentations. I wanted to introduce this before we go for lunch, which is the time right now, and I don't want to delay anyone. After, the, after lunch, we will continue for a few minutes in order to cover this framework for processing uh, using memory in DRAM that makes use of Ambit and makes use of row clone and proposes a way of uh, implementing more complex operations inside DRAM, operations that could be created by a user and later used in, in, um, in any real program. So yeah, thank you so much for your attention. That's all for now, we will continue later.
we're going to continue with this um, presentation, uh, this uh, lecture about uh, or talk about processing using memory in DRAM. Remember that uh, right before the break for lunch, I was talking or I was um, refreshing on uh, two um, the proposals. One of them is a row clone that uh, can be used to perform row copy, the um, bulk row copy inside the DRAM subarray. The row clone paper also proposes ways of copying data uh, between banks and also uh, between subarrays inside the same bank. And after that, um, we went quickly over the AMBIT proposal that uh, whose, the basic idea of which is to activate three rows at the same time and this way uh, performing a majority operation. And with this majority operation, you can have and and or uh, depend if you fix one of the input bits to, um, uh, to zero or one, and this and and or can be used potentially to implement more complex operations together with the uh, solution that the AMBIT paper proposes for uh, not operation. So now by using uh, or by making use of uh, these ideas, uh, we wanted to go further and be able to implement more complex operations inside DRAM. But uh, that wasn't a trivial thing. Why is that? Because you really need to come up with an optimized way or an optimal way of mapping the data inside the DRAM and also design the algorithm itself or the micro program that is going to run um, in the in the memory controller and 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 in order to control how different uh, uh, rows are activated inside the DRAM subarray and that's what uh, we propose in the in the next world that is called uh, sim DRAM a framework for processing using memory in DRAM so um, prior prior works in processing using DRAM uh, they they have Propose uh, processing using DRAM for sure, but there they have some shortcomings, right? They don't support or they only support basic uh, operations such as Boolean operations and addition in, in the best case from, from some um, uh, prior proposals, recent but also prior proposals. And these are not widely uh, applicable. So they support only a limited set of, of operations. They lack flexibility to support new operations. And those cases, or those those uh, approaches that support more complex operations such as multiplication or addition might require significant changes to the DRAM. For example, um, if you want to implement addition, you need to have a way of shifting bits from one uh, bit line to another bit line if you are using a horizontal, the conventional horizontal layout, right? Because when you are adding, when you are adding bits, you, obtain, you uh, get a carry out bit and this carry out bit needs to go to the next uh, bit in order to uh, perform the addition operation correctly. So we wanted to deal with uh, all these uh, shortcomings. Um, <clears throat> So uh, we realized that we needed a framework that aids general adoption of processing using memory by efficiently implementing complex operation and providing flexibility to support new operations. That's the goal, designing a, a PUM framework that efficiently implements complex operations and provides a flexibility and everything with minimal changes to the DRAM architecture. In fact, uh, no changes with respect to prior work, with respect to the AMBIT uh, work. This uh, uh, framework is SimDRAM, an end-to-end -end processing using DRAM framework that provides a programming interface, an ISA, and hardware support for efficiently computing complex operations, providing the ability to implement arbitrary operations as required, and um, using uh, or, or understand, uh, yeah, making use of DRAM as if it was a massively, massively parallel SIMD substrate. The, uh, P, the, the SIMDRAM substrate basically is the same as the AMBIT subarray that I showed before the, before the break, but it makes use of two additional techniques. The first one is the vertical data layout, meaning instead of placing data horizontally as we, and the, the, the entire words horizontally uh, with bits in different bit lines of the same row as we normally do in DRAM, we need to use a vertical data layout because that's the only way that we can shift bits, that we can move a carry out bit of bit zero to uh, the addition of uh, bit one. 
So that's uh, the first thing that we need to do. Uh, this uh, vertical data layout, which has some uh, um, uh, some uh, drawbacks, as we will see, but also some uh, pros or some benefits with respect to the horizontal layout. And the other thing is that instead of formulating um, the complex operations in terms of an or a not, which is what we normally learn to do in the school, um, here we take advantage of majority-based computation because uh, we all know that an or and not together are a functionally complete set, which means that we can implement any operation using them. But it turns out that majority and not are also functionally complete by themselves. And because AMBI or the proposals that uh, we have just discussed before the break, uh, in reality, what support are majority operations activating three rows at the same time. And the result will be the majority of uh, of the uh, bits that are in those three rows, um, we take advantage of that majority operation and not using the uh, inverter uh, implemented with the dual contact cell that I described earlier. And, uh, and this way we can achieve higher performance and higher throughput than what the original AMBIT proposal provided. So this is the Sindiran framework. The Sindiran framework has three different steps. We are going to describe them uh, quickly um, uh, from a user input that is the desired operation typically represented with uh, an or not logic. The first thing to do is to obtain the ma majority not logic representation and then turn that in step two into a, a sequence, an optimized or an optimal sequence of DRAM commands, basically activate and pre-charge operations that are the, uh, the, the commands that we need for row clone or for ambit operations. And by using those, we create the sort of a micro program that uh, is the, um, the sequence of commands that the memory controller is going to execute when we need when we want to um, uh, execute a new operation in DRAM. We will have obviously a enhanced memory controller that um, is able to read this microprogram uh, and 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 execute it properly with a control unit and uh, send the commands as needed to the uh, DRAM chips. So let's start describing the. Um, step one, how to generate the majority not logic from the uh, and or not representation. That's the, this is the, the basic idea. We have this um, circuit here that might represent whatever, it's an addition, if, if I believe, uh, actually this is a calculation of the uh, carry out as you can see. So the first thing that we can do is converting these into a naive, majority based uh, representation where we are just replacing each and and or with a majority um, gate that takes one of the inputs equal to zero or one depending on uh, whether the original circuit has an and or an or uh, or yes an and or an or, or an or and this gives us a majority not implementation that is unoptimized but we can further optimize using a greedy optimization algorithm that was proposed by prior work that you can uh, read at the bottom. And using this algorithm, we can uh, uh, obtain a more compact majority not based representation of uh, each individual operation. And because it's more compact, it has less majority gates. So that means that it, it will be more efficient. It will be faster um, uh, on the Sindirian framework. So now that after step one, we have the majority not logic, we can generate the sequence of DRAM commands to execute those majority and not operations inside the DRAM uh, subarray. And in order to generate this micro program, which is basically a series of microarchitectural operations, a series of uh, DRAM commands, um, we, we generate um, um, this uh, microprogram, and in order to generate this microprogram, we need to um, complete two tasks. The first task is to allocate DRAM rows to the operands. So the first task is to say, okay, where, where am I going to place the uh, operands of the operation that I want to um, execute inside DRAM in each of the uh, subarray bit lines? Uh, what are the rows that we are going to use? And second, 
what's going to be the microprogram itself. So how, what's going to be the sequence of the run commands to um, execute those operations. Remember that this is a subarray, of, uh, um, subarray organization. At the bottom, you can see the, um, um, the designated rows, the compute rows, those that we can activate. I mean, they're connected to the um, row decoder that can activate three rows at the same time. And on top of them, we have a row full of zeros, a row full of one for initialization, or if we need to, um, to do and or or, and, and, and the rest of rows are the uh, regular rows that uh, simply store data. So there are several constraints uh, when um, coming up with an allocation algorithm. There are a couple of constraints indeed. The first one is that there is a limited number of rows that are reserved for computation. That's something we, that we have to take into account and that's important and necessary because remember, we didn't want to have very complex modifications to the uh, DRAM subarray. So that's why only this uh, a small row decoder and the second constraint is that the ambit operation or the this activate activate precharge operation this triple row activation uh, has a destructive behavior what that means is that when we activate three rows at the same time regardless of what's the values that these rows contain in the beginning let's say 110 if the result is 1 at the end of the operation the three rows will contain the same or the, the three cells in the same bit line will contain exactly the same value is one in, an exa in the example that I gave. So that's something that we have to take into account, even though at the same time, we can also take advantage of that. Because if you have the result in three rows, that means that you have three copies of the result and you can use them for later um, steps uh, of your algorithm. So the, in task one, the uh, allocation algorithm that is basically saying, okay, where am, where am I going to place these three import operands, A, B, and C in? Because we only have three of them, we can place them directly in the free compute rows. So the, al the algorithm, the first thing that the algorithm does is uh, allocating data in the compute rows themselves because this way we won't need to copy from one data row to one compute row. We are saving row copy operations here. And then we can do the uh, triple row activation and then we, can, we obtain the C out value, which is the, the result of this um, specific uh, function. The second uh, task is to generate the microprogram. And we are going to generate the microprogram after having allocated the operands. And the microprogram simply says, uh, where do I have to, uh, so what, what's the sequence of commands that I need? So for example, um, assuming that A, B, and C in are not in the uh, compute rows from the beginning, they are in, 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 in normal rows, we first need to row clone them, to copy them to a reserve row, to a compute row, a, B, and C in, and then we need to uh, execute the majority. That is a triple row activation and pre-charge operation, right? Um, and finally, copy the uh, result to the destination row. So this is the initial microprogram. The uh, SIMD RAM framework in this step two also applies some optimizations that are possible to do, like for example, coalescing row copies, Basically, if you have to uh, copy one row to two different compute rows, you can do that at once by activating the two destination rows at the same time. So that's um, coalescing a row copy. And also we can sometimes merge majority and row copy operations because in the end, in a majority operation, you are doing activate, activate, pre-charge. So the second activate can activate the destination um, row in the in the subarray, whatever whatever it is. So uh, that's basically the thing. There is an initial microprogram and then some optimizations as, as optimization as steps that can be applied in order to um, uh, optimize the microprogram and later make it faster. So once we have the microprogram, we can go to uh, well, we we need to store it in DRAM for future use, and and we. Uh, also create or have created a new SIMDRAM instruction. SIMDRAM instructions are called BBOps, and uh, and this SIMDRAM instruction could be added to the to the ISA to the CPU ISA and using the CPU program. 
using the CPU program, as you can see uh, here on the left hand side, and whenever the uh, pipeline finds, the CPU pipeline finds this sort uh, of instruction, sends it to the memory controller, and the memory controller will be able to decode it. How? By going to DRAM, loading the microprogram into the, into the um, um, SRAM memory that the uh, micro, micro memory controller has, and, and at that point, start issuing activate and pre-charge commands uh, to the uh, uh, DRAM chips. So that's a, a basic uh, operation. Here, it describes a little bit how the uh, DRAM control unit uh, does with the microprogram. So that's a, that's a uh, basic idea in the, the three steps of the CMDRAM framework. Uh, you can take a look uh, at our paper, our other considerations related to end-to-end -end system, system integration. One of the things that I wanted to mention here in this, in this presentation is how to transpose data, right? Because remember, in DRAM conventionally and, 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 and the way that the CPU understands data is in a horizontal layout, um, consecutive words belong to the same cache line and they are accessed at the same time. But uh, when it comes to using memory in the Sindira mode, let's say we need to have data placed in a vertical manner, right? So we need a way of doing this uh, transposition. This is basically a bit transposition. It's something that we could do in software for sure. And, um, and, it, uh, it, it would have some overhead, but, but in some sense, it would be similar to the transposition that I mentioned that the current admin system does uh, by in, the, in the runtime library. But uh, in this paper, we uh, propose a transposition unit that um, uh, it, it's placed uh, in between the last level cache and the memory controller, as, as you see, and it has some buffer in the buffer, in the tra this transpo transpose buffer, um, we start um, keeping uh, several cache lines until we have uh, the number of cache lines that we need to do the uh, bit transposition. That's um, um, how it, I mean, it, it's a relatively simple design, as you can see, but um, uh, it, it does the job. There could be also other ways of doing this bit transposition. You could come up with a subarray design that allows you to read data in a vertical manner or in a horizontal manner. And in fact, uh, if I uh, recall correctly, there have been uh, some, past, some past proposals uh, doing that. I, I remember one paper from Micron um, in 2015 that uh, allowed a way of uh, accessing data vertically or horizontally. We didn't want to uh, go for that approach in this paper because we wanted to keep the modifications in the memory subarray as minimal as possible. So this uh, uh, transposition has low impact on the throughput uh, of Sindiran operations and also very low uh, area cost, as you can see. And now uh, we go to the programming interface. There are uh, new instructions that can be used or should be used in the uh, CPU program. Um, among these instructions, we have the initialization that is basically uh, indicating uh, to the transposition unit, what are arrays, what are addresses, and what's the size um, of, of those arrays that need to be transposed when copying to the uh, memory or when reading from the CPU uh, or reading by the CPU from the memory. There are also these BB ops that I mentioned earlier. We'll have one new BB op for every new operation that uh, we design and implement. They might have a single uh, input operand or may have two input, two input operands. That's um, the two types that we consider in this work. And then there are also predication instructions because SIMDRAM also supports predication. It's not the most efficient thing, but it's uh, basically the way that we can implement uh, control flow uh, execution. So let, just let me give you an example on how to write code using SIMDRAM instructions. Here uh, on the left hand side, you can see uh, some C code basically is uh, going over uh, several arrays, A, B, and C, and performing some operation based on some condition, right? So if uh, A of I is uh, greater than the predicate, then do the if, if not, do the else. So it's an addition or a subtraction, as you can see. 
how is this code translated into uh, SIMD run code? We need to first indicate that arrays A, B, and C are going to be operated on by SIMD RAM. So they will need to be transposed when copied to the uh, memory of arrays. Then we need to have an BBOP add that is going to perform the addition. We also need to have a BBOP soup to perform the subtraction. And then we check what's the, uh, uh, for, for each of the values, we are going to generate one mask that represents the predicate. So depending on the uh, values, uh, the, 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 the predicate bit that we are going to have in, in this mask in each of the uh, bit lines, we will do if or else. So that's basically what the uh, SIMD run code looks like. So as you see, um, the drawback of this is one typical of drawback of predication that we have to uh, do the add first, then the, the subtraction, and then decide what we write into the destination using the predicate that we, um, that we obtain with this BB upgrader. But at least uh, we can do it, we support it. And whenever you don't have potential divergence, it's going to be much more efficient. So you can have, find uh, many more uh, details in the paper about the integration and about uh, how to write code, et cetera. And now if you want to uh, very quickly take a look at some experimental results, uh, we compare these to uh, multi-core CPU, uh, a GPU, a Titan V, and also to the state of the art that was Ambit. The key difference between these uh, realization of Ambit and SIMDRAM is uh, that in SIMDRAM, we are using majority-based computation, while in Ambit is and or not based computation. So in that sense, there is where we are going to see the performance difference. Using majority, uh, majority directly is um, uh, way more efficient on this architecture. We evaluated 16 complex operations. You can find them there, uh, uh, absolute value, addition, subtraction, bit count, um, uh, equality, greater, greater equal, predication, ReLU, et cetera, uh, and also seven real world applications that make use of these complex operations. For throughput analysis, for the uh, 16 SIMD run operations that we implemented, uh, we can see uh, very good um, speed ups with respect to CPU, GPU, and Ambit. Uh, only with respect to GPU, we are not able to outperform the GPU when using just a single bank in SIMDRAM, but notice that this is DRAM, right? So we can exploit bank level parallelism. Uh, and uh, and well, as soon as we start using four banks or 16 banks, we can clearly outperform the Titan V uh, GPU. Uh, for the energy analysis, we can also see uh, quite interesting energy savings. DRAM is more energy efficient than the other devices. And the, for the comparison uh, to real world, uh, for real world applications, we see also similar trends. So yeah, you can find many more uh, uh, details in the paper, evaluation about reliability, the overhead of data movement, the overhead of the transposition, area overhead, et cetera. So this is the um, simply run work. If you don't have uh, any questions, I will go with the second part uh, of this presentation, and then um, uh, we will uh, we will go with uh, Manuel for the for the next invited talk. Now the question is: Is processing using memory in DRAM really feasible? Is is this? I mean, all these uh, proposals that we have just discussed in DRAM, Ambit, Roclon, is that something that can really be done in real DRAM chips? We believe uh, it is. We believe it's feasible, and 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 with I mean, and and this is something that indeed was shown in Micro 2019 by these folks from uh, Princeton in this uh, compute DRAM work. They showed that it's possible to do row copy operations and even ambit operations, even bitwise operations in some chips by violating the run timing parameters. Um, the basic idea is to issue, activate, and pre-charge commands at the reduced latency. So that's why they are violating uh, the, uh, the normal DRAM parameters. And by doing so, they are able to open rows 
these rows are going to start sharing, or the cells in these rows are going to start sharing their charge with the bit line. <clears throat> but because the activation and pre-charge operation happens so quickly, um, it's not possible. I mean, the, the sense amplifier doesn't even get activated. So it's not able to um, amplify the, the, uh, the charge deviation in the bit line. So for example, for the row copy uh, operation in compute DRAM, how do they do that? Observe that here we have two rows, R1 and R2, and here at the bottom, we have the sense amplifier. So the first thing that they do is activating row one. No, so as soon as you activate row one, uh, the cells there start leaking charge uh, onto the bit line. So the, in, in this case, this uh, cell here is charged. So the voltage of the bit line starts uh, increasing, but then, uh, then they need to issue a pre-charge command, right? The, the point is to issue this pre-charge command very quickly so that the uh, sense amplifier doesn't really get active. And when you go and activate the uh, second uh, row, in this case, row, row two, uh, because the bit line is already over BDD over two, the charge in the bit line starts going and uh, filling the cell in the destination row. So that's the basic idea. First one activate very quickly, one pre-charge, and finally second activate um, when the bit line is above half BDD. And by doing so, you're basically copying the contents of row one into row two. Um, <clears throat> for, the bit, uh, for the bitwise, uh, operations, in this case, bitwise and is what, I'm, uh, what we uh, can see in this uh, figure here. It's uh, slightly more complex and it doesn't work for all the chips that they tested, as you will see later. <clears throat> but the, the, the point is that depending on, I mean, uh, the, 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 the basic idea here is that the, 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 the row decoder is designed in a way that when you go uh, from activating one row to activating another row, the um, the um, index values in the in the row decoder uh, uh, change uh, uh, bit by bit. Let's say so. We have uh, first of all activate row one. Finally, we will activate. So first of all, we will activate row one. Then we will activate row two. But because row one is has address one zero and row two has address uh, sorry. 0, 1, and row 2 has address 1, 0, the row decoder first changes one bit, this um, uh, less significant bit, and then the, it changes the second bit. So what happens, because the activate pre-charge activate sequence is issued very quickly, what will happen is that in between uh, the second row, in this case row 3, will be open as well just for a few um, uh, microseconds. So that's the uh, point here. So observe how we first um, open row one, the row start, starts uh, sharing its charge with the, with the bit line because the bit line in this case was, was at half EDD and this cell is discharged, it starts uh, charging. At this point, we pre-charge and then activate row two, but while activating row two, we first open row three. So row three starts sharing its charge with the bit line as well, rising in this case, the level of the voltage in the bit line, again, back to closer to uh, half PDD. So, and, 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 and finally, they end up opening R2. So when opening R2, R2 starts leaking charge as well. So the three of them, as you can see in this part of the figure, are uh, sharing their uh, charge with the bit line. So that's why in the end, the uh, AND operation happens or the majority operation happens. It's an AND simply because one of the rows has a constant value equals zero. So that's why they talk about AND in, in this work. And here you can see, yeah, uh, T1, um, uh, very short T1, which is the time between the first activate and the pre-charge operation so that the sense amplifiers are not activated. And then T2 is also very short. This is the way of uh, opening uh, R3 first and R2 next, and, um, and finally uh, obtaining the majority result uh, in the bit line and in the three cells after the next uh, pre-charge operation. <clears throat> 
So for the experimental methodology, <clears throat> they tested these on real chips using uh, the uh, SoftNC, that is a FPGA-based memory controller that was uh, developed uh, in the Safari Research Group. They tested uh, many different uh, DRAM modules, 32 different modules with around 256 DRAM chips, and they did this uh, proof of concept, basically what uh, I explained in the, in the uh, earlier slides, uh, se uh, sending activate pre-charts and activate commands um, uh, to, the, to the DRAM. Uh, they were playing with different values for this T1 and T2, as you can see uh, in this slide, right, for different combinations of T1 here on the um, uh, Y axis, let's say, and T2 in the X axis. And for those, they got different uh, su uh, um, uh, success rates, right? Uh, as you can see, the bluish um, combinations represent row clone operations or row copy operations. Uh, and then uh, the green ones represent and and all operations or ambit operations. As you see, they are not so, um, so much um, frequent, but at least some of the chips uh, were able to do them. So this is the uh, Compute DRAM paper, as I said, presented in 2019. And by taking uh, the ideas or some of the ideas in, in this paper, uh, we proposed an end-to-end FPGA-based framework for processing uh, in DRAM, and that is called PyDRAM. The goal here is to develop a flexible platform to explore end-to-end -end implementations of processing using memory techniques. It has uh, software components and hardware components, as you'll see, and it's uh, basically an FPGA where we um, uh, where we implement a RISC-V system and a memory controller, a custom memory controller that is going to be able to uh, execute processing using memory operations uh, onto the DRAM that uh, is uh, exactly here. This is the entire PyDRAM workflow. Uh, we can have a user application that makes use of the library called Humolib that uh, provides these uh, row clone operations or other processing using DRAM operations that you want to uh, implement in particular in, in this work and in the paper, uh, you can um, see row clone operations and also uh, operations for um, um, random number generation. Um, so the user application can uh, directly use this Pumolib. These instructions are going to be um, decoded by the chip, in, by the processor, uh, RISC V processor, the, the rocket chip, and then using uh, store instructions, uh, they are moved, they are copied to this um, uh, PUM operation controller that is basically the controller that is in charge or of issuing the required DRAM commands onto the DRAM module. So that's the uh, PyDRAM workflow and the entire PyDRAM workflow. I mean, all the details, you can find them in the paper. This is, um, I think, a very interesting experimental platform for these uh, kind of operations and, and that are uh, really necessary because it's not only, uh, you know, that having the theoretical idea of uh, activating multiple rows at the same time or, or using a simulator or even using an FPGA controller as Compute DRAM Fox did. Uh, I think it's also uh, very interesting and necessary to face the challenges that the integration in real systems uh, may have. And that's, uh, uh, and that's basically uh, what we uh, try to do with uh, this PyDRAM framework. The uh, work is um, accessible. I mean, you can find the paper in archive and also the repository is uh, publicly available. And, uh, and here you can see just that for you know, illustration, some um, uh, uh, performance of row copy and row initialization and the throughput improvement like um, two uh, about two orders of magnitude faster than doing these operations using the uh, CP. As I said, uh, PyDRAM is open source, so you can download and play with it. And if you want to uh, learn more about it and, and, and even with a tutorial on how to use it, I can recommend you uh, to take a look at this uh, talk that Ataberg, who is uh, one PhD student in the Safari Research Group, uh, delivered a few months ago. Uh, so this is uh, all for, uh, for this lecture. Uh,
um, for now. So now I am going to hand over to uh, Manuel, who is uh, going to give uh, the next invited lecture. Thank you very much for your attention. I don't know, guys, if you have any questions. Uh, if you have, please go ahead. So is there any back from how long ago the road was refreshed? Because the cells leak all the time, right? It's yes. So then we've got to get a reliable system refresh from the time or something like that? Yeah, well that uh, yeah, that that's a really good question. Actually, I I <clears throat> I think um, that's something that, I mean, in the end, DRAM uh, is, uh, or DRAM rows are refreshed every certain time because that's a time that you can tolerate that leaking, right? So uh, what uh, we do here, when we want to copy one row, regardless of when it has been refreshed, what we do is open in this row. And if you open this row and it can be read because it still has the, charge that it needs to have, that it should have, it, 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 it should be fine for the raw copy as well, because as soon as you open it and then you activate the sense amplifier, uh, the sense amplifier is going to uh, amplify this deviation and, and, and put the, build, the bit line voltage at, at, at the appropriate level. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for the question. Transmission yes, uh, for a minute. Okay, so our next presenter is uh, Manuel Legalo. Uh, he joined IBM Research Europe in 2013, where he is currently employed as a staff research scientist in the in memory computing group uh, of Zurich Laboratory. His main research interest. Uh, or his main research interest is in using phase change memory devices for non von Neumann computing. He has co-authored more than 50 scientific papers in journal and conferences and holds one of the, uh, he holds more than 20 granted patents. Uh, he has appointed IBM master inventor in 2019 for significant contributions to intellectual property and is a recipient of the MIT Technology Reviews 2020 Innovators Under 35 Award. So thank you very much, Manuel. Whenever you're ready. Okay. I Let me make you a, a, a co-host uh, so that you can share. Make sure you unmute. Yeah, yeah, now I, I, I changed it. Okay, so it seems to work, but uh, yeah, just have to be able to share it. Okay. Okay. Did you see the correcting on Zoom or? Uh, yes. It's not the not the, the it's, not the it's not the presenter view, no, right? It is it the presenter view? Okay, then I think. Then what I have to stop? I think then I have to do what? Share screen or this one right here. No, it's good. Okay, and this pointer seems to Okay. Okay, good. Perfect. So, uh, oh yeah, or should I? I don't want to get rid of this. Or maybe it will go. Yeah, but I can't click here. Uh, uh, This one, right? Yes. Okay, good. Let me get this back. Okay, uh, so hi everyone. 
uh, I will talk to you about uh, some of the recent results that we got on uh, deep learning inference using uh, phase change memory. Uh, so this is work that we've been uh, doing for quite some time now at IBM. Uh, so uh, I will briefly introduce, uh, you know, give a short introduction to deep learning with uh, in-memory computing first. Uh, then after that, I will uh, describe how we can do this with uh, phase change memory technology. Um, and then I will focus the most of the presentation on the uh, latest experimental results that we got on the on the new chip that uh, that that we got back. Uh, so this is this uh, IBM Hermes project chip. Uh, and then finally, I will uh, also present a little bit of the uh, hardware acceleration kit that we have in order to simulate uh, deep learning inference and training also with uh, in memory computing. So. Uh, just as a short introduction, I mean, it has been also in, already introduced, but uh, uh, so the idea of in-memory computing is uh, is basically to uh, kind of try to eliminate this bottleneck, right, that we have in the conventional uh, processing and, and memory unit where we essentially, you know, transfer data back and forth all the time between the, uh, the processor and the memory here, right? So, and... Uh, here, what we could think of, I mean, if we want to, uh, you know, get rid of this bottleneck is essentially to do uh, the computation directly in the memory and some so-called, you know, computational memory that would be sitting uh, here, right? And then just by sending an instruction with the processor, then we can execute this function F, you know, directly in the memory using the analog properties of the memory devices. Uh, so, and uh, yeah, so as Ono rightly pointed out at the beginning and, and morning, uh, we, cannot hope to do like a general purpose computing with this kind of uh, scheme because simply, you know, the, the operations that you can do here are essentially tied to the analog properties of these memory devices. So you can just do certain computational tasks, not everything with this. So it's very unlikely that this will become general purpose, but on the other hand, you can actually certain tasks with uh, this computational memory. So it has been already shown that you can do some logic operations in DRAM, for example, and uh, what I will, uh, described mostly are the arithmetic operations, and that is mainly matrix vector multiplications, which is essentially the bulk of the computations we do for deep learning inference. Uh, so, and, and as I said, how we do this is by exploiting physical attributes and the state dynamics of the memory devices. Um, so, what we use at IBM, I mean, this is our different memory technologies we can use for uh, doing processing in memory. So essentially all memory technologies can be used to some extent, but here what we use here is phase change memory. So phase change memory, what it is, uh, it's essentially, it looks like this. So it's a memory, it's a phase change material. So this is the material here. It's just sandwiched between two electrodes that are usually not the same dimension as you can see here. Uh, so if we want to program this memory, uh, we essentially uh, send a high current pulse that will amorphize this material and make it more resistive. So that is that will create a high resistance state here, which is usually called like the reset state. Uh, so this is could correspond, for example, to logic zero. Um, and then if we want to bring it back to the low resistance state, then we will apply a lower amplitude pulse that will essentially crystallize this amorphous region here and make it more conductive. And then we end up with uh, a fully crystalline uh, material in here that has a lower resistance. So this is how we write phase change memory and how we read it by, is by simply you know, applying a low voltage pulse and we read the low resistance. So uh, in this state it will be low, resist, uh, low resistance. So that means potentially logic one and here high resistance logic zero, for example. Uh, so, and we've looked at a lot of different applications uh, in, in, in this review paper that, you know, people have looked at uh, for, uh, you know, by using computational memory with mer resistive memory devices. So that is the kind of class of memory devices that phase change memory belongs to. Uh, so yeah, these are a very wide range of applications spanning from uh, like generating random numbers that use basically the stochastic properties of the devices up to like uh, scientific computing where you can you know, solve linear equations and, and do you know, tasks that require very high precision. And then in the middle, we have uh, kind of the, uh, you know, what, what people have been mostly looking into, which are the signal processing and machine learning uh, applications. And in that is also deep learning. 
where uh, you know the focus of this presentation will be on, on deep learning and prints uh, here. So. And uh, yeah, so why deep learning inference is interesting or why deep learning in general is interesting to accelerate. So uh, I will just give you one example, uh, which uh, was still done some time ago, but I, I think the, the, the conclusion is still valid today is that, uh, so, you know, if we try to train neural networks on, on these big data sets, for example, the ImageNet 22K uh, with ResNet 101, uh, we did the, the measurement at IBM and, you know, the, the, conclusion was that essentially, you know, these, these numbers of kilowatt hours, they essentially correspond to two hours of home energy, uh, two weeks of home energy consumption. So this is uh, quite significant. So, and this is just, you know, training one model one time, right? But you never just train one model one time, you train it multiple times, you sweep, you know, the learning rate and all kinds of different parameters. So, uh, you know, thinking that e each of these instances, they consume two weeks of home energy consumption is quite significant. Uh, so, and, you know, of course, it's also time consuming. And, uh, you know, in case of inference, it's definitely the, the power consumption that is uh, coming from the, the, that is resulting from, you know, these multiple GPUs uh, is prohibitive for uh, applicability and in, in, in like Internet of Things or edge computing, right? So, so yeah, now this is where this uh, computational memory comes into play, right? So, now, how do we, how can we do inference with, with this kind of in-memory computing chips? And so the idea is, so you have like a deep neural network here that is shown to be, uh, you know, the, here these are the synapses, the neurons are the, the dots. And then, uh, so each synapse will be mapped to a certain cross point in, in this architecture, which represents the, the synaptic weights. So each synaptic weight will be programmed on, on certain devices here that are arranged in the crossbar. And then uh, to perform the forward propagation, we will essentially uh, apply the input activations on the rows and get, uh, you know, the, the column outputs. Uh, and that will give us the output activations that we then have to propagate to the next layer, which would be essentially on another crossbar or, or another array in the, in, the, in the system, right? And then we do this until we essentially arrive at the end of the network. And then the final result will be uh, will be given by by the output here. So you know, for example, in this case, uh, we have this input image, and then you know we will just look at the, which of these neurons is the strongest, and then that, and that will give us the, the result. So in this case, would be a two, for example. So the idea is, yeah. So again, we train the neural network first, typically on on on, on externally, right? So in this case, I'm not. You can you can do training on chip, uh, but I, I will not cover that in this talk. So uh, typically, what we do is we train the network externally using conventional, you know, software, GPUs, etc. Uh, and then uh, we take the trained synaptic weights, we map them on on on, the, on an array of those computational memory cores, and then each of these cores will perform matrix multiplications that correspond to each layer of the network. So that's the idea. So, and why PCM can be useful for this? Uh, okay, I heard something. Yeah. Anyway. So why can PCM be useful for this? So um, there are the, the main property of PCM that we use uh, for deep learning inference is this fact that we can, uh, it has a kind of an analog storage capability. So it cannot just store one bit, but it can store a range of different resistance values that can be obtained by changing the current that we send in order to program the device. So this is what is shown here. So you know, we start with the lower current, so we are in, here in the crystalline state. And then as we increase the current, we essentially ch start to change, you know, the size of this amorphous region. And as we change the size, then the resistance increases uh, kind of gradually. So it's not like just a zero or a, and one, but you can reach all those different intermediate states. So that means you can essentially store, uh, you know, a, a, an analog weight value inside this phase change memory and you don't have to just use it in a binary fashion so this is this is interesting because that allows us to essentially and actually this is what we do in practice we can just store a synaptic weight in one device right just by using you know this range of different resistance values that we can obtain and this is this is interesting because that really increases the the density at which we can store the weights right so uh, but the drawback though and this is what we have to uh, to deal with when we build, you know, these uh, multi-core chips, 
are the non uh, the non realities of page change memory, and there are a few here that are you know illustrated in this chart. Uh, so when we measure these resistance states over time, as you can see, they are not stable, right? So uh, essentially, the, the the resistance tends to increase over time, and it's also very noisy, especially in the states in the middle, which are those kind of intermediate states where the amorphous region is not very well defined. It's like a lot of percolation paths in there and uh, everything that leads to you know high noise. And also we see in general, the resistance tends to increase over time. And this is a well-known property of phase change memory, which is called resistance drift. And this will never stop essentially. I, it will keep increasing like this for like 10 years. Uh, but it's a log scale. So that is the, the good thing about this is that at some point it, uh, you, you kind of barely notice it because it has been drifting for so much time that you know, in order to notice a significant increase in resistance, you need to wait for an order of magnitude in time, right? Uh, so, but in, in general, we have to deal with these uh, kind of issues when we build those chips. So now I will go to the presentation of the latest ship that we have built, so which is called this IBM Hermes project ship. So here, this is uh, uh, like a micrograph of the chip where you can see, so these, it has 64 PCM cores, so each, so the core is basically what you see here, right? So I applied it here in, in this red box. So each of these are, are PCM cores. And uh, in the middle of the chip, we have a global digital processing unit that uh, we used to do uh, like LSTM activations. Here, this is a picture of the setup that we use to characterize this chip in the lab. Uh, so the chip is basically sitting under this, in, in the socket here under the heat sink. And then here we have an FPGA and this PCB board is essentially just a bunch of power supplies. Um, so uh, what the chip has, it has 64 256 by 256 cores based on phase change memory. So these are the matrix, matrix vector multiplication cores. Each core has local digital processing units that can be used to perform uh, some uh, fine scaling operations and also ReLU activations. Uh, so this global processing unit in the middle uh, can implement the LSTM activation function. So that is sigma and tan H and also all the state cell state computation that is required uh, as well. Uh, and also we have on chip digital commutation link that allow to transmit data from one core to another core and also to the GDP. Uh, so this chip is pretty big, actually. It's 144 millimeters square. Uh, each core has approximately 1.4 millimeter square size. So now to describe, so the, the each PCM core is essentially looking like this. Uh, so again, we have a 256 by 256 pro, uh, array of unit PCM unit cells. So the, this looks like just the crossbar that I've shown before. Uh, so the main thing, though, is that each unit cell is not just a single PCM, but actually four PCM arranged in a differential configuration. So that is to support negative weights. And then why we have like two PCM devices per SEM is, is just for redundancy. And actually I will show that when we program the weight on two device, instead of one, we can actually increase the, the accuracy. So that is why we have two devices instead of, uh, yeah, four devices per unit cell. Uh, so there are two of the six ADCs so actually each column of this crossbar has a dedicated ADC and that is to you know, increase the throughput as much as possible. So we actually have one ADC per column here uh, and also a local digital processing unit that is this here uh, to do again, these fine scanning operations and ReLU. Uh, we have also parallel device programming capability with on-chip DAX. So we have 32 DAX on each course. So that is we can program 32 PCM devices in parallel. And these are the numbers that we measured for the, uh, the matrix multiplication uh, efficiency here. So 10 terabytes per work and uh, about this number for the throughput. So uh, what we can do with this chip. So uh, first thing it has, you can have a maximum of 4 million weights. Uh, so we can also do, you know, using these on-chip links uh, basically, we can do data aggregation in the LDPU to support lar layers larger than 256 by 256. So most of the layers that we encounter in neural networks they are actually bigger than that. So we need multiple cores to uh, to implement them. And then, you know, usually if the layer uh, you know has more rows than 256, then we need to uh, to combine the results of two different cores. So this this we can do by sending the data from one core to another core. 
and then uh, doing the, the sum at the output in the digital processing unit. So this is supported and this is what we actually do in, in, in all the demonstrations that I will show you. Uh, so the chip can support uh, CNNs. So, you know, as I said, we have ReLU and when we can bash norm, we can do this in LEPU. Uh, so it, it activations are represented in eight and we have FP16 uh, format for those. Uh, batch norms. So basically the LDPU works with FP16 arithmetic here. And then also we can support LSTMs. Uh, so not like any LSTM, but essentially you know, an LSTM where you can fit one cell on the top half because this guy doesn't communicate with the, with the bottom. It communicates only with the top as I sh shown here. So essentially you, you have to basically put the LSTM cell here. Or, or basically it doesn't have to fill the, you know, use all the cores, but still you have to put the STM here uh, and then, you know, connect uh, uh, the, the output of the LSTM cell to the GDPU so that you can do the activations and the cell set computation. Uh, and uh, yeah, so what we can do with the bottom in this case is to put like the fully connected layer. All right. uh, okay. So now first, I mean, the first thing we do when we want to implement a neural network on this chip is we need to program the synaptic weights, right? Uh, so how do we program the synaptic weights is by what we call iterative programming. So essentially we map the synaptic weight to some conductance value that is this G target. Then uh, we will send a certain pulse to this uh, device with certain current value. Then we will read the conductance and then you know, uh, compute the difference between this conductance and the target, and then change the amplitude of the pulse until the difference is small enough. Uh, so this is typically what we, we do, and this we do like at an individual device level. Uh, and that is simply because there is no way you can just send the same pulse to all the devices and hope to reach the same conductance. It doesn't happen because with these large arrays, there's a lot of variability. So uh, you, you will never reach the same conductance when you send just the same pulse, but, uh, with this technique, you can program pretty accurately any conductance value, and then you just do it, uh, you know, for for every device, and then that allows to essentially get the states that you want, but with some variability. So as you can see here, these are measurements from the chip. So uh, you never get like exactly the correct value, but you get like uh, some kind of distribution. And here, right away, it's just 16 states, but I, I, I can put any number. I could, I could put 100 states or, or more. I mean, it doesn't matter. But each state basically has this kind of standard deviation, right? And this is the important thing. So there is essentially a distribution of conductance values for it that essentially depends on what you program in the array, right? So for conductance of 0 to 10 microsiemens, you can see that essentially the standard deviation increases, right? So that's typical. Uh, but uh, yeah, we are not tied to these 16 states. I mean, it can be any number of states, but you know, each state will have certain standard deviation that it has shown, right? So, and now once we have programmed the ways, we can do matrix multiplication. So mm -hmm. I will explain how we do this in, in analog. I think it was also covered in the morning by Odor, but just to recap uh, what we do. So we have a matrix here. We map it to conductance values. So that is basically the A11 corresponds to G11, A12 to G12, et cetera, like this. And then we will map, map the X, so which is the input vector to voltage values. So this V1 and V2 here. And then uh, the result of the matrix multiplication, we separate by, from the current. So that is basically using uh, Holmes law to do the multiplication and Kirchhoff's law to do the additions here. Uh, and the nice thing about this is that potentially this can this is done really at the place where the data resides and also it can be done with O1 time complexity given that we can apply all the inputs in parallel and read all the currents in parallel, which is the case in the chip because as I said, we have two to six ADCs so we can read everything in parallel. Uh, and, uh, but yeah, uh, because of, uh, you know, the, the conductance distributions that we have and, and the drift and all the stuff that I've been talking about before, uh, you don't get uh, floating point precision with this, right? So uh, here, this is again, measurement from the chip. And as you can see, so it, it kind of, you know, there is a spread around the, the red line, which would be like a floating point calculation, right? Uh, so this is, this is expected. And now 
let's see how it looks on, on the all the 64 cores of the chip. Uh, so here, this is just the biggest RAM that essentially, you know, uh, comprises all the 64 cores uh, and, and shows, you know, the MVM, the matrix multiplication error after programming. And here, so we did it for one device programming. So basically where you map the weight onto only a single device and two devices where we use, you know, the, the full four unit, for four PCM cell, uh, and then so as you can see, uh, we can reduce the programming error when we use two devices, and that is because uh, the noise just averages itself. Right, it's, it's very simple uh, effect of you know the, that the noise just averages out between the two, and then uh, so we get these reductions. So instead of here, this is an eight units, so the standard deviation reduces from four point five uh, to three in this case, and uh, we could see that. So when we compute the weight error now from, from these results, uh, what we can see is that indeed, uh, you know, this, uh, this increase in accuracy comes from a reduction in the weight error between one device and two devices. And that is essentially coming from just averaging out the, the random errors, uh, programming errors or drift or whatever. So everything gets averaged out. Uh, yeah. And then if we measure this over time, so as, as, as it's not a surprise that the error also increases because of this resistance drift effect that I've shown in the in the previous uh, slides. So here, and, and so if we want to compare this with kind of digital computing, uh, we, we kind of computed what is this error uh, when we essentially have 8-bit input, output, and n-bit weights in just the conventional digital model implementation. And then, so what you can see here is that this, you know, two device programming resides essentially between 3-bit and 4-bit. So one thing, though, that I want to point out here is that uh, this is only valid for the very specific distributions that I've used in this experiment, which is like uniform input and uniform weights. If you change the distributions, these, these will change. Both the digital and the, the, the PCM, you know, the errors will change. And the reason is, you know, that uh, so I, I could just so if you have a uniform, then everything spans the whole weight range, right? Equally, so digital is actually quite good at this because also the uh, quantization noise is uniform, so you know it gets it gets pretty good performance. And actually, you know, this device might look quite bad. I mean, thinking that this is worse than four bit. But on the other hand, if I would take a Gaussian that is essentially you know has most of the values here around zero, then this is this this will be better because the noise is much lower when we are close to zero, although the digital will have a lot of quantization. So I just want to point out that, you know, this is uh, not like, uh, you know, it, it, it's good. It's always good to do these comparisons, but uh, like if you want a complete picture, you should do them for all possible distributions, you know, not just like uh, here. So this one, just what I want to say. So, but, you know, given all this, of course, it's not expected that you can just take a network that was trained with the GPU, you know, without any tricks and then map it on the chip and hope that it works. So this is obviously not the case because the chip doesn't do accurate computations. So what we have to do is, uh, and this is the same for, you know, any uh, reduced precision digital uh, uh, network is that we have to do some kind of custom training for this. And uh, so how we do the custom training here, unlike, Reduce precision digital is that we will essentially uh, send, uh, we will inject noise on the synaptic ways during the forward pass in order to, and, and this noise is essentially, we will try to have the magnitude of this noise comparable to the, uh, you know, the, 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 the width of the distributions that I've shown previously. And, and by doing this, so because then you will make the network more robust to this noise because it will have seen it during training. And, and hopefully you can hope that, you know, when we will use the same noise during inference, uh, then we will not suffer a lot from, you know, a, a big accuracy drop, right? So now let's see how it looks when we do the actual experiments on the on the on the hardware. So uh, the first network we looked at was a uh, ResNet nine uh, for SciFar ten, so which has almost two million weights. It's a custom version of uh, of it. So uh, yeah, and essentially we. Basically, what the chip does is uh, all the computational layers operations that are, you know, done with this uh, analog and digital computation. So basically, the matrix multiplications are done in analog, uh, batch norm and ReLU are done in digital, and and that is all done all on the chip. And this is how the network looks like when we map it on the chip. So essentially, the first layer uh, goes to the first core, 
Second layer needs two cores, so we put them on two here. Uh, third layer would be here, so it needs four cores, etc. And then all the the three, the last three deep layers, they need essentially uh, the whole the whole uh, a whole row of cores that need to be implemented. And and again, as I said, so uh, you know, in order to accumulate the results from the different cores here, uh, we use the on-chip communication links, and then we do the additions inside the LDP. So basically, we don't have to take the data out when we have these big layers. Everything is done on chip. So uh, what we got is, uh, is this kind of accuracy. So the software baseline was 93.67. On-chip is 92.81, which is less than 1%. Uh, so it's not, uh, it's not as good as the software accuracy, but still uh, pretty good given that, you know, uh, yeah. So the error is basically less than 1%, which is, which is acceptable, I think. Uh, and here we have the breakdown. So this is kind of, you know, simulations to understand where the error is actually coming from. And what we can see here is that uh, essentially, so both the quantization and the weight noise uh, decrease the, the accuracy is expected. And uh, so most of the accuracy drop is actually coming from the PCM devices, which is good because then it means that essentially there's no uh, big issue with the chip in terms of nonlinearity or any other thing that could happen in the peripheral circuits. Essentially, as, as soon as we can improve the noise of the PCM devices, we will get better accuracy. So this is actually nice. Uh, yeah, so uh, now a second network that we looked at is essentially something that could uh, you know, use fully the, the chip, so all the 64 cores. So this is a, an SDM that was used to generate image captions. Uh, so here there's a, it's a couple of uh, things that are not actually done on chip because the chip doesn't support these big embedding layers. So we had to put them uh, outside, but essentially the, the whole LSTM plus the fully connected layers are, are fully on chip and it's also using the GDPU to do the activations uh, and so on. And so here, uh, so we characterize the accuracy by this blue score, uh, which is essentially, uh, you know, uh, it, it is, uh, it is basically matching the, the different n-grams that are uh, produced uh, by the network and compares them with the, with the reference caption. So basically the, the, the higher the better in this case. And then, uh, so as you can see, I mean, we, we get essentially the same uh, results as the, as the software. And there's actually a live demo running uh, in, in the lab. If you come to Zurich anytime, I can show it to you. This has been programmed, I think six months ago, it still works perfectly. So that shows that this drip is actually not that bad at least for these kind of networks. I mean, these SDMs are usually very robust uh, to these uh, non -analytics. Yeah. So now let's come to the performance, of course. So I talked a lot about accuracy, but performance is also important to consider. So that table is very busy. So I'll just highlight the main things that we found when we looked at you know, comparing with uh, the different chips that are out there, both resistive memory and also the SRAM uh, SIM chips. Uh, so. If you look at this line here, we have the highest Cypartan accuracy, so that is good. Uh, also, if we compare the throughput per area among the resistive memory chips, uh, at least, uh, so I don't know about the ISCC 2023, probably there's one that beats us there, but uh, so if, if not, uh, then I, at least the previous ones, uh, we are essentially 15 times higher. We still don't beat the SRAM, but uh, among the resistive memory chip, the throughput is significantly higher. Uh, on the other hand, there's, you cannot just get everything right. So there's always one thing that will suffer from this. And in our case, it's essentially the tops for what, which are a little bit lower. And that is because of this very large amount of ADCs and LDPs. So uh, what we could see, I mean, I measure the power and essentially most of the power, 75% power of the power is ADCs and local digital processing units. So, uh, that's definitely something that we have to improve in the future, especially the ADCs, which account essentially for 50% of it, um, yeah, to, to make them more energy efficient and try to improve these numbers a little bit. Although I have to say that uh, the improvement in throughput is kind of outweighing the, the loss in tops per watt that we have compared with the other chips. So I would say the trade-off is still acceptable in this case. So now uh, to finalize the talk, so I would just wanted to talk about something that we've been doing recently, which is uh, essentially to open source the whole simulation code that we use in order to evaluate the performance of networks that we map on uh, computational memories. 
Uh, so uh, this is called this IBM Analog AI Hardware Acceleration Kit. It's a very long name. Uh, you can access it in this on this URL. It's fully open source. So, uh, so there is a GitHub essentially that uh, contains that can simulate essentially the whole operation of an analog neural network. So that includes the forward, the backward pass, and the update. So this can be used for both inference and training. Um, so it has a lot of different functional models. Uh, of, of different materials with adjustable parameters. So we have both training and inference models. Uh, so for training, we, so we have, uh, and everything is kind of written on hardware. So we have rerun models, we have ECRAM, we have capacitors, a bunch of different devices that can be used for training. Uh, and also uh, this, you know, a fully calibrated statistical model of PCM with drift, uh, and programming noise model, et cetera, that are, that are basically calibrated on the, on the hardware. And uh, so GPU is fully supported, and also there's quite a bit of online documentation on this uh, on this kit. Yeah. So if you are interested in 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 in, in, in uh, you know learning more about this field or just trying out you know uh, what we can uh, what accuracies we can get on different networks, uh, you know using models that are calibrated on hardware, it's it's a very useful toolkit, I think. Uh, and for those who are not keen on, you know, using, uh, you know, are not very proficient in PyTorch or that just don't want to code, there's also a, a web interface where you can just do basically what I shown in the previous slide. So you can build your network, you know, using just blocks like that. So uh, just add layers uh, and uh, yeah, so. Uh, basically compose your, your neural network and then select the, the, the preset. So the, the, the noise model, the device model that you want to use, like so you can select between SRAM, ECRAM uh, and everything you like here. Uh, and also you can you try out different uh, optimizers uh, to kind of see what, what changes in the accuracy when you change that. Uh, and, and then you can also, you know, when we do inference, for example, we can also visualize like the, the, the variations in the ways, for example, that happen with the statistical PCM models. Here you see, for example, the drift that, so what, what it does on the way, for example, et cetera. Uh, so, and, and yeah, so the, I think that the most in, exciting thing about this is not yet uh, there, but we are trying to hook up this interface to a real hardware chip on, in, in the lab in Zurich. So this is going to be done uh, hopefully uh, this year, I hope. Uh, and yeah, I think this will be really interesting because then, uh, so yeah, basically the users will be able to, uh, to uh, implement their own network and then actually run them on the hardware. So yeah, so. To conclude, uh, yeah, so I've talked about computational memory based on resistive memory devices and uh, that they could play a role in developing energy efficient processors for deep learning inference. And essentially the main thing here is that uh, we don't have to shuttle around the synaptic ways. They are you know, physically stored in the memory devices. We don't move them around and we do the multiplications directly at the location of the, of the data. So uh, I've presented this IBM Fermis project chip that uh, could establish near software equivalent accuracy with uh, PCM on several AI tasks. Uh, so we also, you know, went a bit beyond most of the other demonstrations that were just at the macro level, but actually demonstrated the integration of uh, of the uh, analog and memory computing with some of the essential digital compute blocks. So like this, you know, affine scale blocks and, uh, you know, activation blocks also and, and, and also the on-chip communication fabric. Uh, and then, you know, of course, this is still, you know, far from the uh, systems based on DRAM that have been presented previously in this tutorial, but, uh, you know, still uh, with some, uh, you know, innovation, both at the device circuit system and software level. Uh, we still think that you know these uh, BCM is, uh, should be promising to uh, build like a full-fledged uh, you know accelerator based on non-online computing. So uh, thank you. Yeah, of course, I would like to acknowledge all the contributors of this work, which is essentially the in-memory in computing group at IBM. Um, yeah, and we have also, of course also a lot of collaboration uh, within IBM and also outside of IBM with different universities. Uh, so, thank you very much.
Yeah. There are any questions? Um, I'm just wondering if uh, the uh, resistive material will start to degrade if you program it multiple times. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, of course, finite finite endurance uh is is there i mean so it's not like drm so uh yeah so uh first of all so in these applications we don't really program it a lot because you just have to program every time you get a new network so the whole idea is that you can just have your own your whole network stored fully on chip unlike the SRAM chips where they need like a weight buffer and then you know they just operate one or two layers at a time and then you know they, they still they like send data from the weight buffer to the chip. So here, the whole idea is to just really have the whole network stored on chip. So you just have to program once and then you know the network will run. But on the other hand, yeah, so the, the endurance of PCM uh, is essentially you know, typically uh, like 10 to the nine cycles. So that is better than flash, but of course, worse than DRAM, which is essentially unlimited endurance. So yeah, the, there will be some endurance issues at some point, but if you just use it for these kind of like inference applications, then they should not be like too detrimental actually, because you, you know, then, I mean, you will see a degradation when you program uh, one giga networks. So yeah, it might take uh, quite some time. <laughs> right, right. Train your network to Correct. Uh, then you just upload it, and then you and do a bunch of inference. And the read, the read endurance is unlimited. Okay. The read endurance is unlimited. It's just the programming that you know will will create issues eventually. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Sylvia. I'm from Canada. Um, I have a question. Sure. Um, so the stressing the resistance that you showed yeah. need to be deformed. Yeah, that's why we can compensate for it exactly. So I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Uh, I have not really talked about how we compensate for drift, but in all these uh, these implementations. Uh, so yeah, exactly. So what we do to compensate for drift is very simple. We just apply a constant scaling factor at the output. Uh, so that's how we can, so we can at least compensate for that. Let me just get thing there. So yeah, we can compensate for a global, for the average increase, we can compensate for it by just applying a constant scaling factor that would have to be recalibrated every like X, uh, you know, uh, minutes or hours or every day, let's say, right? Uh, so we, we just uh, recompute the scaling factor every day, uh, you know, by just measuring a subset of devices, for example, in the crossbar, and then we can have, you know, an average uh, compensation for that. What we cannot compensate for is the fact that these slopes are different. So you see that the slope, you know, for the low devices is, is lower than for the, for this one. So that, that is uh, that, that is expected, and and this is what we cannot compensate for. So essentially, what you see is that the waste will start kind of to diverge, uh, and and that is uh, you know these uh, these random you know uh, yeah this random divergences of the weight we cannot compensate for them, but what we can compensate for is just this average uh, shift in conductance. So that is not important. So you're talking about a PCM in what about training? Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. So I, I, I usually have both training and inference covered in, in this talk, but like I thought it would be too long, so I just put the inference. So yeah, we can we can also do training. I mean, the, the only thing though is that uh, training requires a lot more uh, things that you cannot do in those uh, arrays, right? So uh especially with respect to the weight update i mean so the weight update you cannot do it accurately with these uh, devices because there's a lot of uh, non-linearity and stochasticity etc and the weight update uh, so typically i mean the, the the way that we could manage to do training with this is essentially to have like a digital accumulation of the gradients and then once they reach a threshold then you send like uh, you know some some uh, blind pulses to device to increase the the weights and, and since you know the gradients are essentially accumulated and computed in digital, then backprop will take care of any error that happens uh, when we uh, when we update the weights here and then everything will work fine. Uh, but uh, yeah, having it like a fully analog uh, kind of training, I, I know there are some papers that are claiming that, but I personally don't believe that this is reliable. I mean, you can probably do MNIST with this, but uh, you know, if you want to train ImageNet or something, I mean, good luck with fully analog. I don't think it's gonna work, okay. yeah. Sure. Um, 
document, it has very saying operation by code and one of these by code to add other emergency devices like or it, like rerun. Yeah. yeah. And so my question is what is what are the uh, state of the existence and is of the digital self is RAM over the other emergency devices? Yeah, yeah. So it, essentially this the main advantage is this one, the analog storage. Uh, so I don't think this is as reliable in, in RERAM as far as I know, because it's it's pretty hard, I think, to program all these intermediate states in RERAM because you have to, I mean, we have this filamentary kind of conduction mechanism, right, where you essentially, it's very hard to control the width of that filament. And so, you know, you can you, you can do multi-level programming, but in my opinion, it's much more difficult with RERAM than with PCM. Uh, where we essentially are, are modulating a volume here. So this is much easier to achieve and uh, reliable multi-level storage is, is much, much uh, better, I think, with PCM. So that is one of the strengths of this uh, PCM devices, I think, is the, is the fact that this uh, multi-level storage can be achieved very reliably. Uh, the drawback is, is here, so it's the drift. Uh, the drift is not as present, I think, in RERAM or other devices. Uh, and uh, and the noise also is not uh, is not small in PCM. Uh, another thing that is not uh, great about PCM is the fact that it still required fairly I mean not crazy high voltages, but still you know it needs something like uh, two volts in order to uh, to reach the threshold voltage at which you can pass some, you know enough current to program it. Uh, so that is something that essentially uh, that it, that is a bit uh, uh, of a of a problem when we want to increase the density because I mean these kind of accelerators will essentially be only very competitive with respect to digital if we can store like billions of weights on these chips right I mean that's that's the hope that you can do this because otherwise I think the digital will always be it or or just be very similar to it um, so so the idea is really to have like a very very high density of weights on the on the on the single chip when we can achieve that. Uh, then I think this this kind of technology can be extremely uh, competitive. And yeah, one thing that hinders this is again the fact that you know they they require both uh, relatively I mean not not small voltages at least in that that are not you know uh, these like let's say two volts or so is not you cannot you know have just a single transistor to support that so you need usually more and also they need the you know these uh, relative the the, current, the programming current is not that small so it's like on the order of 100 microamps or so. Uh, so you also need to have enough, uh, you know, transistors to drive this current. So that is uh, maybe, uh, yeah, the, the main drawbacks I would say maybe compared to three round devices. Can people be in our technology? Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, exactly, exactly. So all these, I mean, Drift also is present in RERAM, but I think it's less probably than here. Although, as I said, Drift is not the biggest issue here. Uh, so, I mean, the high voltage is, I mean, definitely RERAM is worse than PCM for that. I mean, it needs also, and also it still need, I, I mean, as most of the works I've seen, they still use this forming process where you need to apply very high voltage at first on the, on the RERAM to make it operatable. So here we don't need this with PCM. Uh, and so, yeah, I would say the voltages are similar or uh, it's probably higher in RERAM. I think you do probably need to support like three volts or so to have reliable operation with RERAM. Uh, although I think the programming currents, at least from what I've seen, they are, they are lower. So this is one good thing about RERAM that uh, you can usually program it with less current than PCM. Uh, this this device, yeah, th this device is not is not large. So that that is hundred nanometer here. Yeah, yeah. So uh, so the device, the, the PCM device is very small. Uh, but uh, you know what takes most of the area of the unit cell is not this one, but it's the transistors and the wires because the wires are actually I think even bigger than the PCM devices. <laughs> so yeah. 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 That's a good question. I mean, here we did everything by hand because this is just like one chip, but uh, now we're in the process of building a full software stack that essentially does this. So it will do the mapping. Uh, optimally and kind of uh, you know optimized uh, with respect to, uh, to to communication. So essentially, the the idea is 
since it's, it's a lot easier to communicate within one row, then you, you want your layer to fit usually, I mean, within one row. You don't want to lay like a vertical, you know, kind of a layer. This is less easy to operate. So that's why also you see here that the CNN, essentially each layer is spanning like either one full row, but it's always like within one row, you know. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, this is, this is ongoing work. I mean, right now here, it was just done manually, you know, because we know how the chip operates. Okay, good. Last questions? All right. Okay. Thank you again. Well, now we are getting closer to the conclusion and um, and before we, uh, before the coffee break, and before we go to the, uh, I would like to share well, some, some final discussions about.
Mm -hmm. Okay, should be fine now. Um, yes. Am I sharing the red screen or yes, not yet? It's good. Yes, it's good. Okay, um, yeah, so uh, we are going to uh, conclude the lectures with this uh, final one about, um, about adoption issues and how to enable the uh, adoption of processing in memory in real systems. We are going to discuss different issues that uh, still need to be tackled or are being tackled in order to make processing in memory uh, a reality in, in in computing systems in real in, in, in real world computing systems there are the different potential barriers i think that over this slide over uh, on uh, went uh, this morning but uh, we can recap very quickly on it like uh, applications and software uh, for processing in memory this is one of the barriers because we basically need to identify what are the workloads what are the applications that can benefit from processing in memory and also we need to create new software for those processing in memory systems and this connects to another important point that we will later discuss a little bit more which is the ease of programming interfaces compiler and hardware support that is needed for uh, processing in memory systems because in the end that's uh, that's going to be i mean every time you have a new device and you need to learn how to program the new device there is a learning curve and this makes things a little bit uh, more complicated then we need system support we need security support uh, features like memory coherence synchronization virtual memory isolation communication interfaces and all of this uh, needs to be tackled uh, uh, as well as runtime and compilation systems that allow adaptive scheduling data mapping access sharing and control and also infrastructures that uh, can be used to assess the benefits and the feasibility infrastructures like for example simulators uh, or real world prototypes as the PyDRAM uh, thing that uh, we presented before Manuel's talk but also uh, workloads benchmark suites that can be used for different studies related to processing in memory and all these issues and all these barriers can be solved with a change of mindset and these uh, should also uh, or requires us to also revisit the entire computing stack from the uh, problem and the algorithm to, to the devices themselves. So, but we can go uh, step by step and fulfill uh, all the needed changes and modifications of the real systems. Um, some, I mean, most of these uh, different points have been are discussed in the corresponding section in the uh, book chapter uh, that we wrote, and uh, we keep uh, updating. Uh, from time to time, and it's uh, publicly available in archive. Actually, section eight is uh, about enabling the adoption of processing in memory. You can also uh, read short, shorter versions of this uh, book chapter, like for example, uh, this one that that was presented in Mike, uh, published in Mike Mike Pro uh, 2019, and also this uh, other one in the um, uh, journal, in the IBM Journal of Research and Development. So one of the uh, things that are necessary to enable the adoption of processing in memory are real prototypes. I mentioned the parity run prototype earlier, uh, but also the real pin systems and prototypes that we have discussed uh, today in the morning. We talk about admin, we have talked as well about uh, DRAM from Samsung or AIM from SK Hynix, these uh, other proposals are from Samsung, uh, AXDIM, HVPNM from Alibaba. We have had a very uh, interesting talk uh, by uh, Deeming, and, um, and, and, and for sure there will be more to come. Something uh, that was uh, recently announced by uh, Samsung, for example, is this uh, 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 experimental uh, platform with an I, uh, with an AMD GPU uh, with uh, HBM pin memory, and they have uh, demonstrated uh, really uh, interesting improvements, like around two times uh, energy savings and two times uh, performance improvement compared to a baseline system where the 
HBM memory or a baseline GPUs where the HBM memory uh, is not PIM enabled. And uh, and I think, and, and I also mentioned it in the, in the initial slide that uh, efficient interconnects that allow communication for the different devices uh, are also uh, necessary to make um, uh, processing in memory more um, more um, you know, like uh, accessible to everyone. I think that the Compute Express link um, that, um, that industry is uh, now developing is, is also very promising in the context of processing in near memory. And in that sense, uh, there, there have also been some recent announcements from Samsung uh, where they have shown this uh, uh, CXL controller with uh, some PNM uh, processing near memory uh, capability that is not clearly specified in their uh, in their um, post, but uh, you can read it by yourself. The thing is that uh, there, is, there is going to be a combination of processing near memory or processing in memory systems in uh, or architectures in different parts of the system. And hopefully this can be really beneficial to uh, tackle the data movement bottleneck and, and alleviate this uh, classical problem. Another of the barriers that need to be solved uh, with respect to the adoption of processing in memory is how to uh, program these architectures, how to generate code for them. Uh, here in this uh, tutorial, we have been uh, talking about how to program the admin PIM architecture, and we will be talking about how to do it uh, right after the coffee break, uh, because we are we, we are going to have the chance to work with the with the real system, and we have also uh, discussed how to uh, program a processing using memory systems like the SIMD RAM one, how to create new instructions that can be uh, executed using DRAM and how to uh, write programs for this. But it's still, every time we have a new device, we need to learn how to program. And that's a, a steep uh, learning uh, curve that we should soften as much as possible. So hopefully there will be more and more uh, programming frameworks, high-level programming frameworks that um, allow us to create code for processing in memory systems. But for that, uh, we will need um, good IR, uh, um, uh, good IR, and we will need also uh, good compilers that can uh, do that. I think that uh, there is uh, some good work to come in the next uh, in the next few years. This is a lecture about Simbirum, by the way. I should have shown this earlier for sure, but if you want to um, uh, go in depth uh, over this uh, Cinderon framework, you can check this uh, presentation. Runtime as well, when to schedule and how to adapt, when to schedule computation onto the PIN system and uh, how to map data onto the PIN system. This is something that uh, has been, I mean, it's uh, covered by many different works. Like for example, uh, in, in, in our group, uh, we have these uh, PIN enable instructions. Uh, that uh, basically propose to offload simple computations, simple operations to the memory side. Uh, here you have the example of the pattern algorithm where uh, you know, in the typical execution on a conventional architecture, there is a lot of data movement, uh, cache lines going back and forth between the main memory and the host processor, uh, because in the end there is uh, not so much computation in this algorithm and the accesses tend to be pretty random, so there is not uh, so much temporal locality of the, of the cache lines that uh, are brought to the processor. So what this work proposes is to offload simple operations, like for example, this P PIM add to the memory side and, uh, and this way save a lot of data movement, basically moving only eight bytes to the memory and then uh, computing. This work also proposes an intelligent uh, scheduler uh, by using this uh, locality monitor that can check whether a cache line, the cache line that you're going to operate on is in the uh, last level cache or is, I mean, is in, the, in, in any of the levels of the cache hierarchy or is in the uh, off-chip memory. By, by checking this uh, PIM directory, the locality monitor can figure out if uh, one cache line is near the host, near the CPU, or is in memory. And based on that, schedule the computation onto the corresponding uh, compute unit. This uh, PCU near the host processor or this PCU near the, uh, in, the, in the logic layer of uh, 3D stack memory. 
The PEI work showed a very um, interesting uh, performance improvements uh, for large data sets in this case that can be even better when scheduling properly. That's uh, the, this uh, uh, lighter green bars represent the results for the locality aware execution. And here you can see also some uh, energy consumption results that uh, also show that the locality aware approach produces uh, better uh, energy uh, efficiency. And this is the paper that was presented at ISCA 2015. But it's not the only work that has tackled this uh, idea of a scheduling uh, at the right time and, and, and in the right device. For example, this other work about uh, processing in memory for GPUs needs to deal with proper uh, scheduling, identifying pieces or parts of a GPU kernel that are good for uh, 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 execution in uh, compute units here in the logic layer of uh, 3D stack memories or uh, in the regular cores in the main GPU. And uh, such a proposal requires all also to uh, properly map the code and also properly map the data to the right place because you don't want uh, to offload something to the cores near the memory or the cores in the logic layer and then have these cores having to access another stack, right? So it's important to um, have efficient mechanisms for data uh, code mapping and for data mapping. You can read more about this one in the uh, Tom paper that was presented in ISCA 2016. And there are other papers, like for example, these uh, scheduling techniques for GPU architectures, which has a similar purpose, but relatively different approach, performs more coarse grain um, offloading uh, of the uh, kernels uh, to the either the regular GPU cores or the processing in memory cores. And there are more like, uh, for example, this one accelerating dependent cache misses or these continuous run ahead uh, that uh, you know, do some sort of processing in memory uh, near the memory controller. So there are many research questions to still answer or to answer for the different devices, the different processing in memory systems that we will see uh, what are, for example, what are simple mechanisms to enable and disable PIM execution? How can PIM execution be throttled for highest performance gains? And how should data locations and access patterns affect where or whether the PIM execution should occur? Um, um, uh, other questions like which parts of a given application should be offloaded? How do we identify those parts of an application that are more suitable for uh, processing in memory? And when do we uh, schedule, right? Uh, so, so maybe some particular part of the code is potentially good for processing in memory, but maybe not all the, all the times, depending on where the uh, involved uh, data, the involved cache lines uh, are at a given time. And also scheduling mechanisms for multiple uh, uh, programs for, uh, I mean, you, you may have multiple cores requesting access to the, to the PIN system, but also multiple workloads requesting access to the PIN system, right? So I think there is a still a, a lot to do uh, in, in that direction to, to enable uh, multi-core systems to access uh, processing in memory um, units and also uh, to enable multiple workloads to different workloads to share the access to processing in memory. Memory coherence is also an important uh, issue that uh, requires efficient solutions. And uh, in that sense, uh, we have shown in, in prior work that uh, traditional coherence mechanisms, like for example, fine grain coherence mechanisms as a messy protocol uh, can be, or coarse grain mechanisms, or, or maybe even uh, non-cacheable uh, areas of, of memory, they don't really uh, provide uh, as much. I mean, they don't really allow us to get the, the best or get, get the most of the of an ideal pin system, as you can see. Um, or past work, uh, lazy pin and the follow-up work conduct propose an efficient coherence mechanism for near data accelerators or for processing in memory uh, architectures. Um, let me very briefly go over the ideas in this uh, Conda, lazy ping and uh, later Conda work um, on how to maintain the coherence between the pin side or the near data accelerator as, as it's called in, in these slides and the CPU. The basic, uh, well, the, the 
there are um, some key observations uh, in order to enable these uh, coherence mechanisms. First of all, these mechanisms eliminate a significant portion of the NDA's benefits, of the PIN benefits, as we, as we have seen in the um, initial slide uh, with, the, with these um, um, uh, results for different uh, um, coherence mechanisms. The majority of, of cheap coherence traffic is unnecessary, and much of this uh, coherence traffic can be eliminated with a coherence mechanism that has insight into the memory accesses. So the CONDA uh, paper proposes an optimistic approach. Uh, first of all, gain insights before any coherence check, and second, perf perform only the necessary coherence requests. Basically, this optimistic execution um, of loads or allows the uh, of loading computation to the processing in memory side, start the computation on the processing in memory side, and just let both the CPU and the processing in memory side compute in an optimistic manner as if there were no coherence issues. Um, but uh, at the end of uh, the section that is executed on both sides, a signature is created. This signature records the cache lines that have been accessed by both sides. So what the NDA side or the, or the PIM side does at the end of the execution of this code section is to return the signatures to the CPU and the CPU will check if both sides have by chance access the same cache lines. If that's the case, then we will have to re-execute. But if it's not, then we are done. We can commit and we um, can continue with the execution. The good thing of doing this is that we are saving most of the coherence traffic and we can be much closer to, the, uh, to an ideal coherence mechanism, as you can see in that banner. So this is the CONDA paper presented at ISCA 2019. Important and necessary as well, synchronization support, because processing in memory systems are typically distributed systems where we have multiple cores. We may have thousands of cores, as is the case of the uh, admin pin system that uh, we, are, we have covered uh, in the morning. In this sense, we have a very good work uh, presented uh, a couple of years ago at HPCA, led by uh, Christina, who was one, one of our uh, invited speakers uh, today. It's a synchron, efficient synchronization support for near data processing architectures. And what uh, Synchron pro pro uh, proposes is a hardware-based uh, synchronization mechanism that is suitable for processing in memory systems. As you will see, it uh, provides uh, very interesting results close to the uh, ideal zero overhead synchronization scheme. Synchronization is necessary for sure in any system where we have multiple threads running, computing on uh, the same workload. For example, in this uh, single source, shortest path code, you can see that there are some uh, vertices that are being visited and the distance to the neighbors is being updated in every iteration of the algorithm. And if we have multiple threads visiting these neighbors and, and updating the, um, the distance to these neighbors, we need to lock the access to the, in this case, the distance array. So how do we enable this sort of uh, lock mechanism or this sort of mutexes in, in for, for this application and, and also for many other applications as the ones that you can see uh, on, the, on the slide? We are going to discuss that. So for the baseline uh, NDP architecture, we consider an NDP system that is composed by multiple NDP units and inside each of the NDP units or PIM units, we have multiple NDP or PIM cores, as uh, you can see. Each of them have uh, their own private cache, may have their own private cache, and uh, they by themselves are an accelerator or a programmable core. And they had shared access to the same local memory that is called main memory here for each of these uh, NDP units. Challenges when implementing synchronization in NDP systems. First of all, the lack of uh, coherent support. We have discussed, or we have just talked about coherent support in the uh, for in, in in conda but this coherent support is between the uh, cpu side and the processing in memory side here we are talking about no coherent support between the different cores that uh, uh, take part of the pin side right so for example in the admin pin system there is no coherent support at all 
all memory coherence needs to be handled by the programmers. The, the idea in this work in Synchron is to uh, propose a synchronization mechanism that can work transparently for the programmers. But there are challenges. As I said, the first one, the lack of uh, hardware cache coherent support, the expensive communication across NDP units, and the lack of a shared level of cache memory. There is no, no uh, shared memory space by all processing in memory cores. So um, that makes that, first of all, traditional synchronization mechanisms like shared memory base cannot be used. So we have to go for message passing mechanisms. We could go for a software-based scheme, but it's going to be um, way more uh, overhead so that's why the Synchron paper proposes a specialized hardware support. And here you can see uh, basically well, what are the basic ideas uh, the, for this hardware synchronization support is to have a synchronization engine, a small synchronization accelerator inside each of the uh, um, inside each of the PIM units, so that the PIM or NDP cores can send the requests to the local synchronization engine. And these different synchronization engines in different NDP units can interact and communicate as uh, it's needed. If we look at the internals of the synchronization engine, we will see that there is a synchronization processing unit, synchronization table, and indexing counters. So every time that there is a request from one of the cores, for example, a log acquire uh, operation, um, the uh, one uh, entry in, uh, so the, 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 the lock operation um, uh, creates a new entry in the synchronization uh, table. Observe that here, it's an operation that is low latency because it doesn't require memory accesses because the synchronization table is an SRAM table, SRAM-based table that resides inside the synchronization engine. And then uh, synch synchronous support uh, hierarchical communication. Usually we are going to designate a master synchronization engine that is the one that is closer to the uh, uh, synchronization variable in this case. And the hierarchical communication is going to work in a way that uh, inside the NDP unit, the different cores send the request to the local synchronization engine. And then this local synchronization engine sends a single request, a global lock acquire in this case to the master synchronization engine. This hierarchical approach minimizes the uh, synchronization traffic as you can see. So Synchron is the first end-to-end -end synchronization solution for NDP architectures benefits such as high system performance, low hardware cost, programming ease, and a general synchronization support. And it comes within 9.5% and 6.2% of the performance and energy of an ideal zero overhead synchronization um, approach. So uh, yeah, this is the uh, paper here you can find a link if you want to uh, um, yeah, find all the details of this work, as well as uh, some talks that uh, Christina has delivered. For example, this one was in one of our uh, in one of the editions of our processing in memory course. Uh, how to design data structures for processing in memory as well? Concurrent data structures such as skip leads, uh, skip lists, linked lists, or or FIFOs. They they also. I mean, we also need to be really careful when designing these sort of uh, concurrent data structures for these kind of systems, and it's uh, related as well with uh, um, uh, synchronization issues. And uh, virtual memory support. This is, I think, uh, also one big. Uh, uh, issue for you know to enable processing in memory that it's uh, yet to solve and it's likely that the right solution for uh, different processing in memory architectures and different devices will be uh, you know like uh, kind of custom for the specific characteristics uh, of the uh, processing in memory system. For example, if you have something as simple as uh, PIM enable instructions that I um, uh, introduced uh, a few slides ago, where we are just operating on a single cache line, it's likely, well, and actually what the paper proposes is to perform the address translation in the host and just directly send the request to the corresponding PIM unit that is going to execute the uh, PIM enable instruction and oper operating on a, a single cache line. If the processing in memory core requires, uh, I mean, has 
access to a larger memory space and needs to um, use uh, many different cache lines, we might need more complex solutions. Uh, in this work, for example, as accelerating po pointer chasing in 3D stack memory, um, it is proposed um, a uh, pretty interesting um, mechanism for uh, to support uh, virtual memory that um, is based on the on the use of a um, um, uh, let's say custom page table for the uh, processing in memory accelerator. Uh, the work uh, ba is, uh, bases the solution in in two um, um, different techniques. The first one is the page table, the Impica page table that I just mentioned. The second one is the uh, access, the address access decoupling, uh, so that we can exploit. Uh, parallelism and um, and 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 we can uh, concurrently uh, calculate addresses, perform the virtual memory address translation, and at the same time perform memory accesses to the um, 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 three stack memory uh, for whatever point chasing operation uh, we need to uh, carry out. Like for example, leaked data structures that, as you know, are very much using different important applications like databases, V trees, key value store, hash table, etc. So they are connected by by pointers, and and here is the issue with these kind of applications when uh, they are they run on a CPU is that for every uh, single um, uh, for 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 every single pointer chasing operation when traverse traversing for example this uh, tree we need to go to memory. Uh, with one address, fetch some data, obtain a new address, then go again to memory, fetch the data again, and so on and so forth. And that this requires a lot of back and forth between the memory and the CPU. So um, the basic idea uh, of this Impica work is to create uh, or em embed an accelerator for uh, pointer chasing in the logic layer of a 3D stack memory and let this accelerator perform the entire pointer chasing uh, operation from the this H to this A so that um, uh, everything is done in the logic layer and just the final data that the CPU needs is uh, returned to the to the CPU, to the host processor. Uh, but there, there is, uh, I mean, one issue with doing that. If you have a single CPU core, you have a single thread because the memory access is going to be faster, being closer to memory in the in-memory accelerator reduces the latency. You can save time, that's for sure. But as soon as you have more than one core, you have multi-threaded execution on the CPU and you can parallelize computation and parallelize memory accesses, you completely lose this advantage, right? So it's a slower for two operations when the CPU has more than one core. So th that's why the idea is to uh, decouple the uh, address calculation and the memory access. And that's why the Impica accelerator proposes an address engine and an access engine so that the address engine computes the address, um, gives it to the um, access engine that performs the memory access. And while the access engine is accessing memory, the address engine can continue computing uh, new addresses. And this way we can save again uh, time with respect to the execution on the CPU. Uh, and that's uh, and this is a, a, a basic uh, um, figure that illustrates how to uh, perform these operations. First of all, the requests go to the address engine that calculates addresses and queues uh, these uh, addresses for the access engine uh, to read them and access uh, the data in the run through the memory controller. But now we need to perform this uh, address translation, right? And if you do it in the uh, way a CPU does it, this requires multiple page table walks and in the end, multiple memory accesses that make uh, all this uh, operation very costly. So uh, because in principle, there is no memory management unit in the, in the memory side and, and, and duplicating it would be extremely costly. The Impica uh, paper proposes the Impica page table that is a reduced page table that only, uh, you know, like uh, only uh, expands a, a small part of this Impica region of the virtual address space. From there, it's like uh, from um, uh, a small region to any uh, physical, uh, so to any address in the physical address space, 
And, um, but at least this way we can have a much more lightweight uh, page table. Thanks to this uh, region table that is very small, because remember the, uh, the Impica region in the virtual address space is very small. This region table is usually going to um, stay in the cache of the processing in memory accelerator and, uh, and the, the flat uh, table. So this is the, the tiny region table is always in the cache while the uh, flat page table saves one memory access with the respect to the traditional page table works. So by, do, by doing that, we can have a more efficient mechanism for virtual memory address translation. And here you can see some results from micro benchmarks with the linked list, hash table, and, and V3, and, and, and some interesting speed ups uh, for the Impica accelerator with respect to the baseline. And also here, uh, some results for uh, database performance, and also like uh, up to 16% um, higher throughput and 13% lower latency. And for energy consumption, also uh, some uh, interesting uh, energy savings. And here you see also some uh, um, values of area and power over here. So if you want to uh, check all the details, you can go to the uh, paper that was presented in ICCD 2016. As I said, uh, it's likely that the uh, virtual memory or the solutions for uh, virtual memory address translation uh, will be uh, custom for different processing in memory systems, depending on where they are integrated, whether CPUs, GPUs, etc. Uh, but there is also some uh, good recent work from, from our group uh, that can be potentially uh, adapted, can be potentially suitable for processing in memory systems as well. This uh, virtual block interface that allows a lot of flexibility uh, when performing um, memory address translation by uh, offloading or by placing the uh, uh, address translation capabilities in the memory controller. This is a, a lecture about the virtual block interface if you are interested in, in learning about it. Processing in memory has also security implications, that's for sure, and it's something that uh, needs to be uh, researched at, as well, but it can also uh, provide interesting security mechanisms or interesting primitives that can be used for security mechanisms. For example, in our, work, in our uh, group, there is uh, a lot of interesting work on creating uh, physically unclonable functions in DRAM by playing with the uh, latency, um, um, by reducing the uh, latency parameters in DRAM and this way, um, um, creating um, uh, the, the paths by taking advantage of the random process variation of, uh, the, of the DRAM cells. So by uh, accessing at a reduced TRCD is possible to obtain these uh, paths. This is work that was uh, presented at HPCA 2018 and based on a similar idea, D-Range presented one year later uh, also uh, uh, proposes a way of obtaining random numbers. More recent work also to uh, uh, obtain uh, two true random numbers uh, using DRAM is this uh, quadruple activation, this uh, quad TRNG work that uh, is um, uh, kind of based on, on, on similar ideas to the ones in, in the compute DRAM work and PI DRAM work that uh, I presented um, uh, in, in the beginning of this session by violating uh, the, the timing parameters uh, is possible to activate four rows. We have seen uh, three rows in the compute DRAM work. We realized uh, in this uh, quad tier and zero uh, work that it's possible to activate four rows with two activate commands. And if you have four rows and these four rows have a pattern like this, one, zero, one, zero, and you activate these four cells at the same time, what will happen is that there is a um, um, uh, random behavior at some point. So observe that we first activate row zero, then pre-charge, then activate uh, row three. And because these four rows start uh, sharing their charge uh, with the beat line, at some point when the sense amplifier is enabled, you don't really know where the voltage is going to go. 
So that's basically a random perturbation that gets amplified. And based on that, it's possible to obtain random bits inside the DRAM. That's the idea that the, the basic idea that the quark TRNG uh, work exploited uh, obtaining these uh, random values or these um, operations that reduce latency as a source of entropy. And then, uh, well, these uh, random values are later post-processed uh, in order to obtain uh, two run true random numbers. Yeah, and here you can find the link to the paper. And more things that I mentioned in the beginning that we need in order to enable, to continue with the research on processing in memory and enable the adoption of PIM, simulation infrastructures and benchmark suites. And we have done uh, uh, quite a bit of work as well in this direction um, related to the uh, work, the characterization work that we did uh, of the admin PIM architecture, we produced this Prim benchmark suite that is composed of 16 uh, different uh, benchmarks, as you see, from different domains like dense linear algebra, sparse linear algebra, databases, graph processing, neural networks, etc. They are uh, publicly available in our repository, and um, and yeah, we have talked about them extensively in in previous talks. But not only those. Because those are, you know, like uh, uh, designed for the admin PIM architecture. If you want to go more general, here in this uh, Damuv work that was uh, also uh, published recently, uh, we propose a methodology to characterize workloads and understand how good or bad they can be for processing in memory. And Damuv also comes with a benchmark suite that is, in the end, all the many workloads that we analyzed to came up with this uh, methodology. I think that. Um, there are more than 100 uh, different workloads that are coming from different uh, benchmark suites, popular benchmark suites like SPEC, Parsec, um, et cetera, uh, Parboil and, and uh, Rodinia, many more. And we put them all together and we analyze and identify what functions in these uh, workloads, in these benchmarks can be more or less suitable for processing in memory and due to what reasons. Uh, that's uh, uh, how we came up with this methodology that performs application pro profiling and then by using the uh, DAMOVE uh, simulator uh, does further analysis, uh, locality-based analysis, and also memory bottleneck classification. In total, we found that there are six different classes of workloads with respect to the, their data movement needs, and, uh, and most of them can benefit from processing in memory in uh, one way or, or a different way. Uh, here you can find links to the paper, uh, to the uh, repository, uh, the, 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 the simulator and the benchmark suite, and also a couple of links to uh, lecture, uh, so, yeah, to the talks or lectures given by Geraldo, who is uh, the PhD student, who is the, the first author of this work. Here you, you can see one of them. Okay, and I was talking about simulation infrastructures. I mentioned the Damu simulator. The Move simulator basically integrates uh, SetSim that allows us to simulate in order or out of order course and is uh, integrated with uh, Ramulator that is a DRAM simulator that uh, has already been used by uh, created in our group and, and, and used by people in our group for many years and also uh, in other uh, research groups in, in academia and industry, as you may know. And there are also other simulators that can potentially be used for processing in memory. For example, this MQSIM for uh, uh, mo modern multi-queue SSD devices. And uh, in terms of characterizing uh, workloads and understanding how suitable they can be for processing in memory, I just mentioned the DAMOVE methodolo methodology, but uh, we also have some uh, work that is based on ensemble learning to do up to make a prediction of what's the performance of a workload on a specific processing in memory system. Um, the good thing of this NAPL uh, approach is that it can save uh, a lot of uh, exploration time with respect to uh, using simulators. So basically, when you use simulators, you need to spend a lot of time on running simulations. And that's, as you see, well, thousands of times slower than native execution or execution on a real system. So that's why we propose this NAPL model 
that is based on ensemble learning. It uh, um, has, first of all, we need to train the model, then uh, we can use this model, and the model is based on um, you know, extracting characteristics from the application and also characteristics of the uh, architecture itself. Uh, you put them all together in the ensemble learning algorithm and come up with the uh, model generation that um, that can be later used for uh, performance uh, prediction, performance and, and energy prediction. And uh, well, we evaluated this extensively for uh, a bunch of workloads, compared them to other approaches uh, to do basically the same uh, sort of estimates, like a decision tree or an artificial neural network. And, uh, and in the end, we, we uh, observed that the, uh, the error in the performance and energy prediction of NAPL uh, is um, significantly better than the other approaches. And also significantly faster than uh, using simulators. And then uh, one more thing, applications that benefit from processing in memory and um, optimize implementations of applications that can benefit from uh, a specific processing in memory systems. In that sense, in our work group, we have done a lot of work in, the, for example, genomics, like this uh, green filter that uh, proposes a way of uh, filtering uh, uh, reads uh, in, 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 in genome sequencing, uh, doing it uh, inside or near the memory with three stack memories, but also um, how to accelerate uh, approximate the stream matching and how to accelerate uh, sequence alignment um, uh, has also uh, been uh, you know, like, um, 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 thoroughly uh, studied and, 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 and discussed in, in these papers. Like for example, this Genasem that proposes a, a new algorithm to perform um, sequence alignment and also an acceleration framework near data acceleration framework that uh, really produces uh, very uh, good performance results. Other uh, workloads that uh, were mentioned as well by Honor this morning, like uh, Google, uh, Google workloads for consumer devices. Uh, I think Honor also talked about this uh, narrow accelerator for weather prediction modeling uh, using uh, near data processing as well, or this uh, NASA accelerator for time series analysis, which is also like a very memory bound, memory intensive um, application that can benefit from processing in memory. And these are, are just um, a few examples of, uh, of these um, uh, applications for processing in memory. Just as a epilogue to this um, lecture and, and say the lectures of this uh, tutorial, uh, recall that uh, we have a very nice summary of many different works in this uh, modern primer of, process, in, of processing in memory, um, this um, uh, book chapter, also the shorter papers in micro and in the IBM uh, Journal of Research and Development. I, I think uh, we believe that we have a very good challenge and opportunity for the future, uh, fundamentally uh, creating uh, computer architectures that are data centric and that can be energy efficient and high performance, computing architectures with minimal data movement that will probably uh, perform computation in many, many different parts of the system. We have talked today about computing uh, near the cache, computing uh, near the memory or inside the memory or using the memory or using uh, or uh, in the even in the in the storage, right? Or, uh, or, or, or even in this presentation, I showed you this um, picture of a prototype from Samsung where they play some processing near memory capability uh, near the CXL memory controller. So um, yeah, I think that the uh, uh, future is, uh, is really positive uh, in this direction. And we are going to see more and more real world uh, processing in memory systems and near data processing systems. So hopefully in a, in a future edition of this tutorial, we will be discussing uh, all these uh, new developments. In the meantime, if you want to learn more, you can go to uh, our website. Uh, you can watch many of the uh, talks and courses that we delivered. For example, this uh, um, uh, long talk uh, here you can uh, to the uh, yeah, YouTube.
uh, this or uh, around and uh, and uh, you missed any of the lectures today you can come where for sure we will have uh, also uh, invited lectures as well and uh, and we will likely have uh, new contents and new materials as well so if you are interested uh, you you will be very welcome to join and uh, and same thing uh, you can also take a look at our uh, courses uh, for example the processing in memory course this is these are the links to the uh, fall 2022 edition but um, but yeah we are starting the spring 2023 edition uh, probably next week so yeah all these materials are available to everyone uh, and i hope that uh, you are you enjoy them if you are interested in processing in memory so that's all uh, for this uh, last lecture i think um, we can probably go for a coffee break right now and um, and um, yeah uh, i i will be here uh, to introduce the labs in in a few minutes it's taking 15 minutes or so uh, you are welcome to join the lab to have your own hands on experience accessing the admin server programming it the lab it has uh, i think plenty of material for more than two hours that's uh, for sure but the good thing is that the server is going to be available for a few hours after the the end of the tutorial so if you guys want to keep working later this evening or this night uh, in your lab and and um, enjoying the experience you you can do it until the reservation that um, uh, admin folks have provided uh, finishes so yeah thank you everyone for your attention
So if you guys are ready, I think we can go ahead and, and start with the labs. I have uh, just a few slides to introduce the lab. Um, so, so yeah, I will click quickly go over them. Uh, the materials are already available in the uh, in the uh, website, in the tutorial website. And uh, I mean, it's basically this, these slides and the, uh, the handout that uh, we also have this, I mean, we have this screenshot here. Uh, this, this handout is, is already available in the, in the course website. And from there, uh, you can access uh, anything else you need. There, there is um, a sort of a configuration file that you need to download and put in your dot SSH uh, folder in order to access the remote server. And also uh, from this handout, uh, it's linked a uh, zip file that contains the templates that uh, you need to use for the um, for the lab themselves itself. Uh, so first of all, um, there is uh, as as you can see in the beginning of the of the handout in this section two, uh, there is uh, the you know this um, configuration that you have to paste in the config file in your .ssh folder. It's uh, basically this. It's it's also here in the slide. Uh, this admin cloud underscore well no or user is. ETH HPCA 23 and admin cloud underscore ETH HPCA 23 is the config file that you can also uh, download from the website. Um, you need to copy this uh, private key with uh, this configuration file with the private key into your .ssh folder. You may need to change permissions in case it doesn't have uh, read write permissions or or whatever is needed, that's also indicated in the in the handout how to do it. And next thing is just uh, access the uh, server. Is uh, admin cloud five is the server that we have access to. So just type ssh admin cloud five from the terminal. As I said. In the handout, there is also a link to the template files. You will download that zip file and contains two templates, task one and task two, for the two first tasks of the of the lab. For the remaining tasks, you can use task two template as well. And observe that the uh, template file, the, the, the zip file, also contains a folder called Docker, because that's a Docker contain, container with the admin SDK. Because the admin SDK has a simulator, a functional simulator that you can use anytime. So after uh, the, the, the reservation of the admin server finishes and we can no longer access it, you can still, if you want, uh, keep working uh, on the lab or programming whatever you want and use the uh, simulator that the SDK contains. And of course, uh, you could also um, install the SDK in your Linux machine and, and, and use it directly without the Docker. That's also explained in the appendix of the, of the handout if you need to use it. So as you will see, the first task, task number one is about uh, experimenting with the data transfers between the main memory and the PIM enabled memory, what we call the CPU, DPU, and DPU, CPU transfers. And remember that uh, from the lecture in the, this morning that there are three different types of transfers, serial, parallel, and broadcast transfers. Uh, here I pasted uh, a screenshot of the, the slides uh, where I explain too quickly, but I explain uh, the different types of transfers. And, and also in this slide, you can see this screenshot of what are the tasks in these, uh, I mean, the, what, what you need to do in this task one. Uh, as you'll see, the template is uh, pretty simple. I mean, template basically contains everything you need, how to uh, allocate a DPU set, how to load the binary uh, to the IRAM of the DPUs, how to launch the kernel. Everything is already there. As you will see, it's just a few lines that you need. Uh, to 
um, I write health. It's very similar to a vector addition. And the code of the vector addition is in that slide uh, of, uh, the, of this morning's presentation. Um, but yeah, uh, you, it's a slightly different. Uh, please go ahead, uh, try it yourself. You can probably follow a similar structure of the vector addition code. And uh, yeah, I, I think it, it shouldn't be also uh, too difficult, uh, other than maybe some uh, compiling issues that you may have in the beginning, some bugs, but uh, yeah, it, I don't think it's, uh, it's too complicated. And task three, uh, ask you to reuse the same kernel that you develop in, in task two to create a vector addition. And then this, which is a element-wise addition of two arrays, you can also do element-wise multiplication, subtraction, division, and also use different data types. We are suggesting uh, char, short, in, long, long, in, flow, double, and the basic idea is that you run your experiments on a single DPU, you measure the execution time, you make sure you measure the execution cycles that you can measure with the performance counter. Uh, actually, we provide uh, the way uh, of doing it in the template. And, uh, and you will basically see the significant variations that are uh, for the arithmetic throughput for the different uh, data types and operations. Um, if you want to compare the results that you obtain with, let's say, the ground truth, you can go <clears throat> to the processing near memory presentation that I use in the morning, which is much longer than what uh, I covered. And there you'll find the micro benchmark results from uh, our work, and you can uh, compare them to those. You can compare uh, your results to those. And uh, then we have task four. Now it's a, a little bit more complicated. In this case, you need to implement a, a vector reduction. Observe, I mean, remember that I also explained the uh, reduction this morning, uh, but uh, I think, I mean, not all the code versions that you are asked to write are in the slides. Uh, the, the idea is to get familiar on how to implement the reduction, but also do it in different ways. Uh, for for the final reduction after after you have computed a local sum in in each of the tasklets, then uh, you need to reduce these local sums. And there are different ways of doing it. <clears throat> the most straightforward one is to synchronize using a barrier and then use a single tasklet to perform the final reduction. But you can also do a, a tree-based approach. <clears throat> using barriers, handshakes, or or you can also use mutexes. So that's um, basically all I have in these uh, slides, introductory slides to the lab. Um, feel free to come to me or raise your hand if you uh, have any question or you have any trouble accessing the server. Uh, so I will try to um, help as much as possible. And, and as I said, even after the end of the tutorial, there are still uh, for for a few hours. I think in the in the handout, I, I indicated for for how many more hours we will have access to the server. Uh, so you are welcome to keep uh, accessing it and and having your own hands-on experience. And after that, um, <clears throat> you could even continue working uh, with the with the simulator if if you wish. So yeah, that's uh, all for from my side for now. So yeah, good luck with the lab.